We're going live on YouTube momentarily. And Senator, I'm ready when you are. I know that we're not yet at nine o'clock. Representative, I promoted you. <laughs> or demoted me, depending on how you look at it. I did come from the house, so I am partial to that chamber, admittedly. Oh. I know was Senator- on, Was that on the application form, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> Old habits, old habits. Good morning, Senator. How are you? I'm um, well. How are you? How's everybody? Doing okay. Um, Bree, I see uh, we are joined by our first witnesses here. Are we good to go on your end? Yes, we are. We are ready to okay. roll. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Sean Scanlon. I'm the House Chair of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. We are uh, here today for our March 30th, 2022 public hearing of the Finance Committee, our second to last one of the year. Uh, and we are joined this morning um, by the co-chair and ranking member of the committee. Uh, any remarks from either of them before we get going? I'm good, Mr. Chairman. Good to go. All right. With that, we will go to Ms. Duval and Ms. Huff, our first guests of the day. Welcome. As well as Ms. Hollis. Sorry, Ms. Hollis. I left you out. Hi, members of the Finance Committee. My name is Amelia Duval. I live in Manchester and I attend the Greater Hartford Academy Direct High School in Hartford, which is a CREC magnet school. I'm here today to ask for your support for the SB 485 to support CREC in much needed capital improvements for my school. I have benefited greatly as a student at a CREP magnet school. Both my older siblings and I attended the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts Middle School and were grandfathered into the high school. I feel incredibly lucky to be able to work beside professional working artists as my teachers. I spend all day surrounded by young artists as myself. Our faculties at the Learning Corridor campus are over 20 years old and our faculty has worked hard to make sure that they are in working condition for us. As a performing arts high school, it is important that we have up-to-date technical equipment and adequate materials to make sure that we have a space where we're continuing to thrive. We have specialized facilities that are needed to help students feel like they are prepared for the professional artistic world. Our dance studios feel like real professional studios. Recording studios allow for students to film self-tape auditions and record vocal or instrumental tracks for songs. The supplies we are given as students help us to grow into pr real professional artists. I find magnet schools to be important because they are specialized. They allow kids like myself to learn, grow, and thrive in their specialty. Magnet schools also provide an opportunity to learn from different backgrounds. My friends and I come from all over the state and to learn about one another and from each other is amazing. To be able to go to a school where your talent is valued is something that I never could have gotten from a large public high school. When you make improvements to magnet schools, you are making changes in each student's life. It is imperative to keep correct magnet schools up to date and constantly improving so students can continue to have the opportunity to learn from those who share the same passions as them. It is something unique to be able to grow in your field at such a young age, and I will always cherish what CREC has given to me. Please support SB 485 so students like me can continue to have a great education. Thank you. Ms. Huff, Ms. Hollis, anything you want to add before the, uh, the time is up here? Distinguished members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. Hello everyone, my name is Talasia Huff and I live in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm an 11th grade student at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts, a crack magnet school. 
Thank you all for raising SB 45 in order to support correct and much needed capital improvements for my school. I am asking you to support this bill. I have benefited greatly as a student at a correct magnet school. I benefit from, from uh, I benefit from attending a correct magnet school because in my school, we are offered a large amount of opportunity to explore different art forms and experiences, which can be therapeutic to students and which can be a way for students to develop both socially and academically. Also, attending a correct magnet school gives me the opportunity to have a diverse platform with my peers and to get to know people my age from different backgrounds, religions, areas, interests, sexualities, and geographic regions. I felt as though it is important that the school's capital improvements are covered, so that way the school can continue to provide us with the space in our building that we utilize for arts classes. Funding will support both classroom and building maintenance that will enhance writing workshops, dance studios, editing slash product, production labs, performance stages, and so much more. If PREC gains more funding, our school can continue to prioritize health and safety for all members of the Academy family. Also, our school will be able to expand course offerings and ensure that every student finds that the appropriate teachers and course to support their individual needs. Further, more, fun, more funding can also help our school improvement improve spacing in which we don't have much of. My dream would, would be to be able to, as a future alumni, where students have a bigger learning space, as, as I have noted, a larger space with critical capital improvements would accommodate so much more than enrollment. Capital improvements for correct magnets should be the responsibility of the state, not my local school district. Please support SB 485 so CREC can continue to provide an education that supports students' health, wellness, leadership, civic engagement, and creative exploration. Thank you. Good morning, distinguished members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Sage Hollis, and I reside in Hartford, Connecticut, and I am a current student at Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts. Thank you for raising Senate Bill 485 to support the need for improvements within CREC schools. As a student, you are in school majority of the day more than you are at home and it is important that you are providing a safe space for all students. As a student at Greater Harvard Academy of the Arts, many students feel comfortable with expressing themselves because they come from so many different towns, from different ethnicities and households, as well as different gender identities, and they feel so comfortable being in this space. And of course, it is important that we have the larger spaces so that we can thrive with such things, especially being in arts class performances um, and sports. Thank you for your time. Thank you all for being here this morning and for your testimony. We really appreciate it. I don't see any questions though. So uh, thank you again for your time this morning. Next up, Bree. Next up, we have a panel from Connecticut Voices for Children. We have Patrick O'Brien, Sana Shah, and Lauren Ruth. So as you can tell on the Finance Committee, we are, are doing some panels this morning. Uh, and rather than nine minutes of three each, we are allowing panels to have five minutes total. So it does reduce the total time of our hearing today. Obviously, we have a lot of people to testify, a lot of important bills. Uh, and your five minutes uh, commences now. So welcome. Thank you. Lauren, I see your hand is raised. Uh, they're in the they're in the waiting room, Brie. We're actually number two is Lisa Melendez. I'm so sorry. I was looking at the wrong list. So Sana and Ruth, um, I apologize. I'm promoting you right now. And we have it all set. So um, I will amend my statement. Um, Ruth, Sana, and Patrick, please hold. You are next to testify. Uh, the testifier who's up now is Liza Melendez. And thank you, Christina. Good morning, members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Liza Melendez, and I'm representing the Even Start Directors Coalition, which represents Middletown, New London, and Torrington. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill. 487. Even Start is a two-generation working program with the entire family. 
The program has a comprehensive approach of integrated components, which include adult education, workforce readiness, parenting education, early childhood education, interactive literacy, and home visiting intended to collectively reduce adversity and build capacity. One of the goals of this program is to provide high quality early childhood education, which will be the foundation for success in school and will help break the cycle of illiteracy. Another focus is to provide parents with opportunities that will lead to economic self-sufficiency. Even Start has been serving New London for the past 22 years, and over the years, the number of families seeking services with infants and toddlers have more than doubled. Currently, all three sites have a waiting list for infants and toddlers and surrounding area centers do not have availability. Yesterday, I contacted 10 child care centers in the New London and Groton area, and they all had a waiting list with an expected availability between six months to a year and a half. Since 80% of the brain development occurs during these first three years and is critical to the cognitive development, which includes thinking, learning, and problem-solving skills, what do you think is happening to these infants not being able to access early childhood education? Do they have an even start? Or are, they, are we creating a cascade of deficits? If we invest in our children, we will not continue this negative loop affecting the economic, public health, and educational system. Instead, programs like Even Start can provide an atmosphere where they can have developmentally supportive experiences and stimulate their brain development. The early intervention is key to academic achievement, behavior, educational progression, and attainment. This program improves the quality of life in the short and long term of the children we serve. Overall, children in early childhood education programs are less likely to repeat a grade, less likely to be identified as having special needs in K-12, more prepared academically for later grades, more likely to attend college, and are higher earners in the workforce. Another great part of this bill is that this initiative considers the need for family support services. Targeting the entire family is holistic, is a comprehensive multi-generational approach, which even seconds, start, please summarize. Uh, encompasses all these services by providing family education. The supportive services establish positive networks and they are allowed to, for them to bounce back in the communities where the lowest medium household is. So uh, I close by saying even start makes a significant difference in the lives of families, parents, young children, and a community as a whole. Imagine the impact this initiative can have when we fund to decrease the greatest deficits of early childhood availability while promoting supported service families. Thank you for allowing me to testify this morning, and I ask you to do the right thing. Pass this bill for families, their infants, and toddlers across Connecticut who deserve an even start. Thank you, Ms. Melendez, for being here this morning. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Seeing no questions, the next panel of testifiers is now Sana Shaw, Patrick O'Brien, and Lauren Ruth. Here, Senator Funfara, Representative Scanlon, Senator Martin, Representative Cheeseman, and esteemed members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Sana Shah, and with me today are two colleagues, Dr. Patrick O'Brien and Dr. Lauren Ruth, and we are testifying on behalf of Connecticut Voices for Children. Connecticut Voices for Children has submitted in-depth testimony supporting Section 3 of SB 478, Section 1 of SB 11, SB 481, and SB 487. I won't speak to all of these bills, but our written testimony does, and we also provide suggestions that we believe will strengthen them. Connecticut's economy is recovering slower than the U.S. economy as a whole. In our latest uh, employment analysis published yesterday, we find that the state is on track to recover its job shortfall from the recession in September 2023, compared to June 2022 for the U.S. as a whole. What's more, the recovery from the job shortfall has been highly unequal when we analyze employment status by major dem demographic groups. This is why, similar to other communities we've testified, uh, other committees we've testified at this session, we applaud the aspects of the aforementioned bills that would support Connecticut's residents and communities whose economic security have suffered the greatest during the pandemic. 
Section one of SB 11 seeks to increase Connecticut's property tax credit and restore full eligibility. Research points to the overwhelming property tax burden Connecticut residents face, so we appreciate that the bill seeks to address this. That said, we've stated in previous finance committee hearings, we suggest strengthening any property tax credit proposal by making the credit refundable, extending it to renters, and removing the marriage penalty. SB 487 establishes an infant and toddler early care and family support initiative funded through the use of the state's revenue cap, which could provide an additional $500 million a year for early care by FY 2026. Once implemented, the policy would help boost Connecticut's economy by supporting more parents, especially women, going back into the labor force. It would also provide financial relief to child care providers who have gone through the lengthy and expensive process of accreditation or who seek to be Come accredited. We've supported these bills that would advance universal access to early child care in other committees this session, which is why we support this bill. However, we recommend carving out a third of the grants to help family child care providers achieve accreditation. Family child care um, centers are more likely to be owned by women of color and are far less likely to be accredited than larger centers. SB 481 would provide increased credit to underserved and under-resourced communities, as well as loans to lower income families living in these communities. This certainly would help promote economic development and lower the high unemployment rate for workers of color. However, making this funding a requirement for the treasurer rather than based on cash availability could create unintended consequences. Additionally, we want to underscore that in order for this proposal to be the most effective, a new source of funds should accompany it. As such, as we've said at previous finance committee hearings, hiring new DRS auditors would be a smart way to resource this policy. State and local government jobs account for 20% of Connecticut's lost jobs during the pandemic. The only two major industries to lose more jobs during the pandemic were education and health services and leisure and hospitality. Hiring DRS auditors will help replace some of the state's lost government sector jobs and generate new funds by closing Connecticut's $2.6 billion annual income tax gap. Thank you for listening. Dr. Patrick O'Brien, Dr. Lauren Ruth, and I are happy to answer any questions. Good morning, and thank you, as always, for being here uh, in the committee and for lending your testimony. I see uh, some hands going up, so we'll start with Senator Funfar. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Shaw, have, has your organization done an analysis of the cost benefit of hiring um, internally versus? Um, uh, private sector uh, auditors? And if you haven't, could you do that? Uh, thank you for the question. So the numbers that we use come uh, from the DRS in one of the early earlier finance committee uh, hearings itself. Uh, the deputy commissioner mentioned that the average auditor brings in about $2 million a year. I don't think it would be possible for us um, externally to conduct that research, but we would be happy um, to contribute in any way we could, but that's likely something that I think the DRS would have to look into itself. Um, but as Sana mentioned, we have done an estimate of what we think the overall size of the tax gap is. And that's just based solely on showing that the main factors that contribute to the tax gap, which is the composition of resource, uh, the composition of income, uh, and we have a higher composition, of, a higher uh, reliance on opaque income sources in the US as a whole, and like the IRS, uh, the DRS's staff has decreased consider considerably over the last two decades. So based on those two factors, we think it's reasonable to apply uh, the percentage uh, of the income tax gap at the federal level to the state level. And as we uh, mentioned, we think that would be about $2.6 billion. And so we've shown, for example, that if you were to hire up to 200 auditors, which would essentially just bring the DRS back to the staff level um, in 2000, that would bring in an estimated $400 million. Obviously, uh, the return on investment might increase as you, as it might decrease as you increase the number of auditors. Um, but since there's such a high return on investment to begin with, we don't think that's a major concern. I will also just mention that in the budget, 
that passed uh, last year, um, the OFA basically estimated that there was a $40 million return on a $1.1 million increase in funding for the DRS. Um, and so that would be a $35 return for each dollar spent. So again, we'd be happy to work uh, with your committee or the DRS to the extent possible, but um, we would have to um, probably uh, let the DRS take the lead on that. Yeah, my question wasn't about the efficacy of the effort. It's about whether or not it's more cost effective. Um, I'd like to think it is to have uh, uh, state employees be hired to do this um, auditing, but um, didn't know if you yourselves have have looked at that, uh, the comparison of hiring externally versus internally, but you haven't. That's correct, we have not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Chairman Scanlon. Good to see you again. Um, so you discussed your preference for the way we fund this, and I'd just like you to expand upon that. And I know uh, Senator Fontara's question touched on, you know, uh, DRS auditors, but you indicated um, having the treasurer supply the funds was not preferable to your desired approach. So if you'd just like to explain that to me, please. Thank you for the question. Sure. So the legislative language uh, changes from that the treasurer may uh, make these investments to shale, but we also didn't see uh, an accompanying new revenue source. And so um, we, we weren't sure to what extent this might affect the, the ongoing operations uh, that the treasurer is, is conducting. And we know that the state has a high uh, level of long-term obligations. So we want to make sure that any um, new requirements don't interrupt uh, those operations. And we think essentially for any bills, uh, uh, for any of these proposals that it would be useful to have a new source of funding. Uh, we've mentioned, you know, you can make the tax system fairer through expanding the ITC, creating a child tax credit, uh, reforming the, the property tax credit. So all of those aspects uh, that you could use the new revenue for would make the tax system fair. But one of the things we also want to highlight is essentially that Connecticut has uh, a slower recovery than the U.S. as a whole, our job recovery. And that is due in large part to the fact that we have disproportionately lost government jobs. And so one of the things that we've been highlighting with uh, hiring at the DRS is that could solve the problem of bringing in a lot of revenue for the state, and it could also create good uh, high paying jobs. And just to clarify some of the numbers, so right now we're down 3.3 percentage points uh, compared to the start of the pandemic. So it's 56,000 jobs and it's a 3.3 uh, percentage point uh, uh, shortfall. But if you look at government jobs, we've disproportionately lost government jobs. So our local government jobs are down 5.9% and our state government jobs are down 3.6%. Those total more than 10,000. Uh, jobs uh, overall. So we think that uh, basically increasing the funding for the DRS could help to uh, address two of these major problems that we're seeing in the state, the revenue shortfall and the shortfall in jobs. Right. And, and we could have a long discussion about whether those are people who have opted not to go back to the workforce. But and I, if I'm reading this incorrectly, I do see reference to um, amounts authorized by the state bond commission. Obviously, there's to be some funding from that. And maybe this is a conversation I should have with the with the authors of, of this bill in terms of the funding. But uh, I want to thank you for answering my questions. And uh, I look forward to uh, discussing this further. Thank you, Chairman Scanlon. Thank you. May I add one comment about the, the bonding? I just So uh, the issue with the bonding, we believe, is that it's ultimately funded by the established tax system, which is regressive. And so um, we think bonding is certainly useful um, for a lot of these programs, but it ultimately ends up uh, disproportionately burdening the state's uh, working and middle class families. Uh, so unless the tax system is, is made fair, we still think that that's a concern. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. Representative Meskers. Yeah, a question here is we talk about policy issues uh, and taxation. The nature of the regressive taxes in the state are essentially payroll taxes. I would argue um, our energy uh, policy, which we put our into our distribution charge for electric energy, and our sales tax. Um, I don't hear any focus, or I would I would question or wonder why we are focused on those basic taxes or 
ways to to fund our policy goals outside of those tax uh, strategies. Because instead of that, what I'm hearing is that a tax credit in another area would resolve part of the problem. Aren't there either simpler, more direct ways to to get that type of a fixed tax down? Thank you for the question. So there are benefits to having a, a wide array of taxes. And so um, we think it's, it's important to have a diverse set of taxes, but when you're looking at the tax system as a whole, as everyone on this committee is aware at this point, that it's uh, disproportionately burdens the state's working and middle-class families. And so we focused uh, primarily on the income tax as the best means of offsetting those other regressive taxes. And the reason that the income tax is so useful is precisely because uh, that provides the best opportunity for targeting who receives benefits. And so uh, the idea of uh, a fair tax system is the tax burden as a percentage of income. And so when we're talking about that the state has an unfair tax system, it's not that uh, working middle class families are paying uh, the, the, a large amount in dollar terms relative, for example, to a wealthy family, but they're paying a higher percentage of uh, taxes as a percent of their income. And so by using the income tax, we can help to offset the overall unfair tax burden. And we can target specifically um, who is getting those tax breaks through the income tax. I hope that answers your question. Well, yes and no. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to belabor because we have a lot of business to get to today. Just that certain of the flat taxes are very regressive. Wouldn't it be worked better to reduce those as they hit 100% of the, of, of the disposable income of our lower income residents? And I believe we're up to $60,000 for family. I believe their income tax is exempt, right? So if you're talking about a regressivity of tax, you're talking, I would like to see a focus between say 90,000 and under about which taxes we should be focused on reducing to alleviate some, sorry about that. So we, we, we can look at re reducing those taxes. And I was wondering that, I don't see that as a, as a focus and then it's just, if you have, can comment briefly just on, on that, that, that sure. approach. So thank you. So it is possible to try to make some of these regressive uh, taxes uh, fairer. And so, for example, um, with the property tax, there are changes that you could make to the property tax. You could have a progressive rate structure instead of exempting um, a certain percentage of uh, property, you could have a dollar amount exemption. There are various ways to make regressive taxes um, fair or even progressive. But again, the reason that we've focused on the income tax is none of these other taxes, you, you can't target them as effectively. So for example, the gas tax is certainly an issue. It's, it's a regressive tax, but it's hard. Uh, so, but when we, we uh, you know, put a hold on the gas tax, that will provide tax, important tax relief for working middle class families, but other uh, wealthy families, for example, too, will also get that benefit. So these regressive taxes tend not to be as well targeted and the income tax provides uh, the most effective targeting. And one of the reasons we've been focusing on refundable tax credits is even if a family doesn't have income tax liability, but for example, pays a lot in the sales tax or property taxes, you can provide refundable tax credits that basically give that family a negative income tax liability. And so that's what happens in the case, for example, with lots of families that receive the Connecticut EITC, they actually have a negative income tax liability, which is essential to offsetting, for example, the property tax and the sales tax. Okay, thank you very much. Representative Nuccio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So you said something that kind of piqued my curiosity, um, and I'm hoping you can give me some more information on it because um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really following how that all connects. There, um, you were talking about increasing the size of um, state employees, and how that was somehow going to help us. Um, I can't exactly how you put it. It's early in the morning for me yet. Not really, but I just haven't had tea yet. So um, I'm trying to kind of connect it. I struggle with uh, the idea that if we're gonna increase state employees, we're somehow gonna increase revenue because state employees do not generate revenue. Um, and so that is not a, a revenue generation um, employee. Whereas if private sector were to gain all those 50,000 employees, we would generate revenue. So can you kind of walk me through your, your logic on that? Sure, thank you. It's, thank it's an you. excellent question. So 
for many government employees, um, they do not bring in a profit. That is correct. But at the DRS, it's an exception. If you're hiring auditors, their job is to collect money for the state. And so the deputy DRS commissioner himself, uh, I think, said that they bring in about eight hundred to a thousand dollars. I forget if it was a day and hour, but the overall by year, it was $2 million a year that each auditor brings in. And we, we certainly don't pay auditors, you know, $2 million a year. So if we pay an auditor, I don't know, $100,000 or so, it's the difference between this, that the salary and the benefits, $100,000 or more compared to that $2 million they're bringing in. So in the case of the DRS, they are generating revenue for the state. It is a positive. So in, in this case, um, uh, it, it really is an exception that, that we think it's important for uh, the com committee members uh, to be aware of. And so this is a getting at both of the, these problems. These auditors are going to bring in a lot of money. Again, it's, if we, we showed that the, the uh, size of the staff in the DRS has fallen about 200 uh, positions over the last uh, few decades. And so we don't know specifically what the size of the audit staff at the DRS, but just to use that shortfall that we're operating with, if you filled those 200 spots and if each of those people are bringing in $2 million, which the DRS itself confirmed is the case, then that would be $400 million that the state would be um, you know, collecting in revenue. And it, again, gets to this point of part of our, our job shortfall in the state is that we're disproportionately losing these state and local government jobs. So it could help boost our economy from the job recovery perspective, but it can also bring in this much needed revenue that's really important to fund a lot of these investments that we think are critical and to you know, make uh, the, the tax system fair. I guess I'll also just add, closing that tax gap is important because that the tax gap is, is doesn't closing the tax gap doesn't require raising statutory tax rates. So the top tax rate is 6.99%. But what we're saying is you don't necessarily need to raise that to 8% or to some higher level to bring in revenue. You just need to make sure that the, the people that actually owe that 6.99% are paying that 6.99% on all, all the revenue. And so this could be used to fund these important tax reforms, but it's also uh, would make the tax system fair, for example, for the average wealthy family that's actually reporting all of its income and paying all of its income, they want to make sure that, you know, other wealthy families are also paying what they owe. And so this could be used to fund important tax reforms that make the tax system fair for working and middle class families, but it would also make the tax system fair for wealthy families that are reporting all their income and, and paying the full amount that's due. Do, do we have any, do we have any st stats that show that it's the high-end people that aren't paying, because I'm assuming the auditors, they're going to audit the taxes, they're going to go after people who haven't paid taxes, et cetera, like that. But I don't know, is that anecdotal or is that, do we have factual documentation saying this is where people aren't paying it? Great question again. So the DRS, so the, the problem is essentially we're not really auditing. So the DRS said that we have about 1% of audits and in some areas we're even below 1% and the average uh, in the US is 3%. And so we don't even know, 3% itself might not be high. So it might be the case that the overall US average should be increased, but we're below, substantially below that US average. Also, we have uh, substantial data from the, the IRS. And so, as I mentioned, there's, there's two main components of the tax gap. Uh, and the first is it's the composition of income sources. And so the IRS talks about it's these opaque income sources. It's rental income, business income. It's this income that doesn't have third party reporting. So at my job, I, I, you know, I, 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 file, I have a W-2 each year. So and the CT Voices, you know, sends that to the government. So everyone is aware there's third party reporting on my, on, on my income. And so the IRS shows that when you have wage income, there's less than 1% misreporting. But for these higher income, opaque income sources, it can be up to 55% misreporting. And so they show that the top, I believe, 5% account for, I think, half of the federal income tax gap and the top 1% account for 30%. So it's, it's a function of that you don't have third party reporting and you don't have auditing or sufficient auditing. Well, Brie has told us we are done. So thank you very much for your questions. I listened to Brie. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Listening to Brie is a wise thing to do on this committee. Uh, so appreciate that. Uh, and thank you for your testimony this morning and we will move on to the next group. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we're going to skip ahead a little bit and then return to our normal list of testifiers. So the next panel that I will be calling are Walter Gilliam, Katrina Coburn, 
Depeche Novaseria, and Meryl Gay. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, testify regarding SB 487 and infant toddler care. Um, my name is Walter Gilliam. I am the Elizabeth Mears and House Jameson Professor of Child Psychiatry and Psychology at the Yale University Child Study Center, and also the director of the Edward Ziegler Center in Child Development and Social Policy, which basically means that I spend my day doing research on um, early childhood programs and the effects of early childhood programs and trying to make best case recommendations regarding where um, public resources can best be spent. So I can sum up basically everything I'm gonna say with this one general statement, which is that infant toddler care is perhaps the biggest gaping hole in our overall child care system. Um, and it's a shame because everything we know about early childhood development points to the fact that the first three years of a child's life is probably the most important for the rest of that child's life. And so, Mostly that's based on the fact that during the first two years, especially, there's a massive amount of neuronal proliferation, which basically means babies' brains are making little tiny connections from one neuron to the next in order to allow them to be able to do very complex things. When you think about like just even talking, it's a very complicated thing. You have to think about what you're gonna say. You have to understand what the words are that you're gonna use. And then you have to be able to manipulate your tongue and your mouth and everything in order to be able to produce the sounds. Babies' brains are essentially making all of those kind of connections. But the other thing that's happening too is something called neuronal pruning. And when a baby's not getting the level of interaction needed in order for a skill to actually be reinforced, they basically lose those connections. We all do. Um, basically, that's how the brain operates. That's how the brain architecture is developed. We make connections. If we use those connections, those connections get strengthened. If we don't use those connections, then the connections prune off later on, which basically means this. The most good that we can possibly do in the life of a child is in the earliest years of that child's life. And likewise, the most harm that we can do in a child's life is really about what's happening in the very first years of that child's life. That's why it's important also to be thinking about the safety of children. When we're talking about really young children, they have huge safety needs. The last thing that they need is to be passed from one caregiver to the next because we don't have a care system in place for them. It is unsafe for children. There was a study that was done in North Carolina several years ago called the Abyssidarian Study, where they randomized children to either attend a high quality or infant toddler program or a high quality preschool program for three and four year olds or both. Or in another group, they might get all of that and also a follow-through program in the early elementary school years. What they found when they analyzed the results of child development was this. The earlier the intervention, the better. And if you want the effects to last longer, the longer the intervention, the better. That's essentially a summary of what they found. Now, Nobel laureate Jim Heckman, University of Chicago, has something called the Heckman curve, which basically shows the return on investment for public dollars and how much money you get back from investing in early care and education programs. And what he basically found was that infant toddler gives you back a stronger return on investment than preschool. Preschool gives you a stronger investment than elementary school and secondary school. And those give you a stronger investment than college. You know, and so when you think about it from that perspective, it's also a wise place to be able to spend your money. But the thing to also remember is that infant toddler care is in fact more expensive per child. And the reason why is because of ratios. It requires more adults per child to take care of an infant than it does to take care of a preschooler. And because of that, it actually drives up the cost. And that's why it's absolutely necessary that we have public subsidization of it because there's no way that that burden can be passed to parents and parents actually be able to afford it. Many parents will prefer a center-based infant toddler care program but many other parents will, will prefer a home-based care program. And one of the great things about being in Connecticut is that we have programs like All Our Kin, which are specifically about helping to make sure that home-based programs are the highest quality possible and providing those home-based providers that are providing infant toddler care the specialized skills that they need in order to be able to run a business out of their home and keep children safe and help them learn. So I'm going to end with a quick story. I was getting ready to... Um, testify for the House Sub-Appropriations Committee. 
um, in Washington, D.C. in like 2015. I live in Bethany and I was getting ready to drive to the airport. Stopped off at the local deli and ran into an octogenarian there named uh, Richard Doolittle. He's the, uh, the town expert on anything having to do with horticulture. He's a peach tree farmer. So anytime somebody had a question about gardening, you ask Dr. Doolittle. So I said, Dr. Doolittle, tell me, if, if we were to take the life of a peach tree and cut it into three different phases, the first phase is when you put a seed into the ground until it sprouts. The next phase, the second phase, is when that sprout turns into a tree. And the third phase is when the tree matures and starts to bear fruit. And say, for instance, you wanted really great peaches and you could control the weather and make it absolutely perfect conditions, but only for one of those phases. The other two, you don't know what you're gonna get. Which phase would you pick? And without any hesitation, he said, well, I'd pick the first one. And I said, well, why? Why would you pick the first one? And he said, because whatever you do for that little seed, sets the potential for everything that tree can become. And when I heard that and then got on the airplane, I knew that when I went to Washington, DC, if they're not gonna to listen to my science, perhaps they'll listen to the wisdom of a tree farmer from Bethany, Connecticut. And I hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gillum, uh, for being here today. Um, <clears throat> this question may not be best addressed by you, perhaps Mr. Gay, but. I guess the thing that I'm thinking of sitting here is I think all of us on this committee probably are aware of what you just testified about, Dr. Gillum, and yet um, we are in this situation. And I'm wondering, again, perhaps addressing this to, to Merrill, what are we currently doing and why is that not enough? And, and why is this so important, right? Because I think there are a lot of people in the legislature you know, perhaps who think, hey, there's a lot of programs out there to help these kids now. Why is that not enough? And why is this bill so important? And I also, before I say that, I just want to recognize that my co-chair, Senator Fonfara, is a modest guy. Um, but, but this bill, I think, is one of the more important bills we're considering this session. And I know he's been working very hard on this. And I think it, it's a great thing that we're going to have a good discussion of today. But uh, I would just love to, to hear an answer to that question. Maybe, Merrill, if you can try to answer it. Sure. Um, as Dr. Gilliam said, infant toddler care is the glaring hole in our child care system. Uh, there are licensed spots for one out of three children um, under, three, under age three, and there are huge disparities. Um, so in a wealthy community like Farmington, there are 87 slots for every 100 children. In Hartford, there are 18 for every hundred children. In New Britain, there are only nine for every children, every hundred children. Um, you, when we don't have a system of care for infants and toddlers that uh, impacts children, it impacts the achievement gap, and it perpetuates intergenerational poverty um, as parents who can't find care can't go to work. And right now, while we have a huge workforce shortage across the economy, we need to be looking at all of the ways in which we can um, address that workforce shortage. That workforce shortage impacts the early childhood community right now. Um, of the uh, 1,500 funded infant toddler slots in the child development centers, uh, we have many, a good number of them that are not occupied because they don't have staff. They can't afford to pay staff with the funding that the state provides uh, for the CDC so, program. Meryl, can I, can I just ask you, I'm sorry, um, yep. my time is only five minutes and I want to make sure I maximize our time. So is it correct to say that you can kind of break this problem into two different categories? One is access, meaning that there are just not enough slots for people. And even if there were, there'd be an affordability issue. And then the second category is that the, the centers themselves don't have the resources that they need to attract the talent that they need to care for these children. Is that a fair sort of bifurcation of the problem? Yeah, they're all interrelated because 80% of care is paid for, actually probably more than 80% of care um, at the infant toddler level is paid for by parents. Uh, and parents can't, only about uh, 10, 20% of parents can actually afford the true cost of um, infant toddler care. Uh, if you use the federal recommendation that people don't spend more than 7% of their income. Um, market rate infant toddler care is expensive. Ask any parent who's had to pay for it. Um, and because it's expensive, there's not much available. 
Um, right now, the shortage is even more critical than it was normally because we have so many programs that have closed their infant toddler rooms because those are more staff intensive. And if they've got a, a shortage of staff, putting them in the preschool classroom where there are 10 kids paying the bill as opposed to four kids uh, makes a huge difference. Well, I've experienced this myself and I am a relatively privileged person living in a very privileged community. And uh, my wife and I are expecting our second child in August. And when we went to the place that our current toddler goes to, uh, the director said, I'm sorry, I don't have a slot for him until the following year after that child was born. Uh, and then we went to find other places in the area and they too were full. And again, I'm coming from a place of privilege on this. So uh, imagine what it's like for people who don't have the means that I do, that don't live in the community that I do uh, to navigate the system. I'm sure it's even more complex. And I think that is why we are here today. So uh, again, I wanna shout out my co-chair for his hard work on this. I see Representative Sanchez, who's the chair of the Education Committee, is going to chime in in a moment, who's also uh, worked hard on this issue uh, in the past. Uh, and I want to thank you all for being here this morning. So um, I saw Representative Mesker's hand first, then we'll go to the chair of the Education Committee, Bobby Sanchez. Representative, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you, Chair Scanlon, and thank you, uh... Uh, Merrill, for your testimony, uh, and as well as the, uh, the, the expert from Bethany. I appreciate it. Um, the demands on our budget are pretty high. Our tax rate is relatively high. Um, we're trying to balance a fair amount of needs in the state. If I have to look at the earned income tax credit and I have to look at the educational dollars and I have to look at resources to best aid the state and the economic growth of the state? How do I balance between an earned income tax credit and, and, and aid to education, to early childhood education? Because I, I firmly believe that getting, closing the achievement gap, providing education in those early years is a fundamentally crucial issue. I, I liked your analogy with Peach Street. So how, how would you look at the priorities there? Is that directed at one of us in particular? Why don't we start with you, Meryl, and then uh, and then to our expert on Peachtree, our, our economist. I, I just want to figure out how I allocate resources between those two demands of an early internet, early childhood yeah. education and an no, And practice. we do have two other experts uh, on as well. Um, okay. So very quickly, we have long neglected infant toddler care because we haven't had money. Um, Senator Fonfara has identified a pot of money that does not require increasing taxes. It's taking funds that are currently being uh, put into the uh, rainy day fund, which is now overflowing. Um, my argument is that this is a long neglected area that will have an amazing impact on the lives of children and help to make Connecticut a more equitable place by um, helping to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty. When families don't have care, that means they can't work. And when they can't work, they're raising children in poverty. Um, this, is the, um, this is a critical issue um, for both addressing the persistent achievement gap and the persistent problem of inter intergenerational poverty. And given that you have this sort of opportunity to use a pot of money for something. Um, our argument is that you should use it on this thing that is most impactful. And I, would I wouldn't just, okay, sorry. I, I wouldn't dispute that. I would say that if I take it from the rainy day fund, I'm assuming going forward that I have the fund within the rainy day fund or within my revenue stream to continue to do that, right? And it's not an argument, it's just an observation. Go ahead, sorry to interrupt. One of the other experts want to weigh in on this? I'm happy to say to say something on mm -hmm. it. I, I think um, it, it's, a, it's a complicated question that you're asking because you're, you're, when you're talking about child tax credits versus investing in infant toddler care, because essentially one of those is a demand side solution and the other one is a supply side solution. 
And right. you can have you can you can do a, a demand side solution um, in terms of uh, making sure that parents have money in their pocket to be able to actually afford afford childcare. But if you don't have the childcare slots available, it doesn't matter how much resources people have to purchase something that doesn't exist. And in Connecticut alone, I mean, you could easily just go around and just take a look at some childcare centers, and you will find quite a few that only serve preschoolers. And you'll find a handful of them that serve preschoolers and infants and toddlers. But I'll tell you the one group you'll never find is a childcare center that only serves infants and toddlers. And the reason why is because the cost of infant toddler care is so great, they have to have the preschoolers to offset the cost. That's how they balance the budgets is on the scant little teeny tiny margins that they can get on preschoolers. And that alone should tell us that the only way that we're gonna actually be able to have the level of access that we need to infant toddler childcare for parents to be able to go to work is through subsidization of the infant toddler side. So it might take, should I take it to understand that it, between the two tax, the tax credit, earning and tax credit or, or, or the early childhood education, you, you think that the structural issue of having early childhood education availability and the facilities and continuity of education is, would, would be a larger priority, potentially. 30 seconds, please summarize the questioning. That was it. Perhaps I would lean that way. Okay, thank you. I'm, uh, we're in that deliberative process, so I'm just looking for information. Thank you. No further questions. Representative Sanchez, followed by Senator Cassano. Thank you, um, Chairman Scanlon, and, and thank you um, to the Chair, um, Senator Fanfara, for bringing this bill forward. Um, as you all know, um, in the Education Committee this year, um, this has been a big topic about early child care, um, um, particularly when it comes to um, the staffing. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm glad that um, Merrill and um, Dr. Gilman have brought up um, you know, the, the, the ratios and um, staffing. Um, and it's so important that we look at this. Um, we don't have enough infant toddler care in the state of Connecticut. And I believe um, Merrill at one point told me there's about 50,000 um, infant toddlers throughout the state of Connecticut that can use service, but, but can't, can't find um, infant toddler care in their communities, which is, mind-boggling, the, the amount of, of children that can't get this service. And the analogy that Dr. Gilman gave about the peach tree, absolutely. Um, that seed is so important. And um, the comparison between the an achievement gap too, as well, um, we have children that will benefit if we get, uh, provide them the infant toddler care that they need in, in, in many of our communities, particularly in our um, cities. Um, so, uh, my question, um, and I guess my question would be to Mero. We know, we understand that um, toddler, infant toddler care is so important, um, but where do you think the money would be coming from? And I see some language in regards to smart start bonding. Yeah, so um, a lot of people have been confused by that. Uh, the smart start bonding section is relatively minor. Uh, there's $25 million uh, in stranded uh, bond funds from Smart Start. Smart Start is not building new classrooms anymore. Um, and so this is, that's a sort of a secondary thing about tapping that un untapped pot of money. The real source of money here is the money that the revenue cap um, prevents the state from spending. Um, that currently stands at 1% of tax revenue and it, over the next um, several years that was going to increase by a quarter percent a year to 2% in 2026. Um, so that's money that the state was, is currently prevented from spending. The volatility cap has produced plenty of savings, and that's why the rainy day fund is overflowing now. Um, so this is, this is not going to put the state's fiscal situation in jeopardy because the combination of the various fiscal controls that were put in. Um, I heard someone describe the revenue cap and the um, volatility cap as uh, belt and suspenders. You don't need both. Um, so this would, would free up some money and um, 
the estimate is 300 million or so now growing to 500 million, that, that using that pot of money for something impactful when you have this sort of rare opportunity to do so um, is what this bill is trying to do. Thank you. Thank you for that um, answer. And, and we all know that um, we have a crisis right now in the state of Connecticut in regards to childcare. And, um, and we, we, taught, we touched up on the ratios of four to one and how expensive it, it is to run a, an infant toddler classroom. Um, can you tell me what the qualifications for an infant toddler teacher is and what is their base salary at the moment? So uh, that varies whether it's in a state funded center or it's in a private childcare. Um, in private childcare, there isn't really a you know, minimum uh, criteria. Uh, and many of those staff are paid very close to minimum wage. That's why there is a uh, real shortage now in staffing because people can go to Target or even McDonald's and earn more money. Um, and within the um, state-funded program, so they uh, have a requirement that they have degreed teachers in classrooms. Uh, currently, that's an associate's degree um, teacher. And um, that's supposed to go up to a bachelor's degree teacher for all of the fun state-funded childcare programs. But they have not had an increase in their payment levels since 2015. And that's left them unable to uh, pay competitive wages um, we've got people with bachelor's degrees earning 16 bucks an hour. And quite honestly, there are people at McDonald's earning more money than that. Um, so that's a real shame and is a problem that needs to be fixed. This program, this, yeah, summarize? Sure, this bill would um, target, uh, would create funding available at the end of, at the beginning of next fiscal year. So it is not something that's gonna address the current crisis, but it is extremely important. Thank, thank you for those answers, Marilyn. I have a whole bunch of questions, but I know I have, I have my, uh, many colleagues with their hands up. So um, we're in a sta sad state here in, in the state of Connecticut when it comes to infant toddler care and, and child care. So um, we have to do something about this this year. Um, thank you. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Senator Cassano, followed by Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I begin, I do want to thank Merrill uh, for Merrill for years of service going back to see Jeff. Uh, uh, appreciate that. Uh, and also, uh, while I'm at it, uh, again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Fonferrer. It was uh, John Fonferrer that came up with a volatility cap that has put us in the position we're in now. And uh, um, that's the kind of thing that we need to do. I raise that because I'm concerned that we keep talking about the state, the state, the state. Um, we're not gonna re resolve the daycare problem without doing it with local government and local funds and some combination. And some of the suggested tax cuts that were that I've heard earlier already today uh, impact those local communities. Uh, um, you know, all government is local and children live in uh, communities and we need to expand somehow. Uh, we need to expand childcare daycare programs that tie in with the education system perhaps but to be on a local basis, it's going to need to require funding from the state, just like we fund education. We're not funding childcare the same way. And, uh, and, and so, Merrill, you've been doing this for a long time. Uh, do you see trends in this direction or are we just still doing it at the state level and not at the local level? So I have seen um, more school districts uh, expanding their pre-K programs. Um, particularly uh, integrated classrooms with their, to create uh, normative peers along with their special ed classrooms. Um, there's lo some local funding that's going into that as well as the school readiness program, which is state funded. Um, I don't see that as a real place where we're gonna see much room, much uh, movement in the infant toddler space. Um, and so I think that the work to create some contracted subsidized slots in family child care and child care centers, which this bill proposes to do, is the most likely way that we can make real progress in this area where we have such a shortage of care. Remember, one out of three children has a spot now. Um, and in places, urban areas, it is a much 
uh, lower ratio of uh, spots available for children. Thank you. And, and I know it's a challenge, but uh, one of the things that I hope will come out of this is we can look at the local school system and it's generally the pre-K or the K, uh, but we don't go down to childcare. We need to extend that level so that it comes from birth uh, to pre-K to public education. Uh, and if we establish that process over time, uh, as children are born, they're gonna be born into a safer and a, a, and a more potential educational environment. Uh, the steps are gonna be there for, in that municipality. So I hope that over a period of time, a short period of time, we can pursue uh, a program like that so that uh, we don't have to look at it as an individual thing every year in the budget and so on. It's gonna be part of the process. So thank you very much, appreciate it. Representative Cheeseman followed by Representative Nuccio. Thank you. I want to thank you for coming here today, Meryl, with, with all of your folks. Um, and this is not really a question to you. This is more a comment um, and concerns that I'd like to voice to my chairs and everyone else on this meeting. One, I see the language has this violation of the revenue cap starting on July 1st, 2022. We actually have a bond lock covenant, which prevents violating these caps until fiscal year 2023. And indeed, I'm concerned, uh, this now explains the language in section four because the bond lock covenant says you can't violate um, this obligation to comply with the caps unless bondholders are protected in another way or the governor declares an emergency and a vote at least three fifths of either chamber approve and the change is limited to the fiscal year in progress and section four removes that. So I do find this a somewhat disingenuous way to fund an incredibly valid and worthy program. I think it's incredibly telling that every organization in the state from you Merrill, from Connecticut Voices for Children to CBIA, to our major employers is saying that this is a crisis. But I think addressing it in this way without having an honest conversation about how we are in effect violating an agreement we made with our bondholders and doing this in a, I don't know, using some fast and fancy footwork is uh, as I say, doing a disservice to the, this cause of providing these slots to the families who need them and really having an honest discussion about how we're going to pay for this. I also feel having this discussion in finance as opposed to appropriation is not appropriate. So I want to thank you again. And what you do is amazing. We have to find a solution, but I do not believe this bill is the way. And I did want to put my comments and my feeling about this on the record. Thank you, Chair Scanlon. Thank you, Representative. I have some thoughts about that, but I saw my colleague, Senator Funfara's hand go up and Representative Nuccio, with your permission, I'm gonna to defer to the chair of the committee, but I believe he probably would like to respond to uh, Representative Cheeseman. So I'm gonna to go to him next. I'll be very chair. brief, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a public hearing. It's not a comment period, but we'll have that uh, when and if this bill comes before us for a vote. But I would just like for point of clarification, um, it is not a violation uh, of the uh, of the existing covenant, anything that would happen would have be happen happened post uh, the expiration of the covenant, not at any time beforehand. Uh, is the, uh, the the ranking member is correct that uh, um, it, it, it was part of, I was part of not solely the uh, initiator, but certainly part of the effort uh, to establish the covenant, and I would do nothing uh, whatsoever to um, to violate that. I would just like to say that um, this is a repurposing of, um, uh, uh, of revenue that we have established here in this committee um, in, in terms of uh, revenue that we generated solely on the revenue side and we're repurposing that revenue um, that we have created a mechanism for, for establishing. And so I, I think the purview of this committee certainly and the cognizance of this committee is certainly appropriate for this measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Representative Nuccio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I, I guess I do have a, a question following up to what um, the ranking member asked because I too was a little concerned with the language in the, um, in the bill and what we were talking about, which is diverting 
money from the spending cap. Um, you know, I, I wasn't here in 2017, but I think that was probably one of the smartest things that this government has ever done to take care of our um, unfunded liabilities and, and the debt that we have out there for, for generations to come. And anytime we mess with that, I get a little wary. So I'm not quite sure I am following and I'm hoping at some point we can have a better conversation of exactly how that would work because I just wanna to continue to see our debts paid down. Um, we can't live under the debt that we have in this state. It's, it's staggering the amount of debt that each individual has. Um, but my second question is really in reviewing the bill, um, I think this daycare issue as you mentioned, Chair Scanlon, you know, you're having an issue with it and you live in an area of privilege, as you noted. Um, and there are, I think this is something that we're seeing all over the state. I think we see this um, rampantly. And, and I'm wondering if it's a matter of, uh, we mentioned supply and demand. So I'm really concerned in the bill that it's, this funding is only going to go to certain areas, certain people in certain areas. When I see this as something that is affecting everybody. And honestly, I really don't like legislation that does that. If it's an issue that is broad stroken in the state of Connecticut, then we should look at how we can resolve that for the state of Connecticut and not for just certain areas. Now, if we have to do a certain sliding scale kind of a thing um, for er more areas that have more need, I would, I would be much more inclined to get behind something like that rather than handpicking who gets this benefit again. So I'm wondering, Meryl, if you could say, here's my other concern is it's a supply thing. So even if you've got the one in nine, one in 80, et cetera, et cetera, um, we need to make more people want to be childcare providers, regardless of the area to meet the needs of the amount of people that we have out there. So how do you see this bill creating more positions and not just funding what parents are paying um, for childcare? I have three children, I had childcare. Well, they're all adults now, so, you know done that, been there, but um, how do we do that? So this bill um, proposes that you that the state pay at the federally recommended 75th percentile of market. So that that would be the equivalent of being able to get care in three quarters of the facilities that offer care. Currently we pay at the 50th percent of the market, but we do it on a market study that was from a couple of years ago. So, um, and right now with the shortage of care, if you've got that subsidy amount with Care for Kids, you will have difficulty finding a spot, first of all. And if you do, you will end up paying your parent fee that Care for Kids says you should pay plus more on top, um, which will make it hard for family, low-income families to afford care at all. What this proposes to do is pay at the federally recommended 75th percentile of market, um, which would make it um, more feasible for programs to offer infant toddler care. Right now, um, we have a lot of a lot of the funded slots are not filled because there's such a shortage of staff. People are choosing programs are choosing to put their staff into the pre-K where it generates more revenue than in the infant toddler care. The, the shortage of, of staff is due to the low pay. You've got to increase the pay level. And um, for subsidized slots, that means you've got to increase the per child payment level. That's Doesn't that then know. though, just make it, it just, I hate to say this because I'm an accountant, cost accounting, you know, you pay more, that means it costs more, it means we're subsidizing more, you know, like I, I guess this is the, the rat hole that we're, we go down, right? So um, they're hiring more people in the preschool because they make more profit in the preschool. So we're saying if we subsidize more of the payment, and the parent paid less and the state paid more. Again, I guess I'm just not seeing how so this- In many function. places, there just isn't any care. Where I'm in, in New Britain, we put our, my son on the wait list uh, when we knew he was coming. And I got a call when he turned three saying they had a spot. Yep. Uh, there was, you know, there was a three year wait. Um, and that's simply because there are not enough people in the community who can afford to pay for care so nobody offers it. Um, this would address that problem by contracting programs to provide care for income eligible families. And that would be and at a high enough payment rate that those families, um, that the program can afford to provide the care and that the, there are plenty of families who need the care in our community. Um, 
And so it focuses on the places where the, the greatest shortages and the um, lowest income families. So I, I guess uh, I, I know we have to wrap up, Ray, I'm listening, but um, I guess I still struggle with the fact that this is gonna be a problem for everybody everywhere. And while I think we need those resources in those areas, we also need them in other areas too. And we're not gonna talk about that. So um, I, 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 we're gonna have to catch up because I'm still struggling with this. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, I, uh, Representative And seeing no further hands. I would just say, Representative, to your comments, um, and, and to what Senator from Far just said, we will have probably a, a lengthy discussion about this uh, in the coming days before our deadline, where we can really get into the nuts and bolts of this and have a conversation about the policy uh, and the politics of it. But I think today, uh, obviously, it's been great to hear from this group, and we appreciate you all coming in today and look forward to continuing the conversation as we go forward. Uh, and I know our members will uh, greatly appreciate you making themselves yourselves available to them if they have questions. Uh, but just seeing no other further questions, we'll leave it at that today. So thank you. Thank you. The next testifier we have is Puya Jirami. Hi there. Uh, good morning, um, uh, Representative Scanlon, Senator Funfara, and the distinguished members of the committee. My name is Puya Garami. I'm the director of Recovery for All which is a statewide coalition of nearly 60 faith community and labor organizations united to eliminate systemic inequalities across Connecticut. Thanks so much for the opportunity to provide testimony uh, regarding Senate Bill 11. Connecticut is the wealthiest state here in the world's wealthiest country, um, but of course, um, it is also one of the most unequal. As all of you know, the 2014 state tax incidence analysis showed that the bottom 50% of earners in our state contribute 23.6% of their income in taxes, whereas the top 1% contribute only 7.5%. The most recent report this year shows that low-income households have lost ground since 2014, while the effective tax rate for the ultra-wealthy has remained flat. Um, so to put it simply, Connecticut's tax structure is even more regressive now um, than it was in 2014. Senate Bill 11 makes changes at the edges of our regressive tax structure, but does nothing to create the kind of transformational change truly required to fix our upside down tax system. Section one of this bill expands the property tax credit from $200 to $300, theoretically providing tax relief to some homeowners. Um, and while this attempts to counter the regressive property tax, it only benefits those who are fortunate enough to own a home. Moreover, the relief provided by Section 1 will likely be neutralized up as property values and therefore property tax assessments have increased between 15 and 40% since the start of the pandemic, depending on the community. Renters also bear the brunt of property taxes shifted upon them by landlords, um, but Section 1 provides no mechanism for them to share in this relief. By contrast, bills this committee heard earlier this month Senate Bill 383 and House Bill 5403 provide immediate and permanent relief to those who need it most. Um, the permanent expansion of the EITC, uh, the creation of a state level child tax credit um, provide a crucial financial lifeline for low income individuals and families. Um, these measures would help reduce our state's extreme racial, economic and gender disparities. So we urge members of the committee to give these win-win proposals your full support. We're deeply disappointed that Section 2 of SB 11 only temporarily extends the, uh, expands the EITC to 40%, and Section 18 repeals the requirement for OPM to conduct a study about implementing a state-level child tax credit. Um, in, in sum, Governor Lamont's Senate Bill 11 doesn't meet this moment um, of crisis. It makes some tweaks to our regressive tax structure, but much more is required um, to repair our unfair tax system. Um, now, last session, this committee took decisive action um, by passing a brave and historic revenue package. Uh, now, uh, one year later, as state coffers are full um, and the rainy day fund is overflowing, um, Recovery for All encourages the committee to act boldly once again and act favorably on Senate Bill 383, House Bill 5403, Senate Bill 28, and Senate Bill 443. Um, through seconds, these, please summarize. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Through these measures, um, by adding equity, fairness, and transparency to our state tax code, um, everyone in Connecticut, uh, no matter where they live, what they look like, or how much money they make, um, will have an equal opportunity to survive and thrive. Thank you so much.
Thank you for your testimony today. I do not see any questions, but appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Puya. Um, we have a panel of testifiers up next. They are Jeff Beckham, Tom Fiore, Brian Tassinari, Matthew Dayton, and Daniel Inez, all from Office of Policy and Management. Uh, thank you, Madam Administrator. Um, my colleagues and I are from the Office of Policy and Management. I'm Jeffrey Beckham, Acting Secretary of the Office of Policy and Management. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Fonfara, Representative Scanlon, Representative Cheeseman, Senator Martin, and distinguished members of the Finance Revenue and Bonding Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. We've sent you several pieces of testimony on a variety of bills. I'm going to focus on the governor's tax bill, which is Senate Bill number 11. Um, we have proposed this year what we think are modest but impactful tax relief measures, uh, recognizing that the state has um, enjoyed budget surpluses for the three uh, for the three uh, past fiscal years, and that we currently have a robust uh, budget reserve fund, as well as an unprecedented uh, level of federal support this year uh, in, in response to the pandemic. Um, the governor's tax package has been calibrated carefully to stay within the guidelines that the U.S. Treasury has given us. Uh, in exchange for um, uh, or as a, in connection with the aforementioned federal support. And we have been creative, we think, in uh, trying to apportion some tax relief that is at both the municipal level as, as well as at the state level. The municipal level support, municipal level tax cuts uh, are not impacted by the ARPA limits. Uh, but the state tax uh, breaks are. Um, we are providing meaningful middle class tax relief in the form of the, uh, the car tax, which the mill rate cap is actually in another committee. It's in the Appropriations Committee uh, that is being funded uh, through an, an additional appropriation for the municipal grants that reimburse the towns for that tax break. However, in this committee, you have in Senate Bill 11, uh, the property tax credits against the personal income tax, where we're proposing to uh, accelerate so-called full eligibility, as well as increasing the amount of the credit available. Um, we are providing for an acceleration of the pension and annuities tax exemption for our retirees, uh, making the state a little more attractive uh, for retirees to stay here and not move out of state. We are assisting students with repayment of student loan debt with the uh, increase in the uh, break that we give to employers who help their employees defray those costs. And not in these bills, but elsewhere in the governor's budget proposals, uh, we have uh, in, in, in December, we made through DRS uh, payments to EITC eligible households of about $75 million. And the governor is proposing uh, to spend additional federal funds in the current fiscal, in the coming fiscal year uh, to um, uh, an additional payment of about $43 million in those EITC eligible households. So we have apportioned and calibrated the relief across income groups, uh, across uh, tax types. Uh, we have calibrated to stay within guidelines. We think it's modest, but impactful recognizing that the uh, people of the state of Connecticut uh, in, in these times do deserve some relief. Uh, we think we, this approach has been balanced in terms of its reach. Uh, it's been balanced and calibrated within those guidelines. It's part of a balanced budget that stays within our constitutional and statutory caps. Um, and we are here to take your questions. Well, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary. Congratulations on your appointment recently and look forward to working with you on this committee. Um, I will start um, where you just kind of left off, which is that um, I think there is quite a bit of uh, confusion slash most people don't understand uh, the ARPA rules and, and limitations. And I think we were just having a conversation that you may or may not have been hearing about of the incredible childcare needs that we have in the state. And there is a bit of a disconnect, perhaps on this committee, but certainly in the public, about the fact that while we have made incredible progress when it comes to our fiscal situation, we've got uh, overflowing budget surplus in the current fiscal year, we've got a full rainy day fund, we're paying down our pension debt, and yet we are handcuffed, in a sense, by this ARPA rule that basically says we can only cut about $175 million worth of taxes this year. And I'm wondering if you can shed some light and, and some further perspective on that, uh, and then describe why it is that you chose how you chose, or why the governor chose how he chose to use that small amount of money to do what he chose to do. 
Well, you're quite right. We were we spent quite a, a bit of time during the uh, preparation of the budget this year examining the uh, hundreds of pages of guidance given to us by the U.S. Treasury uh, last fall and this winter. And in uh, analyzing that and consulting with the federal government, we did arrive at the understanding that you uh, have just uh, summarized that in terms of the what the federal government calls the de minimis rule, we can within um, uh, one percent of our all funds budget, we can cut taxes if they fall below that number, which uh, we think is about 250 to 300 million in the current or, or in the next fiscal year. But because of already programmed tax cuts, uh, that that room is actually a little lower. It's about 180 million, 179 to be precise. And we pro uh, we programmed in the governor's budget 174 million in state tax breaks. We, however, also provided 160 million in municipal tax breaks with the car mill rate tax cap, which is in Senate Bill 9, which is our general government implementer, which is in the Appropriations Committee. It's there because we make up uh, to the towns for that revenue loss with a $160 million increase to the grant program that compensates towns for, for that, that break on the, uh, on the car tax. So we balanced it between municipal and state. Uh, we had to be creative about that. The municipal doesn't count against the ARPA, the state does. So we stayed under that $179 million limit. Um, I will say this, the um, finding ways to fund programs, uh, as, you, as you talked about in the last couple of groups, uh, that's likely not an, an ARPA problem. Uh, we have other problems with that approach using the revenue cap amount, but uh, that's likely not a, an ARPA issue. Um, but we did stay within ARPA uh, in, in terms of the governor's proposals. We think it is calibrated and uh, appropriate under the circumstances. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, now, moving on to the child tax credit, as you know, it's something that's very, very important to me and something that passed this committee last year. Uh, I, I can't ask you to speak for what happened there because that was not uh, during your time as the secretary. Um, but during that debate that we had last year and, and during the budget negotiations, the administration was very clear um, that they felt like one of the reasons we didn't really need a child tax credit at the time was because the federal government was endeavoring to do that as part of the president's Build Back Better agenda. And therefore, we put the study in there uh, in order to sort of be the fail safe should uh, the worst happen. And the worst did happen. Uh, and yet um, there is a bill before us to then remove the study. And so I'm wondering if you can describe uh, the administration's rationale for doing that, given that the rationale for having it in there in the first place was uh, for the exact situation that we now find ourselves in. Certainly. Um, first of all, I will observe that the Congress is still in session for this year. And I believe I did read that Senator Manchin has come back to the table um, in Washington, and there may be action on that this year for all we know. Um, that said, um, as I read that provision in the bill last year, it wasn't merely a study. It was directing OPM to come up with a plan to implement a child tax credit. It was effectively commanding us to make this part of the governor's budget proposal, I guess. The governor made his choices in terms of what he thinks are advisable and commendable uh, uh, tax changes this year, and he put those in front of you. So we, we simply elected not to make that one of them. We, as I say, we have uh, made available both in December and later this year payments to EITC eligible households, uh, many of which doubtless contain children. Uh, we've tried to be balanced in terms of the demographics across which our tax uh, proposals go. And uh, again, staying within those ARPA considerations as well. Okay. Uh, well, seeing some other hands here, I won't monopolize this discussion. I want to thank you again, Mr. Secretary, for coming before us today. Um, obviously, uh, you know, the governor is very, very interested in property tax and other tax cuts, and we welcome that. Uh, on this committee. Obviously, this committee has their own ideas, and we look forward to working together uh, with you and the administration to get a very good tax package done this year uh, that I think gives the relief that we're all looking to deliver to our constituents uh, done in, in this very, very important time. So I want to thank you, Mr. Beckham, for that. Uh, and now we'll go to Senator Funfara for some questions, followed by Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, not a good time to be multitasking. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, at the end of your um, responses to uh, Chairman Scanlon's questions, 
you made a passing reference to um, your uh, disagreement with um, 487, which is the um, child care bill, but you chose not to testify on it. It was a throwaway comment, if you will, um, without any substance, um, which is in, I anticipate by looking at the, the sign up list that there'll be significant testimony on that bill. But you choose not, you chose not to include that in your testimony and also in passing indicate that you have issues with that. Could you um, help the committee understand your position? Certainly. Your Certainly, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the opportunity to discuss that and other matters with you the other day. And you did uh, uh, give us a heads up uh, about this proposal. And uh, certainly I heard uh, your passion on the topic and I've heard today uh, and listened to the earlier panels, uh, the needs described and the, uh, the benefits that would, be, uh, would flow from increased investment in that area. Uh, and I don't think anyone debates that, uh, the merits of that at all. Um, the method of paying for this, uh, what would be hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, in new spending, it would give us pause. It, it would uh, go into the revenue cap amount that we have only just in the last four or five years began to realize. Uh, it was a very prudent set of proposals made uh, four or five years ago, uh, a volatility cap, a revenue cap, all of which have driven resources to the reserve fund. Uh, for the first time in our history, we have a, a reserve fund that overflows. And under the laws that we have today, as you know, we have been able to pay down um, unfunded liabilities uh, in our pension funds uh, to the tune of $1.6 billion so far. Uh, we're on track. If we leave these laws undisturbed, we're on track to do that again this year and, and probably next year. Um, that is an issue about which we have heard a lot over the years, the unfunded liability, the pension funds. We are finally doing something about that. And we are now only a couple of years later after having gotten our first credit rating increase in the last 20 years. This is proposing to do a 180 and take that away. Um, so I think that that's perhaps not advisable. I think the governor would be very challenged to, uh, to support that. Um, that was, that was the issue that I was alluding to in my in my comment. Well, I couldn't disagree with you more about, and there'll be other opportunities to speak on this, but I couldn't disagree with you more that this particular provision has much to do. It is not it was not created to be an issue to um, address uh, long term debt. This is a function of intra-fiscal year shortfall, which the budget reserve fund is provided, will provide for as well, not this fund. This, would, this is a, a extra belts and suspenders that, that I've concluded personally, others could disagree, um, is not necessary given the strength of the volatility cap and that an investment of this nature or any other nature uh, ought to be considered at this time. But um, it's not surplus. I think that's important that the committee understand it is not surplus. It is an intended set aside of 2% ultimately of the revenue that we generate um, for intra um, um, fiscal year uh, shortfalls and the, repur the repurposing of that towards a program that will ultimately do more to reduce demands on services uh, in our budget, um, I personally believe is um, a wiser use of these resources at this time, um, given the strength of the volatility cap. Um, and, I'll, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think that um, he may be. Uh, I'm here. Person. Okay. I'm here, Representative, uh, Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Chairman. I thank you for coming here today. Um, Jeffrey, uh, Chairman Scanlon touched on a lot of what I wanted to discuss, which was explaining to all and sundry just what a straight jacket 
the acceptance of those ARPA dollars put in terms of providing uh, you know, tax relief to our residents. But I wanna to touch on a couple of the bills on which you submitted testimony, but, but haven't talked about. Um, one was, I believe, 478. Um, you had issues with, I believe, of course, contingency fees being paid to assessors. And the other was 481 to do with the community banking. So if you could just explain a little bit about your what your problems with these particular bills. I'm sorry, the first one is? 478, I guess, Martin Heft, that concerning property assessment appeals. It, there's something to do with contingency fee language for um, appraisal. Okay, uh, Martin may be here to discuss that piece. Uh, I think on I submitted separate testimony of 478 that doesn't mention that, okay. uh, but I know that we were, um, I think that the contingency fee uh, prohibition is in several bills. And I think there was concern that it, it land in something that passes. I think we're supportive of the contingency fee uh, uh, prohibition. want to find a vehicle that's going to move forward. Correct. I think that's what the substance of his testimony is. Okay. And 481, the community banking yeah, the community banking bill, uh, the Treasurer's Office currently operates a discretionary community banking program where they can, within their um, uh, discretion, uh, invest part of the state's uh, operating cash in, in those um, um, uh, banks. This would make it mandatory, and it would call for a mandatory uh, amount that would be uh, of the state's cash that would put toward this purpose. Um, we would prefer that the state, the treasurer continue to be, have the discretion to maximize uh, where the state's cash should be invested to avoid perhaps losing revenue uh, and leave it to his professional discretion as to how best to manage that, that asset, making it mandatory and mandating a certain amount of it go uh, to uh, these programs and is, is, we think, not advisable. And I think it, it also removes competitive bidding that's also a, a part of our testimony, and we, we're, we're not sure that that's uh, a great idea either. We do question, um, we think that that's always a good idea to do competitive bidding, so. All right, thank you. Thank you for your explanations. Thank you for explaining the, uh, the ARPA constraints, and I uh, have no further questions, Chairman Scanlon. Senator Fonfara for the second time, then we'll go to Representative Chafee. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, I'll defer to Representative Chafee. Representative Chafee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. I had a um, similar question regarding the ARPA um, rules to Senator or to uh, Rep Scanlon. Um, mine's a little more specific. So if, um, if we do cut a tax, but the revenue is offset by another tax, so say we, you know, we do the EITC tax and then we implement um, a new tax on capital gains. How would that affect the ARPA rules? You can, and I have uh, an expert or a couple actually with me today, but you can offset your tax cuts with, with uh, other tax increases. It's the net uh, uh, changes in tax law that would be implicated under the ARPA rules. Have I got that right? Is it Dan who knows this? Uh, yeah, Jeff, that is correct. Oh, Tom, Tom knows it too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. You could That's also thought. you could also cut spending by uh, that amount as well as to pay for the to pay for the tax cut. Okay, thank you for the confirmation on that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator Fonfara, followed by Representative Doucette. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, are you you, you made a comment about? Uh, leaving it to the discretion of the treasurer in terms of the investments he makes in his uh, uh, in his uh, uh, program that that um, allows him to invest up to $100 million in local banks and credit unions. Do you know how much that program is utilized right now? I do not, but one of my staff may. Tom, do you have a handle on that? I think there's approximately $20 million right now, maybe just over $20 million that's in that program. And it is subject to competitive bidding. And I think that is the level that the treasurer's office has received insofar as number of bids. And do you know how much they've invested in the last year? I think it's still in that $20 million range if I'm answering your question. 
that's been a cumulative number, but it's about $4 million last year to two institutions in New Haven. I, I'm not exactly sure what institutions, but I believe there are two. There are two in New Haven, $4 million. Out of the 100 that the program is eligible to be invested with no direction whatsoever in terms of the types of uh, communities to be invested in, which this bill calls for. So given that, uh, what would the what is the opposition from the administration uh, with with providing direction um, to the treasurer in, in terms of where to invest these dollars and to promote the program to encourage institutions to come forward and participate, which many say they've never even heard of the program. I don't think we'd be opposed to working with you and the treasurer's office on promoting the program, uh, making sure they were. Uh, good and viable uh, places to put this money uh, as long as it was safe and was giving us a return on the investment. I think the concern is that the state's operating cash and the treasurer's discretion there is um, it's done for the purpose of maximizing the state's financial position. Uh, it's not primarily to direct resources to particular communities. So we'd want to make sure that, that is the pro that is the purpose of the program. Well, but it, it needs to be so in, in a way that protects the state's position and, and uh, is done on a competitive basis. But we'd be happy to work with the treasurer's office and you on, on that. I'd, I'd like to hear more from them about what they have done in terms of promoting it uh, and what outreach they may have done. Uh, in they haven't. They haven't, Mr. Secretary. Okay. That's the purpose of the bill, among other things. Well, I'd be open to working on that issue with you and the treasurer's office for sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. So Representative Doucette followed by Representative Meskers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Jeff. Good to see you. Um, one more question. Oh, I don't know if it'll be the last, but one more question about the ARPA uh, uh, funds and the uh, Treasury guidelines. Um, what do the Treasury guidelines specifically say are the consequences of running afoul of one of these rules? Would there be um, uh, funds withheld? Um, and is there any precedent uh, for that happening? <clears throat> Not that I'm suggesting we would be uh, want to be the uh, first test case for that. Um, and I guess the second sort of related question is, as I look through um, your testimony, and you, you've made it, I think, as clear as uh, it can be as, as far as the treasury guidance, which I, I did uh, attempt to look at uh, previously and, uh, you know, it's hundreds of, of pages. Um, it, it, you know, is there any um, interpretation, is there any precedent out there for um, sort of an evolving interpretation of say the organic growth rule and how that's calculated um, by the states? I'm going to defer to Tom on the organic uh, uh growth rule uh, and where we think we might be in, uh, on that. I don't think we're going to get there in terms of letting that be uh, our, our, uh, our guidance here. Um, it is a question of repayment. Um, after the fiscal year has concluded, the, the federal government will make this determination as to whether or not you've broken the rules. And it would be a repayment of, and we believe it's the amount to uh, the extent to which you are over the, the limit. It's, it would be that delta that we would have to pay back to the federal government. Um, so uh, I believe that's our current interpretation, but as to organic growth, Tom, where are we? With has anyone, I'm sorry. Has anyone, has anyone had to do that? Has any state uh, had to do that at this point? I know. Not, the, not that we know of. Yeah. And, and Jeff, I would just add, yeah, it's too early in the process. You know, these are all going to take place at the end of the a fiscal year, these calculations technically, and the federal government has a process. If you look at the 400, 50 some pages, uh, there's a part about recoupment and they ultimately, I hate to say it, will bill us. Um, and we have 60 days to protest. Um, and then there's a process, they come back to us after another 60 days. Um, so there could be uh, upwards of, I think, uh, more than a half a year if we're going through this protest period. Hopefully we won't be in that position. Um, but so no states have really gone through that yet. So there is no uh, precedent yet. Okay. And, and how about the question of the calculation of organic growth or uh, any of the other uh, guidelines? 
in, in regards to organic growth, um, we are not there yet. We don't have sufficient organic growth to make that to be the test. Uh, there will be an April 30 consensus forecast coming up. We are hopeful um, that revenues, we suspect they will be going higher. Um, and we will do a, a recalculation along OFA and OPM together. We'll work on that calculation and see if we have you know, crossed that threshold to, into organic growth. Okay. Great. Look forward to that. That that gives us uh, about seventy two hours to <laughs> unfortunately adjournment. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Mesker is followed by Representative Ziogas. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, our current projections are a ninety million dollar deficit two years from now, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Tom, what do we think? Two years from now, balance? Uh, I thought it was higher than that, to be honest with you, in fiscal year 24. Um, so I'm not sure where the 90 million is coming from. Coming from my head, I might be wrong. Oh, okay. No, I think it's I think it's higher than that because we are going to be mm -hmm. losing a lot of the federal ARPA dollars that are, we're assuming in this budget, 944 million um, approximately. So that's gonna fall off. And we also are gonna be fully funding the MRSA account. So that's another 270 million. So those are gonna be significant headwinds in fiscal year 24. Okay. So our projections in 24 are inclusive of uh, incremental uh, funding into the rainy day fund, the surplus going into pay down uh, debt. So incremental spending this year, what what would that do to your projections for 24? Because 24 becomes the boogeyman, if you will, in the closet is when we end up with, with deficit issues. So it would be helpful as, as we're looking going forward on incremental spending in the budget, which could potentially reduce both the rainy day fund and or the surplus that goes down to pay down pension obligation. It would be good to know what impact that would have on the debt. For that year we can try to get you some information on that but that's a there's a lot of moving parts in your question uh you're talking about a target a couple of years out uh we would have to know what current services are going to be we're going to know what the spending cap is that year uh to get to a balance well, using your using your current projection if we're in the estimates of, of a balance and surplus to pay down unfunded liabilities Incremental spending is going to give us is going to you know every hundred million dollars reduction in the debt pay down is going to give us what a ten million increase in the deficit etc. Because you know whatever funds you're if you're prepaying debt, I, I just want to know get the fiscal estimated fiscal impact of altering the surpluses, the rainy day fund and 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 the pay down of our of our our debt. You're running a projection now. It, it, it's more simple. I don't, there aren't a lot of moving parts. If I'm going to increase the expenditures from the state side, I want to have an indication of what that's going to do to my deficit. Everything else being equal. I think I understand that. Uh, you, you, what is the impact on the out years of our spending this year? In other words, this we're year, increasing. We're increasing, increasing spending by a certain amount this year. What will be the impact of that in the out years? Of, of the decisions we make on this on this committee, when we when we write policy, what is that going to do versus the governor's budget? What does it do to our ability to service the debt in twenty four? What what's our what's our deficit going to look like in twenty four? I fully expect next week when we get the full package from this committee and the other committee, we will be doing that analysis and and we'll make that. We won't be we won't hide our <laughs> our opinion of that. I'm sure. Okay, I mean I need that to make a decent decision on what we want to do. This a lot of real needs in the state, and we have to figure out which ones are sustainable under the current environment. And is it a speed bump in 24 to begin to build a, a gap in unfunded liability going forward? Tom, do you have a perspective on that? We can. I, I, the only thing I would add is, you know, uh, when the governor's budget came out, we do produce a three-year out-year report. And, you know, the Office of Policy and Management is currently projecting a gap right now in the general fund of about a billion four in FY24. So it's a little more than a speed bump. Um, historically, we have mm -hmm. had, <laughs> I don't mean, uh, historically, we have had out year projections of deficits. This is an improvement compared to those previous out year reports, but it is still a significant amount of money that we will have to address in FY24. 
So I was off by a factor of ten. Not very, not 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 a pretty number, but thanks. No, but with the next consensus forecast, maybe that will improve. So that's why April 30 is so important. And unfortunately, yes, it, it's a tr tight turnaround time between the conclusion of the session and the fiscal, uh, the um, consensus forecast. Okay, thank you. All right, Representative Ziogas, followed by Representative Mishinsky. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Mr. Beckham, I just wanted to talk to you quick about the uh, the uh, car tax relief program that the governor's promoting. Um, and it ties into the previous conversations. What happens in the out years when uh, money gets tight and the relief that the cities are expecting from the state is the first uh, low hanging fruit uh, that gets cut? And that's a concern I've heard from my assessor. Rep and Representative, just, to, just before you enter that, Mr. Secretary, um, I, I just wanna make sure I'm policing this in good faith as we always do. We have to keep the, the comments today and the questions today to bills that are before us. And technically, Representative, that bill is not before us. It's part of the appropriations package. Um, if the secretary can give you a quick answer, maybe you guys can follow up offline, that'd be great. But um, wanna make sure we keep it germane to what we're talking about today. Well, I thought that com the, the tax was mentioned in the earlier conversation. So that's why I brought it up. It, it is. I would draw, draw the question. You, you understand. That's fine. Thank you. I can respond. Yeah, Mr. Secretary, if you, if you just give Representative a, a response, I, I think this has confused some of our members. I've gotten some questions about it. There's, there's confusion as to why that bill is before appropriations and not us because it deals with the tax. Um, but in fairness to Representative Ziogas, it is a good question. If you can give him an answer, that'd be great, Mr. Secretary. I would say to the concern about the uh, support for the towns uh, evaporating in uh, tough, tough fiscal years in the future, uh, that's true of uh, an awful lot of things that we provide to the towns. Mm -hmm. There are multiple grants that we give to the towns that have in prior years been reduced or prorated or uh, we can't. And I say we, I mean the General Assembly as well. The administration of the General Assembly in tough budget years have to make uh, exigent decisions and sometimes uh, existing programs like grants to municipalities get impacted that that's just historically true um, so uh, but that's something you could say about literally anything that we do so I don't know why it's unique to the car uh, uh, grant program no I understand what could happen there and I know that all those grants are fungible back to the cities um, it just makes it a little difficult for the assessors and the ongoing out years when there is that issue coming up as to, you know, they separate this car tax from all the other issues that are confronted. Uh, so that's what, that was my, my only concern with the car tax issue. Uh, thank you. That's I'm good. Thank you. Thanks representative representative Mishinsky. Okay, I think I unmuted. Um, first, I wanted to congratulate you, Jeff, on your on your rise up through state service to be OPM chief. That is really an accomplishment, and uh, it's it's great to see you. You worked in the finance committee for a while. It's great to see you at the top position in the executive it, branch. It, it went by so fast, Madam Chairman. Um. <laughs> okay, now I have a now I have a. Uh, a technical question. If we reduce the payment towards the pension liability, which would take place in this bill, um, how will this affect the percent of the budget that we dedicate to debt service? Because I'm worried about if we give a generous EITC this year, how will that be affected when uh, we have a less generous year and we have not reduced our pension liability? I'm not sure I'm following that. Um, okay, we, we have a couple of choices. We can keep pension, we could keep paying every year toward our pension liability reduction. Okay. And that will reduce our debt service. Yes. Uh, but if we don't do that, if we skip, if we skip a, a payment, um, what does that do with uh, our EITC tax credit for to help people, uh, children get out of poverty in a, uh, in a shortfall year? in a short year when we don't have the generous federal money? Um, well, I'm not sure the two are linked. Uh, you can make choices on the earned income tax credit policy that uh, 
well, that's that's a that's a decision to spend money on that in a year. So it would it competes. We have chosen over the last several years to fully fund the ADEC, the actuary determined con contribution to the pension fund. We could back in the past, in the bad old days, they shorted that. They did not pay all of that. And that's part of why we have a larger unfunded liability than we perhaps should. Those are you you're correct, those are competing uh, things that we spend money on every year. But I'm not sure they're linked in any particular way. Um, there are pressures to um, uh, spend money on both of those. Um, we've this governor and the last governor committed to fully funding the ADEC, the uh, the pension fund contribution, and uh, both governors have uh, increased what we spend on the earned income tax credit, which is, as you know, an appropriation. It's refunded to the taxpayers. Uh, we have had a commitment to both, um, and I wouldn't see them as an either or. I think they're both things that we should do. Okay, but but debt service uh, as a percent of the budget will continue to go down if we continue making these payments on a regular basis, correct? So, well, there are a lot we... of things. Yep, there are a lot of things that affect debt service. Interest rates affect them um, as well. Um, but yes, we to the extent that we can reduce the principal on that unfunded liability, that it would have a lower, uh, generally speaking, a lower uh, debt service cost. Okay, I, I don't want to get in a situation. Much, much as I love EITC, I don't want to get in a situation where we uh, commit to that to a certain percentage, and then we find out the debt service did not go down, and so now we have to divert money to the debt service, which would be nice to be spending on children in poverty. So I'm trying to avoid. Um, this is a tightrope walk. I'm trying to avoid making one problem worse so that we can continue our benefits into the future and people don't uh, see a sudden change in the, in the tax credit. I think I agree to the extent that I understand what you just said. <laughs> okay, all right, <laughs> thank you. OFA will help us with this one. <clears throat> Thanks Representative. And thank you, Mr. Secretary, again, for being with us today uh, and your team. We appreciate the, uh, the testimony and time and we'll look forward to continued conversations with you and the administration as we uh, begin work on coming up with the package and going forward at the session. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bree, who do we have next? Next, we have another panel of testifiers, John Chaponis and Jennifer Lina Weaver. Good morning. Uh, my name, good morning, my members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding. My name is John Chaponis, and I'm representing CWO and wish to thank your committee for raising Senate Bill 478. We have submitted testimony, but I'm going to summarize. The tax appeal system in Connecticut is one-sided and skewed in the favor of the plaintiff. We, we first began talking about this issue about 10 years ago, and a large story ran in Connecticut Magazine in 2014, highlighting some of these issues. <clears throat> that story is actually attached to the testimony we submitted. The first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is that the entire tax appeal process is paid for with public funds, taxpayer dollars. From the judge's salary, the court clerk, stenographer, assessor, town attorney, they're all paid for by the little guy, the taxpayer. With 99% of these lawsuits settling, resulting in a refund, the, the taxpayer also pays for all of the refunds. And altogether, we're talking about millions of dollars per year. The problem is that the courts are being flooded with frivolous appeals by tax rep companies that come from as far away as Massachusetts to Missouri and have been flooding the court system. Many times assessors are forced to agree to settlement reductions even when it's not warranted and no information has been offered proving otherwise. Some will say that the towns, is, towns are not forced to settle and can go to trial on frivolous appeals, but that's not truly a reality when you consider the sheer volume. After Hartford's 2016 revaluation, they got 1,800 appeals when there's only 261 working days in a year. It takes days, sometimes weeks to prepare for a trial and many trials last more than a day. It took more than three years for Hartford to dispose of all those cases, and that was with settling 99% of them. Hartford refunded 9.3 million in taxes in just the first year alone. Bear in mind that that was only one third of their settlements and the 9.3 million came off of the next four years as well until the next revaluation. Besides the millions leaving in refunds, no one can put a fiscal note on the time and energy assessors must put into frivolous appeals where assessors could have been using that time to discover untaxed property or Connecticut residents running Maine and Florida plates on their cars. 
We, all we're asking for is a fair and level playing field. Other states already require the plaintiff to have an appraisal and proof of overvaluation before suing the town. The town has already expended significant time and in expense in researching and valuing every property in town, and that also was at the taxpayer's expense. The assessor might not always be perfect, but it also stands the reason that we're not 100% wrong 100% of the time. Yet we're pressured to settle cases when tax rep firms show up at pre-trial conferences with absolutely no proof in their handout. The reason seconds, out of, please summarize. Thank you. The reason out of state firms are targeting Connecticut is because our laws are lax on what the plaintiff must bring to the table in a tax appeal. In New Jersey, if the assessor is less than 10% over the fair market value, they do not reduce the assessment. This is due to the understanding that ad valorem taxation values have a 10% quarter of error and in order to avoid frivolous appeals when the discrepancy is minimal. Um, you know, I'll stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Representative Boer. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Scanlon. Uh, thank you, John, for coming and testifying. I just want to make sure I understand. Are you saying they sh the plaintiffs should have an appraisal when they come before their board of tax appeal, tax assess appeal uh, board members or when they're suing? You said when they're suing. Uh, yes, well, what we were asking for is that they have an appraisal. Actually, we're giving them 90 days after the time they filed an appeal in Superior Court. You know, what's happening is these firms come to, to a town right after a reval and they FOI every increase notice that you sent out. Then they send out a letter saying they'll file tax appeals for free and they keep 50% of the savings for the next five years. At that point, when they're sending those letters out, there's been no investigation into whether or not the property is overvalued and they're working on you know, share volume. And if you have a property owner that signs on with them and he has 10 properties in town, he appeals uh, all 10. Um, you know, 50% of the savings is significant too. And I don't think that benefits, you know, the, the, the property owner. If, if Hartford has a $20 million building under appeal and they give a 5% reduction, the tax rep firm receives $175,000 over that five-year period. And I don't think it's unreasonable to request them to come in with an appraisal at, at the time of the pretrial conference to actually prove that the property has been overvalued. Well, I understand the intent is to try to, you know, uh, uh, decrease the amount of poachers out there, right, that are taking advantage. But I just want to make sure Mrs. Jones on Smith Street, who is appealing her um, new value of her home, isn't required to have an appraisal when she goes to, you know, once a year you go before the Board of Tax um, Appeals and, you know, wants to fight that increase in that value. You're, are you suggesting that, that individuals who come before their boards have an appraisal in hand? Uh, not at all. Um, we're, we, that statute, that's a different statute. And okay. we're only talking about when they go to Superior Court, which I would honestly say is probably less than 1% of the properties that go to Superior Court are residential. Okay, great. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you both for your testimony today. Thank you very much. The next testifier is John Elliser. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to comment on Senate Bill 12, the Governor Lamont's proposed adjustments to the state bond authorizations. My name is John Elsesser, and I have been serving as Coventry's town manager for 34 years and 41 years of municipal service in Connecticut. I'm joined by Lisa Thomas, town council chair, and she has submitted her own testimony on this issue. In addition to the provisions authorizing funding for the required state match under the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Town of Coventry agrees with costs testimony provide, calling for the provision to reinvigorate the state's bonded uh, Small Town Economic Assistance Program, or STEEP. STEEP was established in 2001 to assist the state's smaller communities in launching economic and community development projects. It is modeled after the Urban Act, which was created in 1979, and provides millions of dollars in grants to the state cities. The projects often support state goals and facilities. The state also often establishes themes or, or priorities for the grants, such as emergency preparedness. Up, in 2000, up until 2016, STEEP was a successful program that helped fund many projects throughout Connecticut, 
Unfortunately, the program languished for four years and towns were left with wondering whether grants would be awarded or not. In 2020, OPM announced the steep grants would, would be awarded, but grants were capped at uh, $128,000 and municipalities were required to provide matching funds. This amount, given the cost of construction, is woefully inadequate to fund critical local economic and community development projects. In comparison, the Urban Act's grants are not capped or subject to local match requirements. To address these concerns, I support recommendations included in Senator Austin's proposed bill, Senate Bill 144, to ensure that towns are eligible to receive up to 500,000 and to increase that amount over the next five years to up to a million. This modification will ensure that STEEP can once again support some game-changing projects that will really make a difference in our communities. For example, Coventry has been exploring constructing a water tower project to increase line pressure to assist in fire suppression for both residential and industrial areas. We are threatened to lose a, a manufacturing plant that's been here since the 1800s because they can't get fire insurance. Uh, it has been served by a pond and they have to buy fire insurance through Lloyd's of London. This project requires more state assistance than was available this last past year. In addition, we believe the match requirement should be eliminated since it's not in the law because municipal funding is often not available to provide the match given other fiscal demands. Strengthening the street steep program in this manner will assist the state's smaller communities in reinvigorating local economies that have been impacted by the ongoing pandemic. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this important issue. We support steep and hope that it's amended slightly. I'm glad to answer questions. Representative Nuccio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi, John, how are you doing? It's nice to see you. Good to see you, Representative. So um, you brought up something that I think is really interesting. Um, this is a grant that is capped for the smaller municipalities um, and has no cap for the cities. And um, recognizing that us small towns out here struggle with trying to develop. And if we're um, constantly being yelled at that, uh, you know, we're not diverse enough, we don't provide enough stuff, we, have, we don't do this and we don't do that. Steep Grant is a great way to kind of help these communities do more things. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how Steep has assisted the co town of Coventry and the small towns out in the Northeast corner of, uh, of Connecticut and what, when that went away, how bad it hurt, and then maybe elaborate a little bit more on the, um, the matching piece and what that does to the local tax system and how that makes affordability out in these towns even worse. Glad to uh, give a couple examples of projects that we've done because some of them actually are uh, supporting state initiatives. Uh, we did a project uh, down in our village area, which actually extended a state DOT project uh, by providing sidewalks, lighting, crosswalks uh, uh, to go from the state project to our library. So it's, it's actually a project that's on Connecticut Route 31, uh, but it invigorated our village area and, and made it safer for people walking. Uh, we also did a project uh, a couple of years ago uh, to replace our lake gate uh, structure, which is uh, a dam uh, legally. Uh, and I just point out that the lake is uh, actually a state lake, yet we're responsible for the, the dam maintenance. Uh, uh, no pun intended. No pun intended, uh, right? <laughs> um, so uh, that was a very successful, again, supporting uh, the state boat launch, the fishing, uh, and other lake activities. So uh, we do need to, you know, look at broader issues. We also, uh, due to state and federal mandates uh, have things that come up. Uh, we use some steep money to, to help uh, close our landfill uh, in 1994. And while we're closing it, the steep money allowed us to put a athletic field on top of that. And most recently, uh, we, our last award was to actually do some methane venting uh, to deal with uh, uh, some of the landfill gases uh, that were killing some of the grass. And uh, that is, I'm signing the contract for that tomorrow. Um, and um, because of the cap, uh, we only got the $128,000, we're having to put in $70,000 uh, on, on top of that uh, to make that project work. And, and that is basically taking away from other municipal needs. Uh, we, we have a long list um, of, of things and, and that ultimately relates to proposed 
property tax increases or, or deferred maintenance, which is just as evil. Right. Um, so you, you mentioned the usage and having to kind of buttress that to the to the state requirements and that. And from an accessibility perspective, I know um, in Tolland uh, alone, I know we've looked at trying to get steep funding to increase accessibility for ADA stuff, um, for all kinds of things, uh, to increase storage, to, to store um, safety stuff for the fire department and that. And these are all programs, again, that are, are really needed in our towns and such. So if we were to increase that limit up to the half a million and either reduce or remove the matching amount, you think that your town would be able to, to do more things that would make your community uh, more vibrant, more accessible, and um, more at a less, less dollar impact to your local property taxes? Yes, it's very important to us. I hear you. It's very important to, I think, all of us small towns out there. So I thank you very much for your um, for your questions, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, John, uh, has your town ever received Urban Act funding? Uh, we're not eligible for Urban Act. Um, and, and that's going back to when the steep was uh, developed. It was a smaller version of the Urban Act. Uh, I think there's only about 30 towns in the state that are eligible for Urban Act. Um, so STEEP gives towns a opportunity on an occasional basis to come in with a, a significant project that otherwise be funded by uh, local property ta taxes. Why, why do you say your town is not eligible for Urban Act? Uh, it's a population-based uh, and under the formula. Uh, Urban Act are really only for the urban communities. Uh, okay. And at, at yeah. some point uh, when STEEP was developed, there were some towns that were actually left out of either. And they had to make a one-time choice of which which uh, uh, grant that they would try to compete for. That rule was a, was um, abandoned essentially under the Malloy administration. You're right. Initially, it was Urban Act was was for specific, particularly urban communities, and and uh, that's for the reason for steep. But that rule was was in, there's plenty of evidence of it in in terms of. Uh, of bond commission meetings of, of towns of all shapes and sizes getting Urban Act funding. Um, so I think you ought to uh, look into that from your town's well, perspective. We, we would, uh, I certainly will look into it, but I believe uh, instead those are more just straight bonding and not under the Urban Act. So it may have the same net effect, but we'd be glad to look into that. Great. Representative Bohr. Thank you, Senator Fonfair. I, I was just going to echo um, what you already had just stated that our um, bonding commission agendas do have a number of small towns that are um, having projects, important projects that are critical to their towns being funded through the Urban Act grant. I think years ago to Senator Fonfair's um, point, it was separated urban versus steep. But over the years, um, many of the projects under Urban Act have been small towns. And there's a number that are listed on our bond uh, commission agenda tomorrow that are small towns, small populations that are getting funding. I, I, I've seen that, that list and I'm aware of it. The, the difference is, is that the state OPM um, reviews the competitive grants from, from the towns and the Urban Act are much more directly through uh, your elected uh, senators and representatives directly to the governor's office. So the state actually has a quality control issue of comparing all the different towns steep applications. So it's a slightly different process. It may end up at the uh, same net result, uh, but uh, steep was somewhat created to stop those special projects and having a qualitative review process. I think, um... I can't speak for the past, but I can say that the process as it stands today, those projects are flushed out um, and they are reviewed individually with those representatives. You're right, um, you know, in the past, it was a competitive process, but I think legislators advocating for their towns, um, the smaller towns have really helped to um, drive some of those projects. And I think there's, there's a much better process in place today. Thank you, Representative Bohr. And I'll just add to that, that, um, that there are many projects that uh, small towns are recipients of that 
don't come from legislators that the governor uh, initiates because of advocacy by uh, town officials, um, aside from the representatives from the legislators from those areas. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Bree. The next testifier is Laura Francis. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and distinguished uh, members of the Finance, Revenue and Bonding Committee. My name is Laura Francis. I am the first selectman of the town of Durham and also the president of COST, the Connecticut Council of Small Towns. And we appreciate the opportunity to comment on SB 12, Governor Lamont's proposed adjusted bond package. I have submitted uh, written testimony, so I will use this time to summarize. I echo a lot of my colleague John Elsesser's comments about the STEEP program, um, but I do want to tell you the effects of the project cap um, on projects, specifically the one in Durham as an example. Um, we applied to uh, improve a dirt road to um, accommodate the first development that the town of Durham has had in over 10 years. And because of that cap, we had to um, drastically reduce the scope of that project. And we still haven't even begun yet because we still have to find extra funding um, for that project. So if that cap didn't um, it, it exist, and this is an example, and this is happening around the state, um, the $500,000 would have uh, fixed that road for us uh, without a problem. The other issue we wanna talk about is the municipal match requirement. Um, there were some inconsistencies um, in, in the beginning of the program that needed clarifications as it, was, um, as it was put into effect. The state and federal funds, the guidelines indicate that the match funds had to be municipal funds, but so many of these uh, municipal projects are layered with uh, federal funding and um, we were precluded from using any of those grant funds from acting as the match. We were also precluded in using private sector funds. Um, I think you might agree that it is important for municipalities to seek out um, private par public partnerships for some of these major improvements in our towns. And the match percentage was not really clarified. Although in practice, it was um, required to match with 50% and those monies had to already been budgeted. So we appreciate that the governor um, and the administration wanted to make sure that the money you know, got into the circulation, into the economy pretty quickly, um, but it precluded um, municipalities for using this money to develop really good projects and had to rely on already budgeted and um, shovel-ready uh, jobs. The award um, were delayed, and this was um, problematic because many towns lost a, a whole construction season because of that. Um, and then there was finally, there was a prohibition on banking awards. Back in the day, municipalities were able to use several cycles of steep grant funding to do major um, uh, projects. For instance, the town of Durham over three years of steep awards was able to um, replace a major culvert that was over $800,000. Now in a small town, um, that kind of project could be over a mill tax increase. So these steep grants directly impact um, property taxes and alleviate um, municipalities from having to increase direct property taxes. So it is, it is a very impactful um, program and we um, urge you to consider amending the bill to accommodate this. We also like to say that um, we support the provisions in the bill which extend the deadline for the police body camera grant program by one year. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Seeing no questions, Bree. 
The next testifier we have is Wanda Vargas. Uh, Senator Fanfara, uh, Representative Scanlon, Honorable Ranking Members, and this one, Distinguished Members of the Finance Revenue and Bonding Committee. My name is Wanda Vargas and I live in Hartford. I have a son and a daughter who attend Anna Grace Academy of the Arts in Bloomfield, which is a Craig Magnet School. Thank you for raising SB 485 to support Craig in implementing capital improvements for our schools. I'm asking you to please support this much needed funding and planning mechanism for Craig. My children benefit greatly because they attend a Craig Magnet School. As a Hartford resident, I wanted my children to attend a school that would challenge them academically while also incorporating things they love, the arts. As a parent, I want nothing but the best for my children. I graduated from Hartford Public Schools and I wanted something better for my children. I am proud to have graduated a Buckley Bulldog, but while I was attending, I played for the girls basketball team. And when we traveled to other schools and saw how nice their facilities were, I always wondered why Hartford schools didn't look like that. Our children are entitled to have quality education as well as up-to-date facilities. It's not fair that other districts can rely on their town. Some of our correct schools have been going strong for more than 20 years, providing quality education to children across Hartford County, and they should continue to do so. The state made a commitment to these schools through, Sheriff, oh, through Chef versus O'Neill. Our kids' education should not suffer because the state is not fulfilling its commitment to maintain these critical schools that support integration and build students to successfully live in a global community. Currently, five of the 18 Creck operated magnet schools are over 20 years old and five of them need repairs as soon as next year. We need you to support SB 485, which provides the much needed funding for capital improvements for these aging schools. Please support SB 485 and create this important mechanism to cover Creck Crex Capital Improvements. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vargas. And I'll say I appreciate your testimony. I also appreciate being with another, a fellow Bulldog. Thank uh, you. Being a graduate of Oakley High myself. Yeah, thank you, it's great. Thank you. Seeing no questions, Bree. The next testifier is Michelle Cunningham. Good morning, Mr. Hi. Chairman and distinguished members. <laughs> there we are. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members. My name is Michelle Doucette Cunningham. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate Bill 487. We are in a rare economic position right now. The state's rainy day fund is full and we're likely to realize additional surpluses this year. This presents us with a once in a generation opportunity to invest a portion of state revenue in a way that will pay dividends for many years to come. I've worked on behalf of kids in the state for 30 years, and all this time we have struggled to address the real problem. Instead, we address the symptoms instead of preventing the problems before they even start. Even when we know that it costs less on an annual basis to prevent problems, to pay for childcare and home visiting up front instead of ju juvenile detention, but to do so to invest in this way would require us for a few years to pay both to address the current symptoms and to invest to prevent them in the future. And we've never had the resources until now. This investment is the smartest financial step the state can take in spurring the Connecticut economy and building prosperity for all of us. The economics are straightforward. You can return the surplus to the taxpayers or you can invest it on behalf of all Connecticut residents in a way that only the state can so that it returns more than eightfold what you invest. No individual can make investments of this sort. It requires leadership and collective action by all of you in the General Assembly. Investing in toddler, infant and toddler care, child care, allows more parents to return to the workforce, increasing their taxable earnings. It provides an increased pool of employees who can work with fewer distractions for the employers in Connecticut, and it directly creates jobs for child care providers. It increases the likelihood that these children will succeed in life, needing fewer expensive supports and making them more likely to have higher taxable income in the future, so that in time, this pays for itself many times over. You've already heard this morning about how helping children is the right thing to do. 
but this investment is also the smart thing to do. I'd like to make a special plea for you to hold tight to this specific course of action, as there will be no doubt forces at work to dilute this funding and spread it more thinly so that you can make more constituent groups happy. But this type of initiative is the type that requires full funding if it's to be successful. A partial investment will not work. Please do not scale this back thinking you can either target the funding more carefully or reduce its scope and still be successful. Instead, please be bold and do it right the first time. Today, you have the opportunity to create a new vehicle that invests in the future in a way that will leave a legacy for the state of Connecticut with positive societal and economic effects for many decades to come. The Infant and Toddler Early Care and Family Support Initiative is the best possible investment the state can make for both our future citizens, our future workforce, and the future economy. I urge you to fully support this legislation and to convince your colleagues that it is the smartest way to invest these funds. Thank you, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I'll just say it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's often lost on legislators and the public that while we haven't funded this program um, almost at all, we do seem to find the money to invest in people after the fact that we, where we failed here. So it's not a free lunch uh, by any means, um, but uh, hopefully we can get that uh, across the finish line as we move forward in, in this committee and beyond. Thank you so much for your testimony. I see no hands, Bree. The next testifier is Eva Bermuda Zimmerman. Thank you, Brie. Um, I would add, uh, Brie, we have Queen Freelove that was before me. She right now is feeding the children. She's an early educator. Um, if possible, she has to come back uh, an hour from now during nap time. <laughs> thank, thank you. So is that okay? Please have her rejoin when she's able. Okay. We'll get her. You're Thanks. awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator, Senator um, uh, Fanfar, Representative Scanlon, Senator Martin, Representative Cheeseman, and distinguished members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Eva Bermuda Zimmerman. And I'm here testifying support of SB 487. As director of the Child Care Union, uh, CSCA, and also co chair of Child Care for Connecticut's Future, I connect with hundreds of providers, of providers weekly. That is not a figure of speech. When I say hundreds, I truly mean hundreds of people. For over two years, a group of advocates and I have been meeting with early educators from centers, home-based and group home care, with experts from the industry visiting us as well as legislators to discuss how we can fix this crisis. The hundreds of people that join, join on um, now spanning over 2000 and in any given time, 700, um, are asking and not, not requesting, but are imploring that we do something now. CCFCT, the Child Care for Connecticut's Future, was born out of that, born out of necessity, necessity for providers and parents alike who desperately want their voices to be amplified. With the close to 2,000 participants on these Zooms, and we conduct them weekly and regularly, the apparent crisis is real. So if you have an opportunity as a legislator, um, maybe not when you're in hearings, to have these conversations with your centers, um, group home daycares, childcare uh, homes, or with parents in, in any location in the state, you can ask them how much do you pay for childcare? And they'll say a lot of money, some paying over $14,000 a year, some paying the equivalent of what it costs to put a child through Yukon. And they're desperately waiting for that day that they no longer have to pay for childcare, but also wanting the best quality childcare for their child. SB 47 is a step forward to fix this problem um, and solve it properly to fund the early education system. In the decade working at CSEA, working with uh, Care for Kids providers, it's clear that subsidies like Care for Kids and other school readiness programs are deeply underfunded. And rather than continue a, a system where we forget about these programs and forget about those providers who do not take state subsidies, that we do something comprehensive. Um, it's also clear that these programs officially leave people out, people who are not poor enough. The bill does not despite what some others might have said earlier, um, leave people out. This bill is about inclusivity. This bill is about a pragmatic way to continue to safe, safely um, measure our safety nets of, 
of uh, spending cap and revenue caps, that is not in jeopardy here. But it is a smart way to use surpluses and use it consistently on early ed. I implore you to pass this bill and to make sure that you keep it in its entirety. Connecticut is in a position to be the first state to solve our nationwide education crisis. The 50,000 infant toddlers currently not accessing structured care and the 5,000 job openings. We are all screaming workforce development, but we're forgetting comprehensive childcare. So please pass SB 487. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ramita Zimmerman and Representative Bobby Sanchez, chair of the Education Committee, um, has his hand up and a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, Eva, thank you so much. I know you've been a staunch advocate on uh, early child care, and um, uh, I was glad to and barely amazed um, when we had our press conference a week ago that you and CBI <laughs> together um, because we know this is a crisis that we need to deal with and we need to do something about now. We can't wait any longer. So my question to you is, um, did this crisis come on because of the pandemic or did we have issues before the pandemic? We had issues before the pandemic. So the number that's been floated around by journalists and others studying the early ed um, system is 30% of childcare has closed. That reality hasn't been clarified. That 30% has been consistent, be, consistently been closing every single year, even during the pandemic. During the pandemic, it just exacerbated that number. So if you're talking to any early educator um, who's trying to hold on, these are educators who have CDAs, bachelor's degrees, master's degree. They're very well versed in what it means to educate a child. They're probably getting a job, you know, and this is not one or two, three three people, hundreds of people getting a job at Amazon, making $2 more, despite the educational credentials they have in early education. So that 30% of closure, that 30% of the early ed workforce leaving has been consistent prior to the pandemic. So we continue to have issues with recruiting qualified staff and also retaining them because they're leaving. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank, thank you for sharing with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Representative Farrar. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks, Eva, for being here. And I know um, I'm jumping in, um, like many of us from other meetings, so apologize if this was asked of prior participants. Um, but I appreciate your testimony. And I think the essence to me about this bill kind of is that early investment. I was wondering if you could speak to, when we think about kind of the zero to three age range, um, you know, kind of illuminate for us, you know, why that type of investment does pay off longer term. I think we, we kind of lose sight of why that zero to three is so critical and focus often on once folks are in school. And I know for us, when we're thinking about um, just kind of prioritization and where our investments can pay off, if you could speak to why that zero to three is so critical. So um, before I answer, I do want to thank all of you uh, who do work um, on recidivism, criminal justice reform, also uh, higher ed, and preface it with going back to your question that all of those um, key legislations that we work on when it comes to uh, avoiding someone uh, being tossed into the, the, the criminal justice system, right, do start from the age of zero. There are studies, and I know Walter Gilliam here was on earlier, there are studies that have shown for the last decades, not recent studies, they've been continuous studies for, for more than 40 years that show when you invest early from the age of zero and beyond, it is more likely for that child to not go to jail, to not go to prison, more likely for that child to graduate high school and go to college, more likely for that child uh, to then be a productive member of society and have a livable job and also more likely to not have problems with heart disease, diabetes, and a slew of different medical issues that an adult may have, all from investing early. So if you're trying to figure out um, how we can save money in the long term as a state, then you can do that by supporting early education. Why? If we do not spend gobs and gobs of money uh, down the line, right? 
I'm sorry about that, my video. Uh, if we don't spend gobs of money down the line or don't need to spend gobs of money down the line because we're investing early, then it puts us in better footing. I know that it's a little um, difficult to, to see that, that future be told because we're talking about at least uh, a decade or two decades from the child being in infant toddler care all the way to graduating college. But this, the, again, these studies have been already performed. So we have certainty in our numbers that if you use that money wisely now, we'll be seeing impact and savings later on. Thank you, Eva, for illuminating that. And I appreciate your comments as well to Representative Sanchez, because it, I think um, us, we all recognize that the system is failing us. It's failing our families. It's failing our economic growth. And I appreciate you really highlighting um, how this investment can pay off um, for all of us. So thank you to you, Ava, um, and Chairman, for the time. Thank you, Representative Farrar. Seeing no other questions. Thank you, Eva. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you for your time. And the photo behind us are the providers who went on and did a rally uh, supporting changes. So they couldn't be here, uh, but they are here in spirit. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. Bree. The next testifier is Senator Douglas McCrory. All right. Good morning. Good morning, Bree. Good morning, Chair, Chairman. And good morning, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, my name is Douglas McCory. I represent Harford, Bloomfield, Windsor, but I'm here as the chair of the Education Committee. I'm coming to this committee for a specific reason. I need your help. As a 30 year educator in Harford, in the Harford region, I find myself over and over again looking at the same problem every single year. The problem we have in our state is the opportunity gap problem. And that opportunity gap doesn't start when kids come to kindergarten. The opportunity gap starts from the time a child is born in this state. And what I'm asking you to help me do something revolutionary that we have never done in the state of Connecticut, that we has always talked about doing, but never executed. And what I'm asking you to do is like other presenters before me, to invest in our children at an early age. You have heard so many times how much, how many dollars we spend after the fact, after a child is behind academically, after a child becomes involved in the criminal justice system, after a child or adult goes to hospitals. We need to eliminate this 30 year intergenerational trap that exists in our state. And the only way we can do that is to provide universal pre-K education from the time that child is born to the time that child leaves 12th grade. I'm asking you and imploring you to help me invest in our children and give all our children, especially those who are in marginalized community with access to opportunity doesn't exist often. Help me invest in them so I don't have to wait today in the third grade. I have over one, let me, let me explain to you how bad it is in the state because a lot of us don't really get it. For the last 20, 20 years, and specifically for the last 10 years, I have over 100 schools in this state that cannot academically educate children on how to read 85% of them cannot read on grade level by third grade. And it's been going on for the last 10 years in over 100 schools. How do we stop this bleeding? We stop this bleeding by, by providing them early access to education. We stop this bleeding by fixing a system that is broken. Where, the, like you heard, people are leaving the system with educational degrees and finding jobs at Walmart and Amazon. We have to invest in this system from the beginning or we will continue to waste money because the opposite of investing in this state when it comes to education and waste, we spend millions upon millions, a hundred of millions of dollars into a system that is broken that has been getting us the same results for the last 30 years. At what point do we say, hey, stop it? At what point do we say, hey, we got to invest early? 
so we don't have to pay later. So I'm, I'm supporting this piece of legislation because this year, and as the third year of the education chairman, it took this year hearing the concerns from this industry from the beginning to the end. It's been problematic. We know it's a problem. We have not faced it. If we don't do it now, we'll never do it. Resources are there. And how, how we maintain them, we maintain these resources by saving on the opposite end. When we don't have to invest in criminal justice, when we don't have to invest in remedial education, let's invest in early childhood education. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McCrory. And there are questions, but I'd like to ask you as chairman of the education committee, I don't know if you had the opportunity to hear from the Secretary of Office and Policy and Management earlier. When no, he, I did. Well, I'll, I'll share with you uh, a, a summary of his comments, which I think probably reflect those of a number of, um, of folks, including legislators on this committee um, and, um, and beyond this committee, that while this is a very laudable goal in investing in uh, infants and toddlers and early childhood education, the, the mechanism for funding that investment of repurposing the revenue cap uh, funds, which is right now moving closer to 2%, ultimately moving to the 2% of that revenue that um, we generate on an annual basis, um, that that uh, was not something he believes the governor will he believes the governor will have issues with that um, that mechanism. Can you, in your professional opinion, wearing your educator's hat in the many years you've been a teacher and administrator in in, in the education system in this state, um, in, in terms of repurposing these funds, which were established as a as I called it earlier an extra belts and suspenders uh, for intra-year shortfalls of revenue. In your professional opinion, is the use of these funds in repurposing them for early childhood education consistent with the effort of proper fiscal management? Meaning that, by, as you've indicated, investing early uh, addresses the need to invest later. Uh, in, in a child's life or an adult's life. You're on mute, Senator. Yes, absolutely. We're talking about investment. You know, the reality is I'm educated, but I also have a finance degree. I have a master's degree in finance, so I understand a little bit about investing, right? So currently right now, we are investing a couple of billion dollars in our ECS formula right now for K through 12. Um, and what we're looking for and that, and that is, it, I guess people could say that's an investment too, because that's public education K to 12. However, what are we getting for the, our return on investment? That's what we have to look at. And our return on investment of $2 billion a year isn't very, very good when our data shows that in, in, in alliance districts, only 20 to 25% of our children are graduating on grade level. So, so what I'm saying is we have no problem investing in what we currently have, the structure we have right now, and it's not returning good on our investment. If we invest early in early childhood, we will have a child that come into our classrooms in pre-K and, and kindergarten who are, who are ready to learn. See, the data shows that when a child graduates from high school, the opportunity for them to be successful is off the map. But what we're finding in a lot of our school districts that less than in 60% of our kids are graduating. So if we don't invest early in a child and a family at an early age, we're gonna lose that kid. And we lose those kids by ninth grade. So I don't think we're investing and getting the return on our investment that we're looking for right now. So if I would have a conversation with OPM, I, I would say, how do we redirect some of the good money that we're pouring into bad systems and take some of that new money and create a system that we know will be successful? Because all the data says that. So we need to reinvest what we're doing. That's how I'll respond to that. Thank you, Senator. 
Representative Butler. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Senator McCory, for all your years of service, not only as a Senator, but in the educational world that actually has been doing all you can to just uh, uh, make it just a better place to actually help our young people be the best they can be. I couldn't agree with your testimony more. Um, and I hear your passion, and I know that many people on this panel um, of um, finance members feel the same way. And um, I've heard for years, our house chair, um, Sanchez, actually advocate for the same things. And you know what? There's, there's, the result was uh, amounted to what has been lip service in terms of the great need because it hasn't been addressed. So my question to you, um, Senator McCory, um, and you touched about it in, in some of your um, testimony that you just shared with us, is there any other mechanism out there that is even close to addressing this issue the way um, this bill would? Um, that, that's a very good question. We have, a, there's a couple of bills out there that discuss this because everybody realized, like you said, I appreciate your comments, um, um, Representative Butler. Uh, the reality is this, if if we if I wish I could sit down with the OPM secretary and have a conversation with him about investing, there's only one way to do it. We have to put the funds up, right? And and I would I, I I can I probably can clearly show him I can articulate a pathway to success without using any more needed dollars. If I could tell him I don't need to put so many dollars in here, and I take these dollars and put them in early childhood, I will show you success in five years because I'll have more kids being able to read by grade level in third grade in five years. Matter of fact, it's the sad thing in education. We start assessing these kids after one year in school. It's not like kindergarten when we was going to school. We are assessing children by the time they're six and seven years old and already know what's going to be ahead of us in the future if we don't properly educate them. So I'm saying, Mr. Secretary of OPM, let's have a conversation. Let's look at the books. I could easily find a couple hundred million dollars to get this done. So if, 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 if there's not a belief that we can do this, I have a belief because I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm going to get next year. I know how many kids are going to fail. I know how many kids are going to drop out of school. I know how many kids by third grade that can't read on grade level. I know we could predict how many kids are going to go to be incarcerated. So if we want to stop that conversation, and have a conversation about, wow, look at what happened in the last five years because we invested in early childhood education. I'm willing to have that conversation all day, all night. Yes, and if, if I could follow up, I would just say that it's been pointing out the professionals who actually teach in this environment are actually migrating to other careers because uh, it's simply to have a bachelor's degree and master's degree and get uh, the kind of salaries they have is, is something that can't be sustained because they're going to just leave the, the, and go to other, pursue other careers. And we know that, we've seen that. Testimony has already been issued to that extent. But I also would like to say that uh, if we can't address this now with the revenues we have now, I don't believe is going to get addressed. So I would strongly urge everybody to support this now because uh, in past years, when our chairs, um, Senator McCory and um, Representative Sanchez has actually brought this to our attention and um, asked for our support, uh, one of the first things is juggling the finances to make it happen. Right now, there's not going to be any better opportunity to do it. So uh, thank you for your testimony, Senator, and I'll um, stay tuned for all the other comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Butler. Representative Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want a big shout out to my coach here on the Education Committee, Senator McCory, and um, his passion for education. Um, and he brought up some good points. Um, there is data out there, particularly if children get a good start, if they get infant toddler care, if they get preschool, and then they move into the um, regular school system, those kids do succeed. The majority of them are ready um, to learn once they walk into that kindergarten classroom. They know how to 
um, basic reading skills, um, math skills. I mean, it, it's it just, it's unbelievable. As a, as a former preschool teacher, um, I heard from many teachers in my local school system where they would say, my God, this child came right in. They had the social skills. They didn't cry. Um, they knew their numbers. They knew how to write their names. I mean, these are things that are so, so important. And I think people need to understand that. We need to start investing in our infant toddler system and our preschool system. And this will benefit many of our children, particularly it would help with the achievement gap. So I wanna, it, it, I don't have a question for you, um, Senator. I just wanted to um, say thank you so much um, for your passion for education and thank you for um, your testimony. And also wanna thank uh, Representative um, Larry Butler for his words. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, well, Bobby, I want to thank you for bringing this to my attention. I know you've been working on this for longer, but and and, and we've we've been giving it lip service. You ask for something, we get a little crumb, everything. But until this year, you were really enlightened me on an industry that is that is on is wits end, and not only that, an industry that is the foundation of education in this country, in this state. So I, I will argue this about being fiscal responsible and having resources. You know, I, I, I've i been clear about what my we just invested three hundred million dollars in the city of Harford. Right. For the chef settlement, three hundred million dollars. No one asked a question or a wink or a smile. And I'm going to tell you, I already know what the results are going to be, because we didn't if we didn't work, work on fixing early childhood education. I know what the results are going to be. They're already been they're the same ones for the last 30 years. So if we're going to talk about being fiscally responsible and investing properly, I would love to have a conversation with the, with the secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sanchez. Representative Nuccio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Mr. Hello, Senator McCrory. I don't think we've ever actually met. Hey, how you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Um, yes. I have a couple of questions. Not, not necessarily questions. You you brought up a couple of good points there, and I want to kind of even stretch it further because um, one of the things that I struggle with is how we handle education in the state of Connecticut today. It is mm -hmm. the state of Connecticut's constitutional obligation to provide a free and public education for every child in this state. Um, and yet we abdicate that duty every time to the towns and we have, diver we have um, disparity in how funding happens. We have disparity in the education that happens. Um, we have mandates that everybody has to cover that I have an echo somewhere that is very um, problematic, but overall you mentioned about 25% of children of color graduate on, on grade level um, for reading and stuff like that. And I actually was looking and the results aren't that much better for everybody else too. If you look at it, I think the highest, the highest is um, children that are of Asian descent. And that is even only in the 60%. So overall I challenge that the state of Connecticut sucks at educating our kids. <laughs> Like, this is terrible. Like, if this is the best that we can hope for is to have 60% of our children graduate on level, that's 40, that's, that's, that's terrible. A 60 on a test, you're a teacher. What's a 60 on a test, sir? It's, it, you're failing, right? <laughs> you're on mute, but I, I can see your face. I know you're failing. Um, so I would, I would be interested. I've, since I've been here, I have raised a bit of a ruckus where I could about the ECS funding, about um, how the state funds the schools, um, and and how we how we pass mandates that we don't have any understanding on how it works in the schools. I feel like we're just while I while I understand what everybody's trying to accomplish here, I think this is throwing good money at bad, right? We're, we're if we're not willing to look at the actual reimagining of how education is performed in the state of Connecticut, I feel like um, we're just putting band-aids on bullet wounds. So I would be very interested to see um, if we had the pie in the sky, the dreams that we could, how would we handle education in the state of Connecticut? How would we fund it? How does it become a priority? And how do we um, remove the, uh, the failing acceptance of maximum 60% of kids graduating being able to read at education at, at the levels they should be. So I'm off, Mike, and you bring up some very good points. I, I'm, I'm glad you're saying this, because in reality, we don't, as a state, we don't really want to dig deep into how, 
successful our schools are. We go to make, make our communities look bad, right? So we got these different forms of success. We got, mm, and we got a uh, provision, and then we got a goal. And, and when we talk in Connecticut, we never talk about goal, and that's academic level. We don't talk about that because, again, it makes our, if our community is not as good as the community next to us, that's problematic. So we go, we quietly say, as long as my child is doing a little better, as long as my child got a little enough education, get it to Central, get it to got maybe get it doesn't, then I'm fine. But you're not understanding that the whole system isn't working. And it's not even working for your child. So are we going to continue that? Or are we going to try to do something a little different? And I'm arguing, we need to do something a little different. Now we fully funding. There's a bill out there this year that fully fund ECS, right? Because we feel as though we, if if we fully fund ECS, then our outcomes will be different. But that's, that's not. Now if you don't fix your foundation, your foundation is your foundation. If your child can be on grade level in the first grade, pretty much the other grade on second, third, fourth, fifth grade, sixth, and seventh. But if they come in already deficient for no no reason of their own. It's not their fault, but we give them the support in place to get them where we need to. Um, then I think we'll be in a better place. I sound like they say I sound like I'm muted. I don't know, but I don't know. Let me try something different. Well, we can hear you. We can hear you. You're just kind of bubbly. <laughs> a little altered, but we understood you. So okay, I would actually. I would actually say you brought up a good point because I've seen the bill on fully funding it, um, ECS, and one thing that I raise my voice on all the time is. One of my towns is the highest losing ECS town in the state of Connecticut. My town of Tallinn loses $350,000 a year with that formula as put in. My, one of my towns has 44% of their children are on free and reduced lunch and they lose $60,000 a year. So I don't have faith in that formula. We did not look at how that formula is going to um, affect small towns. Um, in towns that are like really big geographically, but smaller population. And we don't look at the fact that when we take that $350,000 away from the town of Tallinn and we have MBR in place and where we can't reduce a budget once we put a dollar into a school budget, we're saying now I have to raise taxes to cover that, right? Which makes it even harder for people of limited means to live in my town. Because if you can't afford to pay taxes, you can't live there. So right. the, EC, the ECS funding is fueling the fact that we are keeping towns more segregated from an income level and everything else. Again, we have to reimagine how education is done. We have to look at how we're going to fund it. And we have to stop saying we're going to take from here to give to there. It's the state of Connecticut's responsibility to fund it, period. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100 percent. And also some accountabilities when we when, when we are funding it and when we are raising taxpayer dollars and we're not getting the results that we look at, we've been looking for, especially you have history over the last 10, 15 years. We need to look back and say, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? And how do we repurpose these dollars to get the results that we're really looking for? That's the conversation that we need to have about education. Well, sir, I am willing to sit down and have that conversation with you. I'm sure you are. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Lucio, and thank you, Senator McCrory, for your leadership on this issue and uh, look forward to working with you as we move forward. Absolutely. Bree. The next testifier is Angela Russell. Good morning, Senator Fonfora, Representative Scanlon, and members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Angela Russell. I reside in New Haven, and I am a parent, grandmother of a toddler, owner of a family home child care business, and a member of Circle Collab Network. Thank you for this space to share my testimony and support for SB 487. For several weeks, Early childhood educators across all settings have been fiercely advocating for a transformative investment of a dedicated funding stream into Connecticut's early care system in order to address the child care crisis in our state. Child care is more important than ever to families, not just for providing a safe space to leave their child as they work, but it is also the setting in which early childhood development unfolds for children under the age of three, offering the promise of a solid future by providing countless opportunities for all children to reach their full potential. When infants and toddlers are in non-parental care, 
they need to form a secure attachment to their caregiver in order to thrive. Young children can form these attachments when their parents can afford childcare and when their caregivers remain stable over time. Having continuity of care and learning experiences, preferably with one primary caregiver until the child is at least three years of age, is critical for their optimal development. For newborns, the first three years of life are crucial for health and overall well-being. And it's not just the health of the babies that matters, but their interactions with their caregivers. Babies need to be touched, held, spoken to, smiled at, and played with. And as they receive and respond to these interactions, neural connections are made in the brain. And when babies don't have these interactions or enough of them, they become at risk of their brains not developing as it should. It has brought me great joy to be able to impact the lives of children and families through my work over the past 20 years. And in the same vein, it has brought me great frustration. It has not been easy to witness the consistent struggles of all the wonderful providers who have been committed to this career, some five years, 10, 20, even 30 plus years. And it doesn't have to be this way. With the support of and passage of SB 487, it would redirect existing tax revenue funds from the budget depositing 300 to $500 million per year into a non-lapsing early care and family support account. Funds in this account would be targeted to create 10,000 to 15,000 new infant and toddler spots by contracting with providers, giving priority to providers in low income child care deserts. And additionally, there will be funding in the amount of 10% of the child care grants to pay for family support services. Thank you for your time, your service and consideration of my um, testimony. And I pray that it will help you choose to fully support SB 487 as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Russell, for your testimony and your patience you. in uh, waiting to testify. I see no questions. Bree. Thank you, Ms. Russell. The next Thank testifier you. is Bree Dealey. Uh, Thank you, Bree. And uh, Thank you, Chair Fonfara and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Bree Dealey. I'm a, a partner at Breezeway Consulting in Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm testifying before you today on behalf of the American Beverage Association on our behalf of our members in Connecticut who produce and distribute uh, most of the non-alcoholic beverages sold in Connecticut. Um, our companies employ about 3,000 residents of the state, and we are present uh, throughout the state with our uh, beverage businesses. Um, I'm here to testify today in support of an amendment to SB 11, the revenue package, to um, accelerate the rate of return of the unclaimed deposits to the distributors uh, that has already been begun under Public Act 2158 uh, to fund the costs of implementing new changes to the deposit system that were implemented under that Public Act last year. Um, for a little bit of background, quickly, in 2009, the legislature as part of the budget package took the unclaimed deposits away from distributors they had previously used to fund the operating costs of the deposit system in Connecticut. Uh, in uh, last year, uh, Public Act 2158 made some dramatic changes to the law that will result in at least a quadrupling of the cost of the operating the deposit system. And recognizing that increase in cost, Public Act 2158 also began a gradual transfer of those unclaimed deposits back to distributors, beginning at 95% staying with the state next year, transitioning to 45% staying with the state by, 20, by uh, fiscal 26. What we're proposing in our amendment is to accelerate that transition back to the distributors. Um, even, with a, uh, even with a complete transfer of those funds back to distributors, um, we won't be able to cover the increased costs that are associated with a higher handling fee with the expansion of the law and most in particular, the increase of the deposit to 10 cents in 2024, which will dramatically affect our operating costs. But we are proposing an acceleration of that schedule so that rather than 95% next year, it would be 75% retained by the state and would ultimately transition down so that all of the unclaimed deposits were retained by the distributors in order to offset costs. That's consistent with about half of the deposit systems in the country already in the US and is very consistent with what happens in the rest of the world with regard to the disposition of unclaimed deposits. So we ask your favorable consideration view of that amendment and I'm happy to answer any questions.
once again. Thank you, Ms. Deatley, for your testimony. And uh, I see no questions. Bree. Thank you. The next testifier is Katrina Coburn. Hello, I'm Katrina Coburn. I'm the senior manager of state policy for Zero to Three, a national nonprofit organization. We work to ensure that babies and toddlers benefit from the early connections that are critical to their well being and development. And our mission is to ensure that all babies and toddlers have a strong start in life. I am here to talk about why we need critical programs like the ones proposed in Senate Bill 487. The earliest years are critical for healthy development and the science is clear. Our brains grow faster between the ages of zero and three than any other point in life and forming more than 1 million new neural connections every second. A baby's beginnings lays the foundation for all to come. And when babies have consistent nurturing relationships, positive early learning experiences and good health and nutrition, those neural connections are stimulated and strengthened and lay the strong foundation for the rest of their lives. We also know that babies' development happens in the context of relationships. So when considering how to promote their healthy development, we need to think about both their relationships and their environment. Parents and primary caregivers play the most important role in supporting their children's healthy development. And when babies don't get what their growing brains need to thrive, they don't develop as they should, and this can lead to lifelong developmental, educational, social, and health challenges. When parents go to work, they want and need access to high quality, affordable childcare that supports their infants and toddlers' healthy development. Quality childcare feeds a baby's growing brain, building the foundation for the development necessary for them to thrive as adults. It includes nurturing relationships with responsive caregivers, continuity of care, and an environment that is safe for young children to explore and to learn. Babies and toddlers in high quality settings have opportunities for cognitive, social, emotional, language, and literacy development, setting them on a path for success in school and beyond. Unfortunately, we know high quality childcare can be hard to access, especially for families with low incomes. All families should have access to high quality affordable childcare services that best suit their needs, whether in a childcare facility, family childcare home, or family friend and neighbor care. This bill includes many of the successful strategies that we have seen states implement across the country, providing essential high quality program in multiple settings to meet the needs of families in the communities that need help the most. Um, Connecticut will be one of the states leading the country in access to high quality early learning spaces for infants and toddlers, helping to ensure success for your next generation. Thank you so much for your time and for prioritizing your state's babies and families by considering this bill. Zero to three sure. appreciates the work of this committee and urges you to use us as a resource as you continue to develop family-centered policies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. Um, has your organization done any work on the cost benefit of investing in this group, this cohort, and, and how that affects um, the need for services uh, later in life with folks who have children that haven't received um, uh, infant and toddler care? I'm going to refer you back to Dr. Gilliam's testimony. I think he um, shared exactly what we would from the Heckman equation work, and I don't have that right now. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bree. Thank you. The next testifier is Reggie Hayes. Mr. Hayes, we might have caught you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to this distinguished committee and Senator. I am testifying, my name is Reggie Hayes and I am testifying um, in favor of SB 487. I am a retired state social worker. Um, mm -hmm. I was a social worker for the state for approximately 30 years and I'm owner of Kitty Corner Daycare for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I'm also a part of Circle Collaboration in New Haven. It's a group of over 25, 30 uh, child care directors. We meet every single Saturday um, to discuss childcare issues and we assist each other. Um, it's important to note that this childcare industry is, is in serious dire straits. 
And I'm hoping that we can pass this SB 487 to support this industry. We should not be in competition with Target to get employees. I think that's deplorable. We, we make a major impact on these kids' life. And I'm not gonna talk long because I'm not a speaker, but I'm gonna give a good example. I had a young lady in my daycare center. She came in at three years old. Around five, she started getting taller. And at that time, I was also the head basketball coach at West Haven High School. So at times I would take my daycare to my games at night. This young lady at five years old, gained interest in basketball all of a sudden as me taking my daycare to these games. She ended up starring at Hopkins. She ended up getting a full scholarship to John, James Madison. And the most touching part is she was drafted by the Atlanta in the WNBA. And her first phone call and first text was to me. And for her to tell me that I changed her life as a child care director, it touched me. In my 30 years as a state social worker, I've never come before this committee to testify about anything. I just went to work every day for 30 years and did what I'm supposed to do. I don't think my personnel file got five pieces of paper. Yeah, maybe 30, 30 evaluations. Because I went to work every day and I mind my business but I had to get involved in this child care fight. It starts early. It's important for us to understand that it starts early. And let's make the investment in our children in Connecticut. Thank you. Mr. Hayes, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, um, it's very moving. And uh, I have to say that uh, you just don't know the effect that you can have in the full life of a person at that very young age that you helped that young, that young girl. And um, you made a difference in her life, obviously. She remembered it and wanted you to know that. And uh, I firmly believe that this legislation can do that on a much broader scale. And uh, I hope you'll stay involved in, in, in this process because we need your voice and your message. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bree. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. The next testifier is Betsy Guerra. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, that went very quickly. Um, I did submit written testimony. My name is Betsy Guerra. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns. And I just wanna to touch briefly on a couple of those bills. Senate Bill 478, Cost strongly supports section one and two of the bill, which address concerns regarding the use of contingency fee arrangements and property tax appeals. I know you heard some testimony about this, um, but this is an issue that is increasingly affecting municipalities, including small municipalities, because they become overwhelmed with property tax appeals because there are various firms throughout the state that offer property owners the opportunity to appeal these tax assessments on a contingency fee basis. And because they really don't have anything to lose, it encourages them to file those tax appeals. And it does, um, again, swamp municipalities, increase their litigation and court costs, as well as forcing them to shift a greater burden um, to other homeowners and businesses in the community. So we do think that this bill includes some common sense provisions that would ensure that this is not um, an ongoing problem. It prohibits witnesses who are paid on a contingency basis from providing testimony on the value of an applicant's property. And it also requires individuals to file an appraisal within 90 days of filing an appeal in superior court. So again, I do think these are helpful provisions that would reduce the number of frivolous property tax assessments. And just briefly, I know we had two uh, cost board members speak to Senate Bill 12, the bond package. I just wanted to respond to a question on the Urban Act and eligibility for some of our communities. I did look at OPM's website and according to their website, the Urban Act is available to state designated distressed municipalities, public investment communities and urban centers under the state's plan of conservation and development. And 
if towns don't meet this criteria, they may actually receive urban act funds if the state bond commission determines that the project in question will meet specified urban revitalization goals or transit oriented development goals. So there is a little more flexibility than uh, a, a population threshold will provide. I have reached out to OPM to find out whether this is something we should make available to our members. Um, I'm they typically remind me of when applications are available under the steep program. So I think if it was widely available for many of our small towns, they probably would have let me know that. But um, again, reaching out and happy to clarify that going forward. So thank you for the opportunity to testify on these issues. Thank you, Ms. Guerra. Um, I would just say that it's been my experience as both bonding subcommittee chair and chair of this committee that, as I mentioned earlier, that the practical effect, irrespective of what the OPM uh, provisions uh, state, the practical effect is that we've relaxed the eligibility uh, considerably, uh, beginning under the Malloy administration in particular, and I believe it's continued under this administration. Well, that's, that's great news. And uh, again, I will look into that on behalf of our members. So I appreciate that you raised that point earlier today. And I'll just say, as a legislator representing both a steep eligible town in a city that is um, has enjoyed uh, considerable support under Urban Act, that having two uh, systems, one that, and I know that many few of you have come today to say it's not that way, but it's my experience that it, the, the, that steep eligible towns also have access to, um, to uh, Urban Act, that my preference would be that there'd be one fund that everybody's eligible for as opposed to two um, in the manner that it currently works. But uh, a lot of issues before us and some get attention uh, as quickly as we like and others don't, but um, that's my preference. Um, thank you, Ms. Gare, I appreciate your testimony. Seeing no questions, Bree. Thank you. The next testifier is Christy Balka. You are on mute, Ms. Falca. There you are. Okay, there we go. Good morning, Senator Fanfara, Representative Scanlon, ranking members and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Christy Balca and I am Vice President of Policy at All Our Kin. Founded more than two decades ago in New Haven, All Our Kin supports about 700 family child care providers in New Haven, Bridgeport, Stamford, Norwalk, Danbury, and Hartford. We also work in New York City and provide technical assistance to like-minded partners who are supporting family child care educators in 21 states around the country. We help providers become licensed to develop sustainable business practices, to improve the quality of their programs, and to obtain national accreditation. Connecticut's family child care networks are in fact based on the model that we piloted in Connecticut years ago and have continually tested and refined ever since. Family child care provides the majority of child care for infants and toddlers in Connecticut and nationwide. Parents choose it for a number of reasons. Many appreciate the warm, intimate environment of a family child care home for their littlest children. Others like being able to enroll their infants and toddlers in a program that's close to home. Parents are drawn to culturally competent care that values their own culture and languages spoken at home. And family child care programs are often better able to accommodate parents who work during non-traditional hours and may require an early drop off in the morning or a late pickup in the evening or overnight care in a home-like setting. Despite strong parent demand, the supply of childcare has decreased precipitously in the last 15 years, leaving parents with many fewer options for their infants and toddlers. In Connecticut, family childcare has declined 
mirroring a national trend that saw a 42% decrease in the number of family child care programs from 2005 to 2017. Center-based care for infants and toddlers has also decreased. This has occurred at the very same time that scientists have made profound discoveries about the importance of early childhood brain development and the role that high quality care plays in reducing opportunity gaps that first appear among children even before they're born and often follow them throughout the life cycle. 30 seconds, so, please summarize. Yes, what's going on here is that family child care providers are closing because they can't earn a living for infants and toddlers. Parents are being left in the lurch. And the number one reason is because infant toddler care is expensive, parents can't afford it, and Connecticut does not support it ad adequately. Senate Bill 487 would reverse this trend. Uh, it is based on best practices gleaned from around the country. Um, we strongly encourage um, uh, the Finance Committee to support this bill. Uh, it also invests in equity, which is not only the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. Uh, communities and children who are uh, in greatest need benefit the most from prioritizing high quality early childhood programs. Study after study has told us that for these reasons and others, all our kin fully supports this bill and urges the committee to give its full support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Balka. Uh, Representative Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Balka, thank you for your testimony. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on um, a scenario where a child has infant care, toddler care, preschool, and then goes right into the school system? How well prepared is that child? Um, I can speak from my own experience as a parent, uh, but I think you'd probably rather hear this um, from the perspective of economists uh, and educators. Um, Walter Gilliam and Katrina Coburn referred to the Heckman equation, James Heckman, a, a Nobel economist, and others around the country. Um, uh, Arthur Rolnick from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve and, and many others have done cost benefit analyses uh, that have ascertained um, uh, the public saves $13 for every dollar invested in early childhood programs. It's important to ensure continuity of care, that is not to fund infant toddler care instead of preschool or instead of investing in K through 12. Uh, but I'll tell you as, as a parent and as someone who has focused on early childhood for 20 years, um, this is, uh, you know, going back to Dr. Gilliam's uh, story about the peach farmer, uh, this is a really critical investment. Thank, thank you so much um, for your answer. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Seeing no other questions, Bree. The next testifier we have is Danielle Singleton. Hello, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank Senator Funfar, Representative Scanlon, and members of the Finance Committee for allowing me to present today. My name is Danielle Singleton, and I'm the Coordinator of Special Education for the Consolidated School District of New Britain. Thank you for this opportunity, and I do support the Senate Bill uh, 47. There are many reasons why this bill is important for children and families living in cities like New Britain, where the median household income is $45,990. So we have to remember that some families are living above that median income, but some are also living below it. 
While many families would like to provide their infants and toddlers with exposure to other children, trained professionals, increased language models, and opportunities for social and emotional development, um, limited income can be a substantial barrier to that dream. Families struggling financially to provide essentials for living often have to forego assistance with infant and toddler care that would otherwise give their children a strong foundation for learning. Another barrier is the shortage of accredited childcare facilities in large cities like New Britain. This results in fewer slots availability um, than actual need. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, requires that early intervention services be provided to the maximum extent appropriate in natural environments for in infants and toddlers. The natural environment includes home and community settings where children would be participating if they did not have a disability. One of the problems we run into is that first time parents are often young parents without knowledge about what is and is not developmentally appropriate for their youngsters can miss signs of delays or disabilities. When this happens, the opportunity for providing early intervention services can be missed. The thing about early intervention services is that once that window is missed, we can't go back in time to retrieve it. It's simply missed. When children enroll in school for kindergarten, and that's the first time educators are identifying a developmental delay or disability, we recommend services and assist the family and child. Despite this, research shows that the earlier we intervene to provide support for children, the better the, their outcomes. By increasing access to infant and toddler care, we also increase the opportunity for identifying delays and offering early intervention services to children. There are more trained eyes on the children, assuring that they get what they need at the earliest possible opportunity. Through our district preschool assessment teams, we evaluate an average of 200 children between the ages of two and a half and four years old per year. In addition, please summarize. Okay, in addition, uh, we have an additional 80 to 95 community referrals uh, referred by pediatricians, parents, and child care centers. It's our responsibility to make sure that we are providing equitable access to experiences that contribute to the well being and development of our youngest citizens. When uh, delays and disabilities are identified, we need to assure that children are receiving early intervention services and supports for the best outcomes possible. SB 487 will provide the resources necessary for ensuring this occurs. Thank you for your time. And I urge you to pass this bill on behalf of the children and families of New Britain and Connecticut. Thank you, Ms. Singleton, Representative Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hi, uh, Danielle Singleton, how are you? Uh, I'm good, how are you? Good. Um, I'm glad you brought up something very important and that's inter, you know, early intervention services and how important that is to catch the child while they're in um, infant toddler program or in preschool before they go into um, K through eight. Um, and because we have heard from people, um, individuals and teachers alike and psychologists and so forth um, that if you catch them early, um, you can get those intervention services started and um, the outcomes are much better as they move forward through the school system. And, and I think that's key here and um, it's so important because um, as I stated before, as a former teacher, the things that we used to do in the classroom, um, preschool classroom, where we did needs assessments, where we did the dial R, which was to um, really see what level that child is in, in, in their reading skills and, and um, fine motor skills and gross motor skills. And these, you know, you can pick up um, if a child is behind and then you can make that referral and, and get, um, um, get a services for this child immediately before they go into the K through, you know, the ki kindergarten. So I'm, um, thank you so much for that testimony. And I'm glad you touched up on that, on the early intervention services. That, that is so key uh, moving forward. And, um, and we need more infant toddler care um, as you know, um, thank you again for your um, for your testimony this morning or this afternoon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And I would just agree with that and just say that uh, when we have children with delays that are starting in kindergarten uh, without the early intervention services, 
we have to make up time for the delays as well as trying to help them catch up with the, the uh, peers and make the same progress um, as they move through school. So the Absolutely. earlier we get the interventions, the, the, the less we're behind and the further we can bring them uh, once, once they're able to enter in kindergarten. And I agree. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Bree? The next testifier is Rashid Malik. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, my name is Rashid Malik. I'm Director of Early Childhood Policy at the Center for American Progress, which is a think tank in Washington, DC. I'm very proud to join today uh, to express my support for the Infant and Toddler Early Care and Family Support Initiative, um, SB 487. Um, that's because one of my ongoing areas of research has been the undersupply of licensed childcare, uh, which we term childcare deserts. I, I believe Meryl from uh, earlier maybe shared some of those statistics, but I'll uh, reiterate them here. You know, according to our estimates, about 44% of Connecticut families live in a childcare desert. And if that weren't bad enough, when we look at the state's lowest income census tracts, that number jumps to 58% of families. Uh, but those, most of those spots are, are for preschoolers. Um, the deepest gaps that need to be addressed, uh, and which is why this, this investment would be so crucial, is for infant and toddler childcare. Um, th that would really address uh, se severe inequities in access. Um, the supply of infant toddler spots needs to be incentivized through public investment because very, very few childcare programs can, can offer care at a price that families can afford. The only reason we have any infant toddler care is because early educators subsidize the provision of care through appallingly low wages. And this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem uh, during the pandemic as we lose teachers to the lure of higher pay in retail and food service and other industries um, that can take advantage of a tight labor market and rising prices for goods. The infant toddler care we currently have is most abundant for those with the most resources. So access gaps uh, emerge right away for our youngest babies. My research finds that nationally families in the top income quintile access infant toddler care at four times the rate of those in the bottom. And the tragic irony is that decades of research, have, as we've heard, tell us the greatest benefits come from helping babies um, and families experiencing economic hardship. So it is indisputably smart policy to invest early in our babies and their families and to prioritize reaching low-income communities. Um, now, quality care requires, as Dr. Gilliam mentioned, fewer adults per child, and that makes it inherently expensive to fund. It means investing in the high-skilled work of early educators, but I would encourage members of this committee to think not only about the cost, but also the value of these investments. This would mean more jobs and better wages for early educators working with infants and toddlers, more than half of whom rely on public benefits currently to make ends meet. Uh, it means higher quality care for babies and toddlers, lower rates of turnover among educators, lower levels of financial stress for them would allow teachers to focus on the crucial work of safely nurturing our babies as they learn, grow, and play. Uh, it means help for working parents, especially mothers who would be able to to join the labor force or work the number of hours that they need to provide for their families. And finally, I want to point seconds, to, please, uh, thank you. Um, I point to a uh, work by a team of economists at Harvard University led by uh, Professor Nathaniel Hendren. They conducted a comparative analysis of over 125 historical policy changes over the past half century in the United States, looking at everything from education to job training to taxes and, and cash transfers. They found that direct investments in low-income children's health and education have historically had the highest public value relative to investment. So thank you for your consideration of this bill. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, Representative Sanchez. Thank you, Ms. Thank you Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Malik, thank you for your testimony. Um, just a quick question in regards to cost. What would, you, um, what would you estimate is the average um, cost per child for infant toddler care? Well, there's, there's sort of two answers for that. 
there's a, the actual cost of providing high quality care that only the richest of us can afford. And that is, is truly, you know, uh, uh, to provide high quality care is in the hundreds of dollars per week, you know, especially in a state like Connecticut. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, on the order of, of $25,000 per year per child. Um, now, what we, what we are, are, are kind of having to retreat to is investing as much as we can uh, while paring back wages of, of educators. Um, and that still leaves a really sizable bill for families when they're least able to afford it. Um, and so, you know, I think um, this, the fact is the, the earliest care has the greatest return on investment. And it's also the most expensive to provide, but, but just justifiably so, right? Because we, we know that it, it has cascading benefits for that, for that baby later on, for that family, uh, and for uh, for society as as we move further into the future, so um, so that's that's the kind of uh, you know comparison that we need to have apples to apples costs to benefits. Thank you, thank you. Because here in Connecticut, um, for I know the uh, per cost per child per preschool slot um, is about nine thousand dollars, which should be more like sixteen thousand. And for toddler, infant toddler care, for those that do have it and, uh, and get state funds, it's about 10,000. And, you know, absolutely, if you want quality, um, you have to spend the dollars. And um, we're, we're just not doing that in Connecticut. But thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Bree. The next testifier is Eric Hammerling. Good afternoon, honorable members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Eric Hammerling, and I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. Testifying in support of Section 11 of SB 12, which would authorize an additional $15 million in FY23 to reduce the existing backlog of state park infrastructure needs. People are getting outdoors to state parks in record numbers, with approximately 13 million people visiting state parks in 2021. And since the Passport to the Parks took effect in 2018, attendance has been growing by 10 to 20 percent each year. <clears throat> Visitors to parks spend money in your communities, and parks generate value for Connecticut. A 2011 Yukon economic study quantified over $1 billion in annual revenue benefits from state parks, and that every $1, for every $1 spent on state parks, the state receives about $38 in return. However, several of the 1,000 or so buildings across 110 state parks are in varying states of disrepair. For example, the historic Ellie Mitchell Pavilion at Rocky Neck was built in the 1930s and has hosted special events and generated revenues for the state uh, for private vendors and for the local community over the last 90 years. This unique structure requires repairs and DEEP estimates that the full cost to rehabilitate the pavilion alone is approximately $30 million. The pavilion at Rocky Neck is part of a $130 million backlog and critical maintenance, repairs and other capital improvement projects needed at state parks. Some investments would renovate historic structures or rehab more basic amenities such as public restrooms. And significant investments are also required to ensure facilities meet the needs for individuals with mobility and other physical challenges. In my testimony, I've included examples of the kinds of projects that would benefit from additional bonding at Hammond Asset, Harkness Memorial, Sherwood Island, Talcott Mountain, uh, and many other iconic places. It's inevitable that Connecticut's system of state parks, which celebrates its 110 year anniversary next year, would contain some older facilities that need to be refreshed. The alternative, unfortunately, could be closing facilities that are increasingly unsafe for the public. Of course, we hope that never happens, and we know you do too. So we ask you to support bonding in SB 12 for infrastructure improvements that are necessary and often overdue, to sustain the many values that state parks provide to all of us. Thank you for the important work you do and for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Thank you, sir. Representative Bohr. Thank you, Senator Fonfara, and hello, Eric. 
Uh, thank you for being here. I knew eventually you would be here. <laughs> you would be on today. Um, and thanks for all you do for our state parks. Um, just a question for you on the funding that we put in the bond bill that the governor proposed in the bond bill for the maintenance of the parks subsequent um, to the, the bill being um, launched, the governor announced additional funding for the maintenance of parks uh, about two weeks ago. So can you just talk about um, the difference between the bonding funding versus this recent announcement and, and how both of those funding pools would be used? Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Representative uh, Borer. Always great to see you and appreciate the question. Um, yes, uh, there is a total of $55 million that's proposed for state park infrastructure by the governor. Uh, that would be the $30 million that is uh, before you today in SB 12 in terms of bonding, and an additional $25 million uh, from ARPA funding. So that would be the total of $55 million. This is, to, to be clear, these are for capital investments um, and not for the type of, uh, you know, just basic maintenance and operations that's supported by the Passport to the Parks um, and other funding with, within DEEP. So this is really just for capital improvements and uh, $55 million is a is a nice investment, obviously, uh, quite a step up from uh, what was in the budget this past year. Um, but it, it still uh, is evidence of the, the big need that is there for uh, additional work to be done on state parks. And I, I hope we'll continue to make this kind of investment. Thanks so much. And in particular, when we're trying to keep folks outside and healthy um, to be able to use funds that are meant for those purposes um, for our parks. And I'm really proud that we were one of the number one uh, tourist destinations in New England, our parks. And um, just a question around that, um, because we are considering significant funding for our parks and the fact that they are a tourist destination. Uh, does the parks, do you all connect with the local community where the parks are located to kind of leverage off of each other? So we're improving the parks, people come from out of state to our parks. Do you work with a local economy to kind of keep them in the area? You know, I think there's a, a great connection between the communities where parks are located and, and the communities themselves. Um, one thing that we've seen over the last few years, uh, you know, because of the passport to the parks, people are able to get into state parks without paying a fee at the, the gates, which is a huge advance over where things uh, once were. What that's resulted in, in terms of behavior, is um, you know people are spending a little less time at state parks. They're coming for a visit rather than, you know, I paid my thirteen dollars at the gate. I better stay all day. Um, but that that also means that you know they'll stay for a few hours, but then pop out of the park to grab lunch in the local community. Um, you know, gas up their vehicle. Uh, you know, maybe go for a walk downtown and do some shopping. So there, there's a great connection between uh, the value that's generated by parks. Um, and, and it's not just uh, and anymore what people pay to get into parks. Now we're talking about how uh, having a park in your community that's well-maintained attracts people, attracts visitors, um, and also help, helps to sustain uh, local housing values associated with the park. You know, there, there are many ways that parks generate value. Um, and uh, again, we, we think that there's a really important need to continue to invest to ensure they stay uh, as valuable as they can be. Great, thanks. And that was actually what I was driving at that it's not only an opportunity for our residents or folks to come from out of state, but there's an economic driver associated with us investing in our state parks across the state. So thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Senator Formica. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, Eric, good afternoon to you, sir. And thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, I was proud to be part of that initiative with Passport to Parks way back when, along with your organization and you and Senator Austin and many. It was a bipartisan effort that got that across. And what a win I think that's been to the state of Connecticut and to the park system um, from before. Um, thank you for that support. My question to you is that you seem to know quite a bit about where this money might be going. We've had a number of meetings over the years with Seaside. I can tell by your smile you knew that was coming. Um, 
And, and I think we're ultimately on the same side of this issue. We're just trying to figure out the best way through it. And almost a year ago, we were at a meeting with the commissioner talking about seaside and improvements and possibilities. Do you have any insight as to whether any of this bond dollar is earmarked for um, improvements at seaside? I don't have any information on whether it's earmarked for improvements at Seaside, but I can certainly say that I agree with you that there is a need to make those types of investments at Seaside. You know, there we have uh, a, a beautiful historic um, asset for the state. We have a shoreline park, which, you know, they're not creating shoreline parks anymore. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that that is truly a community asset that attracts people uh, safely to enjoy what is available at Seaside. Um, so I completely agree that there's a need for that investment. Um, I, I do know that in addition to, um, you know, what is uh, in SB 12, uh, and, and hopefully we'll have your support, uh, you know, DEEP is also looking for additional sources of revenue uh, outside of this um, whole process, looking for potential federal uh, grants that might support their ongoing work at Seaside. And we think that too is important to make those investments to really um, protect that, that special jewel and make sure that it, it continues to be great value to the public. Thank you. I, I appreciate that answer. And I heard the same that there were federal grant opportunities, although uh, the, the world seems to be awash in federal grant opportunities these days. So I'm not sure how long that'll go, but hopefully some of it will make its way to Seaside and we can finally, after decades of uh, neglect, we can get this park back to where we need it to be and uh, safe for people. And thank you again for your service. And it was a, always a pleasure working with you. And, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bree? Thank you. The next testifier is Karen Lott. Hello. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Lott. I am the Executive Director of the Women's League Child Development Center in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm here to speak in support of SB 487. Um, the Women's League Child Development Center is the largest nonprofit uh, single site uh, early childhood education center in the Hartford area. We've been providing care and education for children and families uh, in the Hartford area for over 104 years. We are a NIAC accredited uh, early childhood education center. And in fact, we're one of the first uh, urban child care centers to receive such accreditation uh, in 1975. As a lifelong educator uh, coming to the nonprofit sector uh, at the Women's League from a, a career in public education as a elementary school principal, a middle school principal, and a high school, even high school principal, uh, I am standing in great support of the need for support for the infrastructure for early care and education. As we have the opportunity to intervene on the most critical time in a child's development between the ages of birth and five years old, the support and the services that early care and education centers provide for children across the state of Connecticut is critical for our children's development their entry into formal education uh, and their success as they continue on in their educational career. The Women's League Child Development Center has uh, 17 classrooms. We have a licensed capacity to serve 230 children. We have one infant room, eight rooms designated for toddlers and eight classrooms designated for preschool children. So when we talk about providing funding to support particularly infant and toddlers. I speak from the perspective that this is imperative that we do something to fix uh, the infant toddler system as, we, as the system right now is plagued with long wait list. Pre-COVID, there was a substantial wait list, hundreds of children on our wait list for infant and toddler slots at the Women's League. Post-COVID, 
kind of post COVID, that wait list is increasing ever more as we have families who are now eager for care so that they can return to work. And not just eager for care, but eager for high quality care where they know that their child is going to be in a licensed facility uh, that's following rules and regulations to make sure that children are safe. But in order to meet this need for the workforce and to meet the need for working families, it is critical that the infant and toddler system um, have some repair. So an influx of dollars into the infant toddler system over the next couple of years would allow for centers such as myself to begin to plan for how to expand our services so we can provide more infant toddler care. It is the area where parents are asking for where there is the greatest demand. Um, we would be open to as a center looking at our strategic planning and how we can service more infant and toddlers. But right now it's cost prohibitive for us to do so based on the number of eight preschool, eight toddlers in a classroom compared to 20 children in a preschool classroom. So the additional funding, please, please summarize. Additional, okay. The additional funding um, as well would help us meet the demand. And, and other centers across the state of Connecticut to meet the demand, as well as to look at how we can address some of the wage issues that cause us to lose so many early care and early care and early care and education educators. Uh, so I speak in support of this bill. I believe that we can do great things for the children and the families of Connecticut uh, with an influx of dollars where we can, in fact, redesign the infant toddler structure so that the, the reimbursement rate is such that more centers, it, it's feasible for more centers to expand and have more infant toddler seats. Thank you, Ms. Lott. Um, actually, Ms. Lott, I learned recently that your center is on the edge of my district, in my district, um, on Sims and North Main. Um, and, um, and I wanted to ask you, do you, do you provide uh, services for, for, for birth to three right now? We, we do not provide those services, but birth to three providers come into our center on a daily basis and provide services for children that are eligible to receive those services right in our classrooms. So we but welcome and we partner with birth to three. But it, I'm using, I'm not using that as a formal designation that I know that program is called birth to three, but I'm saying that age cohort, do you service uh, those children that are not part of the birth to three program? Oh, absolutely. The our population that we serve are from the ages of three months of age until five years old when they're eligible to go to kindergarten. So we have infants, toddlers, and preschool children at the Women's League. And and so what has your experience been of the, the three months through, let's say, three years old in terms of, I'm sure you've had the opportunity to compare the preparation for students, particularly in the neighborhood that you're located, mm -hmm. um, which is a challenged neighborhood, uh, no question about it. Yep. Um, and if we can help children in, in, in the neighborhood, I know you, you service children beyond that neighborhood, but I am very familiar with Sim Street and the surrounding neighborhood there um, and representing that area for so many years. Is your experience, can you just share with the committee your experience with students or students, children who um, in, that, in that zero to three age group that have had the benefit experience that you've provided versus those that haven't. I don't know if you're capable of doing that, but if you, if yeah. you can, it'd be very helpful. Yeah, I, I can speak to that from uh, a couple of different angles. Prior to coming to the Women's League, I was the principal of Thurman Milner School on Vine Street for five years. Uh -huh. uh, and in that, in that school building, I had kindergartners who were coming to me without any preparation from being in a preschool setting. And I saw those children really struggle with the self-regulation. I saw them struggle with adjusting to the routines um, of being in a formal education setting. So when I fast forward now to being at the Women's League, I see the preparation that we give children. We focus on those school readiness skills so that when they enter kindergarten, they don't fall immediately into that achievement gap. 
right? They're going into kindergarten with the skills that make them able to attend uh, and have success in their academics at kindergarten. The research around early care and education shows that children that have a high quality early childhood experience between those ages that you're referencing between zero and three uh, and really zero to four are more likely to go on and not only be successful in kindergarten, but to be successful in middle school, to graduate from high school and to matriculate on to college. So the benefits are many of a high quality early childhood experience. And you're absolutely right. The children in the area that we serve, many of our children come from the surrounding uh, streets in the North End. Um, they very much need to have that leg up. They very much need to have every opportunity to be well prepared uh, to engage and be successful when they enter school. Last question. Um, if this legislation becomes law, how would you be able to service, well, would you be able to service more children? Mm -hmm. um, and and in, this, in this same group and in the need level, uh, if funding were available? Absolutely. Uh, we have 17 classrooms at the Women's League. Nine of those classrooms are designated for infants and toddlers between the ages of zero and three. And then we have uh, eight classrooms that are designated for preschool children. We know that our preschool enrollment has been suffering. There are many options that parents have for preschool. So as with my board of directors, we have talked about how could we expand to meet the need for infant toddler care. So as a program, we would very much be open. The increase in the rate for reimbursement would make it significantly possible for us to look at trading out perhaps some preschool classrooms to add additional infant toddler classrooms. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sanchez. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, hi, Ms. Lott, nice to see you. Um, so you, you mentioned nine classrooms are uh, infant toddler care and um, these are state funded. Um, is, your, is your program state funded? Yes, we are a state okay. funded program, yes. So you. So you get about 10,000 per child. I'm, I mean, I'm just giving an estimated figure. Yes, roughly. And, and so that's for 72 infant toddler seats. Um, that's roughly the reimbursement. And in your opinion, what would be the correct estimated amount or the right estimated amount um, to receive for um, infant toddler care? Well, I, I don't... I can't say where that exact sweet spot is, but to increase the rate to $400 a week is a significant game changer, right? If the reimbursement rate per child per week were to increase to that amount to $400 uh, dollars a week, that is a game changer in terms of being able to really create more of those seats in terms of trading out some infant toddler seats for preschool seats. I can only put eight infant toddlers in a classroom but I can put 20 preschool children in a classroom. So it's always been cost prohibitive to say, wow, how do we maintain all of our staff, maintain our staffing levels, and at the same time, increase infant toddler care and decrease our preschool um, enrollment, our, our slots based on the current reimbursement structure. So um, Representative Sanchez, I can't give you what that exact figure would be, but $405 a week, approximate around there, would be a total game changer um, per child um, to getting to that sweet spot, to getting to that right number uh, where it is feasible um, for more centers to offer infant toddler care. Uh, so we're looking at about an additional $1,600 per year per per child, because right now you're getting about 10. Um, so an, an additional 1600, and, and we're just talking about a Band-Aid anyway, um, because I'm pretty sure you're having a difficult time retaining um, um, staff and recruiting staff like everyone else does. Um, so, and and that the ratio for, for toddlers is eight to one. Um, infant, I believe is four to one. Yes. And then you got your preschool slots, which is 10 to one. So this is why, you can do better with preschool because of the um, the amount of more children per per staff. Right. Um, 
So it's more expensive to run an infant toddler um, classroom. But thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative San Sanchez. Bree? Thank you. The next testifier is Vivian Adakwa. Thank you, good afternoon. Honorable ranking members and distinguished members of Finance, Revenue and AMP Bonding Committee. My name is Vivian and I live in Manchester. I have two young men who attend one of Craig's Magnet Schools, Academy of Aerospace and Engineering in Windsor. Thank you for raising SB 485 to support Craig in implementing much needed capital improvement for our schools. I am asking you to please support this much needed funding and mechanism for CREC. My children have had the privilege of attending CREC Magnet Schools for the past 11 years. My oldest son is a part of the first graduating class of CREC Anna Grace Academy of the Arts Elementary Magnet School in Avon. My youngest is an honor student with distinction at 8AE. Their success would not be possible without Craig's Magnet School mission, vision, core values, and strong programs, such as the Academy Afrocentric AAS, pardon me, such as the, acad the um, program, such as the Academic Afrocentric Scholarship AAS program of which of both my children are enrolled in. AAS program helps parents help their sons stay connected academically and socially. My hope is that you will support SB 485 and create this important mechanism to cover Craig's capital improvement to continue to provide excellent educational opportunity for our children. Thank you for your vote and your time. Thank you, Vivian. I can say with some experience that um, the aerospace school in Windsor is, if it isn't the finest school and a learning opportunity in the state, I don't know. Um, if there are others, then uh, those stu students are doing well as well. That's a phenomenal school. We spared yes. no resources in, in, in that facility, that's for sure. Um, Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, no questions. Bree. Thank you. The next testifier is Tashiana O'Connor. Hi. Um, good afternoon, members of the committee and finance committee. Can you hear me? We hear you well, Tashina, uh, Ms. O'Connor, and please keep your eyes on the road uh, while I you're am, speaking. I am we on can, the road. Um, we, we, we hear you fine. <laughs> I'm going to pull over. So I'm pulling over so I could talk to you guys. Um, I'm sitting, um, good evening. I, good afternoon, actually. My name is Tashiana O'Connor. I'm the owner and director of TikTok Around the Clock 24 Hour Daycare. I provide service for infants and toddler before and after school, first, second, and third shift. I'm here in support of Bill SB, SBA um, 485. As I'm sitting here listening, and I say that over and over and, and with these meetings, why? Why when it comes on to our children, our citizens, why do we have to be pleading for help? Why do we have to be at coming before you members to ask, given your reason why our American citizens should be first? Why is that that the future you have to suffer when our founding father found this country, he did not expect us to be here to be begging. I'm listening to the news and I hear the president, Biden, how many millions he's going to send over to something, to another country. We are always first for every other country. We're always the big brother, the protector for everyone outside this country. What about us? What about our children? What about our future generation? We said we believe. The children are our future, but we shouldn't have to be here. 
We should not have to be begging and telling you the reason why they deserve this money to make it better for them. It should not be questioned. It's hurting. And I'm listening to these testimony after testimony when people, when they're saying that the reason why, you know, to make the children think about when you was younger. Think about your grandkids. Think about your children. Think about the legacy that you guys are going to leave behind. This is infuriated and it's frustrated and it's anger me to know that we're here. But if another country calling us, it's no second. They don't have to tell us and go through this long, detailed, dragging process to plead for our children, our children, our future. Have to, we have to sit here pleading and saying that, please, this is the reason we have to go through a 10-page essay just to give you guys and give you guys the reason why they deserve it. I, 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 I'm not, I have a whole testimony, but I'm not, because it's upsetting. I have a mother of nine. Two of my children are serving this country. Two of my children are out there. They can't tell me where they got deployed because it has to be secret. I sit there and I pray to God that them and every other member of, the, of that serving this country come home alive. But as they serve and I sit there as a mother, if, if two children that put their life on the country, it makes me sit there and cringe and cry and say, look what we're doing for them, for their children, for your grandchildren, for your nieces, nephews. I understand that some of us make a better way for them, but there's some of them that can't in the inner city kids that's struggling, that's pleading. Children that I provide, mom that works second and third shift. And without you guys supporting this bill and help us to pass this bill, there won't be a future for them. And we want better for our kids. And I know our founding father looking down and looking from heaven and, and like, listen, this is not what my, what I, my dream was about. This is not. We're there for everyone else. As soon as the country calling us, we're there. Congress, get together. Yes. And if we don't do it, why? No. No, we could say no one time and say we American first, American citizen, the children first, secure home. My mom always said, make sure home is secure before you could secure anyone else. If home is not secure, how are you going to secure anyone else? And why should we always? You know what? That, that's it. I'm done. I'm just thank you guys for the member. It's just hurting. Thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to testify. And I really hope that you guys support this bill and put our children first. Thank you very much, Ms. O'Connor. I will just say that um, that's what this forum is about. That's what the public hearing process is all about so that you and others like you can come here and educate us and have us better understand the circumstances that are going on uh, in your world, in your children's world, and your grandchildren's world, and, um, you know, not everybody in the state and most towns in the state, most legislators do not represent a correct um, a run school. And so they're hearing, I do live in two towns or represent two towns that um, are correct towns, if you will. But the majority of the state, as you know, do not. And and so this is an educational experience for most on this committee. We're not the education committee. We are a funding committee for certain. And this bill is properly before us. But your testimony today um, is not falling on deaf ears. And uh, we hope that we can make progress with this issue that's been uh, before us uh, for some time now. So I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Bree? Thank you. The next testifier is Tracy Madden Hennessy. Good afternoon, Senator Fonfara, Representative Scanlon, and committee members. My name is Tracy Madden Hennessy. I'm the executive director of the YWCA New Britain and here to speak in support of SB 487. Others have been talking about the shortage of infant toddler care and the pre preventative benefits of good quality early education. I want to support what has already been stated. The YWCA operates our infant toddler program despite a funding loss of more than $150,000 annually. This is despite 
paying teachers only about 15 to $20 an hour. So the current model just does not support uh, expansion. I operate with a waiting list of hundreds of children on it of this age group. It's not an exaggeration to say many of these children don't receive an invitation to participate in our program until preschool. In New Britain, to increase the availability of care, we're in the process of developing a childcare business incubator. And our vision for an incubator, private and shared space would provide individuals who want to run their own childcare business a place to start. Last year, the legislature passed legislation that is allowing the development of these pilots in a handful of communities, but did not provide the funding to go with it. This is a model that, that promotes the development of family daycare businesses that could step into the service gap and support the development of young children in communities where it's needed most. You've heard about the benefits of early care on the long-term development of young children. You've heard about the staffing shortages in childcare. That's also real. A uh, family childcare pro provider could make more operating her own business than I could currently pay to have her work in our classrooms. So that's the sad reality of this. So SB 487 addresses the cost of care, cost that parents, particularly in districts like New Britain, are unable to afford. This shortage of affordable childcare particularly impacts women's ability to enter or re-enter the workforce after having a baby. And for low-income communities, it interferes with women's ability to support their family economically. Local business owners and operators in our community have also indicated it's having a ripple effect across many industries. So under SB 487, funds could be used to contract with child care providers, both centers and family child care homes to increase the supply of high quality infant child care. You've heard in this hearing and many others that the system of care is broken. We have to increase funding to this industry. Otherwise, we will continue to see providers close, supply drop, and be unable to meet the needs of children and families in our state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, Bree. Thank you. The next testifier is Fenwa Liu. Hello, hi, uh, this is Kwa Liu. Uh, our Deputy Commissioner Josh Hirschman was supposed to join us as well. Can you please let him in as well? We will do that. Thank okay, you. thanks. It may be a moment before we can pull that person in. I'm in. You want to skip to? Hi. Oh, you want to hear hi? Yes. How are nope. You? I'm all set. Thank you, Bree. Thank you, uh, Senator Fonfara, Representative Scanlon, Senator Martin, Representative Cheeseman, and members of the Finance and Revenue and Bonding Committee. My name is Josh Hirschman. I'm the Deputy Commissioner at the Connecticut Insurance Department. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to testify today on SB 11, specifically Section 6. Representative Scanlon, I think, is very familiar with this. Um, this is the captive insurance. Uh, bill that we have been pushing now since about tw since 2020. Then it was SB 339. In uh, 21, it was HB 6388. Um, these are, there are currently 35 captive insurance companies domiciled in the state of Connecticut. And that's been a lot of growth just in the past year and a half. Um, however, many other uh, domiciles um, have, have more appropriate laws around their captive legislation and, and statutes to allow for more growth in the industry. And th this bill that is in front of you today, it allows for more flexibility with uh, the interest for businesses to meet their evolving insurance needs and manage their risk more effectively. Under this bill, the significant changes to the Connecticut's captive insurance law will include the use of foreign branch captives to allow multi-state organizations to better manage their risk in Connecticut. This bill also amends definitions and makes technical changes to remove barriers to establish a branch captive in the state and better streamline the licensing process. This bill also permits a three-year look back for insurers that establish a branch captive insurance company 
or permit uh, or transfers the domicile of its alien or foreign captive insurance company to Connecticut by June 30th, 2023. All pen penalties on outstanding liabilities for Connecticut insurers that have not paid the non-admitted insurance premium tax would be waived. However, the independently procured insurance premium tax, also called non-admitted insurance premium tax and interest would be collected for taxable periods ending on or after July 1, 2019, but before July 1, 2022. Additionally, this bill will give the commissioner the authority to license foreign branch captives, insurance companies, reduce the minimum capital requirements for captive insurance companies, while still providing the commissioner with discretion to establish additional captives and surplus requirements based on individual risk base. Bottom line is Connecticut's the insurance capital of the world. We want to continue down those, we want to continue being the insurance capital of the world and having more ability for um, insurance business gives consumers more uh, choice. And that's exactly what we hope the, the captive bill does. Deputy Commissioner, good to see you. I feel like this is Hotel California. You can check out, but you can never leave. Uh, my past life as chair of the insurance committee is coming back. Uh, Representative Meskers has a question for you. Uh, hi, Deputy Commissioner. How are you doing today? How are you? Good. Um, have you coordinated the bill and the structure of the bill as well with, uh, with uh, Commissioner Bodden over the DRS? Yeah. Um, yes, DRS is is aware of this bill from 2020, and uh, they are, to my knowledge, are prepared to do everything that they need to do be, to do to um, accomplish sort of the look back and uh, and whatever waivers people would receive. Um, I, I do have the director of the captive division on as well, Fenwa. Fenwa, is there anything additional you'd like to add regarding the relationship with DRS in this bill? Yes, thank you, Deputy. As well, as far as I know, we have been working very closely with DRS to get their uh, approval agreement with all the uh, changes regarding taxes. Okay, so the only thing I'll ask going forward is further conversation in relation to and any encouragement for getting the Connecticut domicile for both for overseas captive insurance as well as for other states captive insurance. I'd like to be able to get the taxable jurisdiction into Connecticut in terms of to avoid what we call the convenience tax. So to the extent we can get their operating uh, services let, register, registered in Connecticut and they become a Connecticut tax entity versus a New York or Massachusetts tax entity. I wanna make sure we're competitive on anything that's related to uh, domicile convenience tax. So just if you would go over that with DRS to make sure that we fine tuned it in terms of uh, the uh, well, other states for foreign domiciles and captive insurance, okay? Sure, we'll confirm that for you. Great, perfect. Thank you very much. No further questions. All right. Deputy Commissioner, seeing no further questions, thanks for being here today and we'll see you soon. Thank you. The next testifier is Catherine Hagen. Hello, Senator Fanfara, Representative Scanlon, and members of the Finance Committee. My name is Catherine Hagen, and I am a former preschool center director and toddler teacher currently serving in the role of an association administrator for the Connecticut Association for the Education of Young Children. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of SB 487. This bill would redirect existing tax revenue from the budget reserve to a new non-lapsing early care and family support account. Funds in this account would then be used to contract with childcare providers in both centers and family childcare homes to increase the supply of high quality infant and toddler care with priority given to childcare providers in lower income childcare deserts. The early childhood care and, in, care and education industry is broken. Families with young children face a significant cost burden with the average high quality program costing families upwards of $16,000 per year for infants and toddlers. In many cases, this is the equivalent of a second mortgage payment each month. And despite the high cost of care, there are still not enough infant toddler slots available to meet the demand of families 
who need high quality care for their children so they can remain in the workforce. According to a recent survey, four out of five childcare businesses have staffing vacancies and 57% have closed classrooms due to staffing. Why? According to the State of Connecticut Department of Labor, the median hourly wage for childcare workers in Connecticut is $13.45 per hour, which is just under $28,000 annually. Right now, entry-level positions at retail stores like Target and Amazon are paying between $15 and $30 per hour and offer benefits such as health insurance and retirement plans, things that are typically not offered to the early childhood for a workforce. Highly qualified, experienced teachers and providers are leaving the field simply because they cannot afford to stay. We have teachers and providers leaving the field due to low wages, and we have families who can't work because they don't have access to safe, affordable, high quality childcare. This leaves families with undesirable options, potentially leaving their child in an unsafe situation or simply removing themselves from the workforce, which has financial implications that can last for generations. This bill would support both early childhood educators and families in Connecticut, which would support Connecticut's workforce and economy. Thank you so much for listening today. I urge you to pass SB 487 now to invest in a better future for the children in our state. Ms. Hagan, thank you so much for your testimony. Appreciate you coming by today. Thank you so much. The next testifier is Louise Lisboa. Good afternoon, Senator Fonfero, Representative Scanlon, and distinguished members of the Finance Committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today in support of SB 487. My name is Louise Lisboa, and I am the Director of the Child Care Business Support Program at the Women's Business Development Council. We are a nonprofit that provides business education to child care providers across the state in partnership with the Connecticut Office of Early Childhood. WBDC has worked with over 2,000 women-owned small businesses and licensed child care providers over the past year, and we're seeing the direct impact the lack of early child care is having. We have an opportunity to allocate the state's rainy day funds to tackle the infant toddler crisis we face. And that's going to have, as you've heard, long-term benefits on the next generation of our leaders and the state's economy. We know there's a slot a shortage of 51,000 slots in the state for infant and toddlers. And this bill is solving one piece of that crisis. You've heard today how birth to three is a key development window that affects a child's ability, ability to succeed in kindergarten and in life. And it gives them the learning development, but also the key skills they need to socialize. But we've spoken to dozens of providers and clients that they've had to turn away families from their wait list due to limits on infant toddler capacity. And families are simply unable to afford the cost of these premium infant toddler slots. That has a direct impact on these providers that are trying to stay open and their employees that are relying on them for a job. We have had staff on my team that before joining WBDC, they had to leave their careers for three years, take a break because they couldn't afford care with their current jobs, right? And that's something that many parents are facing. Thinking about these parents and young moms, we have to do more to support them and build a missing village, if you will. Investing in infant toddler slots can rid mothers of that sense of being alone knowing that there's a spot ready and available for them when their child is born. Parenting already, it is filled with anxiety. There's pressure. You don't know if anyone is there to help you. They aren't able to return to the workforce. This bill can help solve that. It is quite honestly an economic imperative to create these slots in Connecticut, especially for the families in the most vulnerable community, for those children, those parents, that local town's economy. This bill is an investment in our children, in their parents, and keeping the state of Connecticut operating. I urge you to vote in favor of this desperately needed investment. Don't cut it short. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Representative Scanlon. 
The next testifier is Maria Amado. Um, muy buenas tardes con este senador Confara, representa, representantes y el, al senador Marty, representante Chisman y los distinguidos miembros del Comité de Finanzas y de, y de Ingresos. Mi nombre es María Amado, yo soy proveedora de cuidado infantil aquí en el área de, de Hartford y estoy testificando en apoyo al, pro, al proyecto de ley del Senado 487, una ley que establece las iniciativas de apoyo a la familia y al cuidado Ms. Amato, yeah. uh, Representative, do you want to begin to try to serve as a translator for us? Sure. No, oh. so, so. Uh, sí. Amato, yeah, go ahead, Steve. Sí, eh, señor Amato, si quieres, yo puedo traducir para ti, pero okay. un poco más lenta, porque si no, okay. me voy a tragar la lengua. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, muy buenas tardes, senador Fonfara, representante Scalon, distinguidos miembros del Comité de Finanzas de Ingresos. Very good, af good afternoon to the members of the Committee of Bonding, Revenue, and Finance, particularly Senator Fonfara and uh, Representative Scanlon. Okay, sigue. Uh, mi nombre es María Amado. Soy proveedora de cuidado infantil en el hogar aquí en Hartford, Connecticut. She works in Hartford, Connecticut. She's the, she is the... It is Duena. Sí. The, she's the owner of an operator of a uh, childhood uh, care facility in Hartford. And her name is uh, Ms. Zamato. Sigue, es, por favor. Sí, estoy testificando en apoyo del pro, proyecto de ley del Senado 487. Una ley... And she's here to testify in, in favor of Senate Bill 484? 487. Okay. Perfecto que establece la iniciativa del apoyo y la familia del cuidado infantil temprano. That will help in establishing the support for uh, infantile, for, for early childhood uh, education. Este proyecto de ley, la 487, aborda una necesidad del cuidado infantil familiar y de los centros. All right, this, this bill, sorry, 487, sorry about the translation there, 487, will establish further support for early childhood education. En estos años, mi experiencia como proveedora de cuidado infantil, he visto una crisis en las familias. In, in this past years, in my experiences of being a supplier or provider of early childhood education, I've seen a crisis that has come out among the families. Específicamente para pagar el cuidado infantil. Specifically in the uh, ability to pay for early childhood education or, or care. Sabemos que esto todo ha sido documentado últimamente en las manifestaciones que se ha estado dando, las acciones que se han estado ejecutando en este mes. So we, we have seen that this has occurred with all of the different activities, the uh, protests and, 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 and actions by the groups throughout the state in need of this care, of this additional support. Nosotros necesitamos eh, que nuestros programas sigan avanzando a un programa de calidad. Para eso we need that these programs, we need that these programs continue with the right level of progress, with the right level of advance, uh, and for that we need. Para eso necesitamos que el, el Estado invierta, invierta y se designe fondos para nosotros seguir avanzando a nuestro crecimiento profesional. So in order to do this, we need the state to continue to support and to continue and begin to invest further in our programs so that our programs and their development can continue to advance. Esto, como lo digo, esto es un efecto dominó. Los padres necesitan de nosotros. Nosotros necesitamos de los padres. This is a domino effect. We need the parents and the parents need our help or need us. Mientras que hay un cuidado accesible para todos, todos nos vamos a beneficiar. Se van... So that there is a, a accessible access to parents for, for this type of service. We all need that. Sí, sí, por y nuevamente reitero, ¿por qué necesitamos que nos, los programas sean de calidad? Porque vamos a invertir. And so let me repeat, why, why do we need programs that have... Uh, it have a high quality of, of uh, service. 
Sigue. Porque se necesita invertir en estos niños pequeños. Estos niños pequeños son el futuro de la nación. Because we need to invest in our young children. Our young children are the future of our nation. Y esa inversión la necesitamos también las familias, las necesitamos nosotros. And these investments, we need them, are the families, we all need these investments. Nosotros estamos recibiendo un, un salario por debajo del percentil que ofrece, el, eh, que está dentro de, la, de, de los estándares del Estado. So we are receiving a salary that is below what would be the average standards in the state. ¿Cómo, va, ¿Cómo vamos a apoyar un programa de calidad cuando nosotros vamos avanzando y se dé una bonificación por lo menos del 25% a los programas acreditados? How can we continue to maintain a program of quality when we are, okay, 25% de bajo? No, no, no. Nosotros necesitamos un 25% aumento. de bonificación aumento. de aumento a los programas okay. acreditados, a los programas que están ofreciendo ya calidad. Y también un aumento para ayudar a los programas que están en camino al proceso de un programa de calidad. We need an increase of at least 25% to the programs that are currently credited in order that we can begin to move towards further accreditation, I believe is the translation there. Sigue, por favor. Okay. Como miembro del cuidado, de miembro del cuidado de niños para el futuro de Conérico, una organización que reconoce que el esfuerzo de nuestro, de nuestro Estado va a transformar el sistema de una manera eh, en inversión, en tiempo, creatividad por parte de nuestros representantes. Okay. I think it's very important that we, um, we make the investment for the future of our children. That's why I'm a member of this organization, the advancement of the education of children. And el último, por favor. Me, me repite la última frase. Porque es importante que la, la, este, el, el Estado Realmente it's very important that the state, that the state, un sistema. The, okay, that the state organizes and, and presents a system. En, en una este, inversión adecuada para el cuidado infantil. And makes an, an, an adequate investment in the care of our children. Ser innovadores, yo creo que eh, Conérico tiene la oportunidad de ser, estado, de ser un estado innovador. We have the opportunity to be a state with innovation at this moment, uh, en este momento, no? Okay. 30 uh, seconds quiero, to summarize uh, and uh, some representative ministries. Falta 30 segundos para terminar. Okay. Eh, Máximo. Voy a, voy a decir algo muy, muy especial que nos pasa a todas mis colegas hoy día. So I'm going to say something special that happens or specific that happens to all of my colleagues every day. Okay. Hoy día llamé a una familia porque el niño, el bebé de... 16 meses estaba vomitando. Esta mamá. Today she, today she had to call a, a, a family with a child who's 18 months old who, who the baby was sick and he was vomiting. Esta okay. mamá es joven, es estudiante y trabaja. Tuvo que salir. This woman, la this, the, 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 the mother is a student. She's studying and she's working. She had to leave. Tiene que salir qué? Se tuvo, tuvo que salir de sus clases de la universidad. She had to leave from her classes in the university para recoger a su niño. to, to uh, pick up her child. Entonces, ella se preocupa, ¿cómo te voy a pagar si voy a tener que cuidar a mi niño? Right, so she has to worry now, how is she going to take, if she has to take care of her child, how is she going to be able to pay for her, her care if she can't work? You know, puede ser ¿no? Entonces, el cuidado infantil familiar, ¿qué es lo que hace? No cobra esos días que los niños no vienen en esta situación porque el niño está enfermo. Una madre que trabaja so, estudia. And so the problem for the centers is that if, if a parent pulls the child out because he's sick and they have to take care of him at home, the centers are not compensated, so they lose the revenue for those days. Y en consecuencia, yo pierdo. And the consequence of that is that she loses economically for that. So, perfecto. Y más? Ms. Gracias. Um, okay, thank you. Ms. Amato, thank you for your testimony today. 
Gracias por tu testimonio hoy. Okay. And, and you're welcome. for highlighting the end of your story, which I think all of us have in mind today. Y al final de tu, tu cuente que ya nos va a quedar con todos nosotros hoy en día. And thank you to Representative Meskers for stepping in as you did last year so well and translating for us. Uh, thank you, Steve. That was great. You're welcome. No problem. Bye-bye. Next up, Bree. I echo that gratitude for Representative Meskers. Thank you. Um, and the next testifier we have is Brandon Hayden. Hi, thank you. And I also uh, echo that, Representative Meskers. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, Senator Fonfero, Representative Scanlon, Senator Martin, Representative Cheeseman, and members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Brandon Hayden, and I serve as the Policy Director for the Connecticut Cradle to Career Coalition, which is made up of four partnerships that are part of the National Strive Together Movement, Bridgeport Prospers, Norwalk Act, Stanford Cradle to Career, and Waterbury Bridge to Success. We are a collective impact partnership that acts as a network of community members, organizations, and institutions that advance equity by learning together, aligning, and integrating our actions to achieve population and systems level change to improve outcomes for approximately 15% of youth in the state. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 487, an act establishing the infant and toddler early care and family support initiative. Uh, a lot of our work is centered around the prenatal three space where we recognize that there is no evidence that any one single action, support or intervention will result in the level of family and systems change imagined for our youngest population. In Bridgeport, for example, the birth the their birth three community action team proposed an innovative values anchored science informed baby bundle ecosystem. Uh, the framework is anchored in the neuroscience trauma to resilience along with a bundle of comprehensive whole family supports and practices represents the sweeping systematic change effort to equip young children and their families in Connecticut's largest city with supports they need to thrive. Increasing infant and, to and toddler care and supports for families is one of the key bundle components, which they'll work towards. Uh, this work focuses on the research that the first three years of life are crucial for brain development and children enrolled in high quality infant toddler care. Uh, can be a very big catalyst for on-target development. Uh, data from 2020 shows that in Bridgeport, there's approximately um, a population of about 7,315 infants and toddlers with an infant and toddler stock capacity of 1,015, which is only around 13%. Uh, the impact of a lack of infant toddler care has a detrimental impact on parents, children, and the economy. The current low payment levels for high quality care have prevented providers from filling the infant toddler care gap as this is for several years in Bridgeport. Um, I know we talked about Bridgeport today, but a lot of our partners work in the early childhood space and see the gaps that are in our infant toddler care. Um, so in closing, I urge the committee to fully support SB uh, 487, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Hayden, for your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next testifier is Monica Bellier. Thank you. Uh, Senator Fonfara, Representative Scanlon, members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. M I'm Monica Bellier. I'm a parent. I'm the chair of Middletown School Readiness Council, and I'm the organizer of the Opportunity Knox Collaborative, which is Middletown's early health and learning initiative. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate Bill 487. This bill represents a long overdue investment in care for our youngest children. I'm gonna be brief as I know you've already heard from many early childhood experts today regarding the importance of the bill. Um, but Middlesex Health is an early Head Start home visiting partner. And we work with, our home visitors work with families who have children ages birth to three and who are also very low income. That's a qualification for Early Head Start. So the main issue that we've heard from parents who are looking to go to work is that they can't find care for their babies, or if they do find care, they can't afford to pay for it. Our, our families have access in Middletown to the Care for Kids subsidy, but there are no Early Head Start classrooms and there are no Early Head Start family child care partners. And there's also no state funded child development centers. So with little other choice, families often rely on family, friends, and neighbors to piece together some kind of mishmash of care, or they delay returning to work until their child is eligible for preschool. 
these scenarios aren't good for families, for their babies, or frankly, for the economy. So as you deliberate and prioritize where to invest our tax dollars, I want to encourage you to consider this bill along with other workforce and economic impacts. So undoubtedly, it's a social good and it's the right thing to do for our citizens. It, excuse me, it's also an employer subsidy. High quality, affordable infant and toddler care is essential to getting our workforce back to work. And over the long term, it's crucial to our children's growth, healthy development, and their success in life. Thanks for again for this bill, for the opportunity to testify. And I'm hopeful that we'll finally prioritize an industry that is fundamental to our residents and to our economy in so many ways. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. The next testifier is Deb Poland. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the record, my name is Deb Polin. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Association for Community Action, or CAFCA. We're the state association that works with um, our state's nine community action agencies, which are our anti-poverty agencies. And I'm so grateful to the committee for having this hearing today uh, so that we can provide supportive testimony regarding Senate Bill 487. So thank you for introducing that bill and for trying to tackle the issue around the affordability and accessibility of childcare. We have been um, really pleased to see um, that this issue, which has been percolating as one that needs assistance from the state and from the business community has finally uh, reached a level of awareness in our state that there are multiple efforts to try to fix our system. And the paradox is that parents are paying so much for childcare, a big proportion of their income, um, parents and caregivers, that is, for childcare. And yet, our childcare workers are not making um, a living wage. And the importance to childcare development that these workers have is. Um, it's, it's hard to overstate. So we wanna make sure that our childcare workers are earning a good wage and that parents can afford it. This bill is a creative solution to the problem that, that is before us. It can help to stabilize an industry and grow slots where they're particularly where they're needed. Um, we know how many areas of the state have childcare deserts or a slim number of slots available given uh, the need. And so we're really grateful for this bill and for a creative solution to this initiative. Um, one thing I would say is that we would ask that you try to expand this to age five as well. It's great to create the infant and toddler slots, but we're worried that those slots will then go away when kids turn three and then the parents will be back in the same situation that they were in before. They're not gonna leave their kids home so that they can work. And so we could be putting parents back in that situation of struggling to find stable, high quality childcare for their kids after they turn three. So um, that would be our recommendation. If you can find it in you to extend to age five, um, that would be great. And again, thank you for your attention to this, for seeking a creative solution to the childcare issue and um, all, as always for your service to our state. Hi Deb, um, I see a question for you from Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Deb, good to see you. Good, good to see you as well. Good. Yeah, hear you agency do such a great job, my friend Deb Monahan with TVCCA. So question for you, let's assume that this bill is passed, that the funding is there. How confident are you that you're gonna be able to find the workforce to actually staff these centers? Because I know, you know you're well aware of the huge you know, workforce shortage we have. Um, I'm, I'm facing it at my nonprofit, you know, I, I've upped the amount, I'm paying all those things. So talk to us about your confidence that with the increased funding, the better benefits, all those things, you're actually gonna find the bodies to put this into place because my frustration and fear is we'll put this, but there simply aren't the people for whatever reason who can fill those slots. So I'd love, love to hear your read on this. Thank you so much for bringing up the workforce issue, Representative Cheeseman, because you've really hit on something there. I'm not confident that this one bill will be the solution to the workforce issue. 
We see um, fewer people going into early childhood education right now. Um, and so we know that we can't fix the workforce issue with just a one shot bill. But um, I am confident that with a sustainable funding source that this bill creates over time, we can provide a level of wages and benefits for childcare workers that will make the field more appealing again to people who are interested in educating our youngest people and helping to mold our next generation. So yeah, I don't think it's a silver bullet, but I do think it goes a long way towards helping to um, shift the industry towards one that is a more appealing um, industry for people to enter. Right. And I know, again, very often we as a legislature look at you know, particular industries, you know, in the, uh, in the view toward upping standards, actually create barriers to people entering. So can you touch on that? Because I believe we did uh, sort of increase the qualifications necessary for teachers. I, you're at the pointy end. And if we're going to fix this, you're, the voices of people like you, before we try and fix it in a way that's actually going to make it harder for you, need, need to, uh, you know, you have our attention. So I'd love you to touch on that and anything you think in, in the shorter term to, you know, to provide that encouragement for people to enter the career that, that we could do in conjunction with people like you. Thank you. Yes, we did increase the standards and the qualifications for being the head teacher in an early childhood classroom. And um, so I think for certain classrooms, we're actually requiring a bachelor's degree now, which uh, is great for our kids because those kids are going to be in a classroom with somebody who's really, really qualified to help them um, learn at the earliest ages when there's so much that they take in like sponges. On the other hand, what that did was it put those bachelor's degrees holders in the position of taking an, a, a higher paying, better benefit position in a public school system and being as part of the teacher retirement system. So, you know, a lot of policy initiatives have pros and cons. So I think um, having a combination of teachers in an early childhood classroom who have those qualifications and those who don't, you know, I think is what makes the most sense. We know, and I've heard so many of um, the previous folks today talk about the need for cuddling with babies, play, um, reading to children, and some of those things don't require that much education. They require compassion. They require a love of learning, a love of being around kids. And so I think we do need to have a mix of people in each uh, preschool classroom to make sure that we can make childcare high quality, but also keep it affordable and accessible for people. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much for your insight and uh, yeah. thank you. my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Scanlon. I think you're still running the show here. Thank you, Representative, and thank you, Deb, for being here today. Sure thing. The next testifier is Sarah Lee Lewison Joseph. Thank you. Good afternoon. Senator Fonferro, Representative Scanlon, Honorable Ranking Members, and dis Distinguished Members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Sarah Lee Lisa Joseph and I live in East Hartford. I have a son who attends the Academy of Computer Science and Engineering from a Two Rivers Magnet School in East Hartford, which is a Craig Magnet School. Thank you for raising SB 485 to support Craig in implementing much needed capital improvements for our schools. I am asking you to please support this much needed funding and mechanism for Craig. Just a little story about my son. He benefits greatly from attending the Craig Magnet, Magnet School. My son, who is currently in eighth grade at ACSD, is on the autism spectrum. Despite his challenges, he has been able to and continue to excel from the time he entered the Magnet School system in the sixth grade. I remember clearly at one of my son's fifth grade parent-teacher conference at a city public school, one of the teachers told me that I needed to get my son out of the school and into a different school setting because this setting would lead to regression. At that moment, it was flight or fight because there is no way I would watch my son regress. I was hoping that the correct lottery would come through even though it didn't for the previous six years. 
I started looking into private schools, although financially it would have been tough. I even considered moving to a different town. But God answered my prayers and he got accepted into Two Rivers Magnet School. The team at Two Rivers is amazing. They've used his strengths to help in his areas of weakness, which has yielded great success. They have incorporated different strategies to build on his social and leadership skills. The curriculum is different, and I'm not sure if it is luck, but the classes offered at this school, such as hydroponics, creative writing journey, choice in design, computer science, have enabled my son to flourish, and he has exceeded the expectations of many. He has been a model student throughout, and I could not be prouder of him and grateful for the team at ACSC Middle School. To continue to create thriving students on the spectrum, or whether they're not on the spectrum, teachers alone will not do the job. The building where all the cultivating of great students happen also need updating and care. Currently, there are five out of the eight in Kirk operated schools that are over 20 years old and need repairs as soon as next year. We need you to support SB 485 which provides the much needed funding for capital improvements for these aging schools. Please support SB 485 and create this important mechanism to cover Kirk's capital improvements. Thank you. Thank you for being here this morning and for, or I guess it's afternoon now, but thank you for being here today uh, and for your testimony. I appreciate it. Yes, thank, thank you. you. The next testifier is Tim Sullivan. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Fonfera and Representative Scanlon. My name is Tim Sullivan. I am the superintendent of the Crack Magnet Schools, and I'm here to speak today on behalf of our 8,500 students who hail from 77 different towns. We're here today in support of uh, Senate Bill 485. As you've heard from our students and our, our parents, uh, the Crack schools mean a lot to them. Um, oftentimes those schools are be become their respite, their place where they can go and feel confident. When we built those schools, um, we did not feel, we failed to do two things. I've been in the magnet school business for quite some time. <clears throat> when we built the magnet schools, we failed on two counts. One is we did not create a sustainable funding formula that would allow the schools to last for a long time. And the second is that we did not um, anticipate the capital improvement needs. We have uh, Senate Bill 227 and House Bill 5283 are designed to address the long-term sustainability issue in terms of the funding. Uh, the capital improvements plan problem is something that I bring before you here today. My wife, Emily, and I bought a house in Hartford uh, 29 years ago. During the course of those 29 years, we've put on a new roof, we've replaced the furnace, we've replaced the water heater twice. Um, that's part of what comes with being a homeowner. And so you have to plan for that. When we built these schools, we forget, failed to realize that CREC does not have any bonding authority. We don't have an electorate to go to um, to get re major repairs done on the buildings. So as our buildings are approaching their 20th year, we're worried that there's gonna be some major improvements and major repairs that are not gonna get done. Unfortunately, we don't have a bonding authority to go to. What we have is you. So we're asking that you support Senate Bill 485 to provide correct magnet schools with a process to create capital improvement plan and authorizes bond funds towards these much needed capital improvement projects. You also see that education committee voted out similar language in section five of Senate bill 429. We welcome the opportunity to work with you and the education committee to pass a bill that will allow CREC to properly maintain the investment that you have made in our children and develop capital improvements, funding and planning mechanism for our magnet schools. We're thankful you're, for your support. Last, I'd just like to say that this morning we were at the ribbon cutting for the Academy, the Anna Grace Academy of Arts in Bloomfield. It's a brand new building. It's wonderful. Kids are lucky to be able to go there and we appreciate what you've done for them. What we need to do is we need to put a plan in now that will work for them 20 years from now when they need a new roof or a new furnace. So please help us get this bill passed so that we can have a plan in place to maintain our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. I saw Representative Borer's hand was up and she disappeared. Oh, she's back. Representative <laughs> Sorry, thank you uh, for allowing me to go bounce from meetings. Thank you, uh, Chairman Scanlon. And thank you, Tim, for being here. 
Um, I agree that we need to invest in our magnet schools. It's a great opportunity for our students to really explore, you know, areas that are um, of interest to them. And um, I think they've been a great way for educations um, that are in specific fields. My question to you, um, I agree we need to support them, but my question is on the process. So this is a bill that would create a different process for funding capital needs of schools different than the process we currently have for all our other schools. Is there a reason why this would be different? So the, the, there's no real mechanism for us to apply for repair money. We have a, we have a bonding uh, system that we go through to get the initial construction, but we don't really have a process in place that allows us to go anywhere other than operating funds to create uh, the money we need to, to do some of the major repairs and upgrades. So this will be the first time that we're able to do that with this mechanism that you have in front of you today. So, um, so I've been involved a few years. I'm not, I don't know all of the history. Have, have the magnet schools through CREC not received bonding funds before? You know, I'm going to, the, the next speaker, Dr. Florio, is going to um, speak to some of the same issues. And I think I'll defer to him on that because his, his work is more related directly to the um, the bonding and, and how that is going to work, the mechanism. My, my real point of being here today is to say that our schools are valuable and we need something to be able to get these repairs done. Well then, well then your point is well taken. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Cheeseman. The mouse was being naughty. Um, thank you very much for being here. And I may defer my questions as well to the next speaker. My question to you, you know, obviously I've got a risk in my part of the state learn and whether this problem is unique to crack or whether this is something that we need to address statewide with regards to providing a funding stream for, you know, capital improvements, repairs in our existing magnet schools. Yeah, so Dr. Florio, who sits on the RESC Alliance, along with LEARN, um, was probably in a better position to, to speak to what the other RESCs are, are confronting. We do know that if you're a host magnet, where you're part of, your magnet school is part of your town, there's a different mechanism in place than if you're a RESC run magnet. So I'll let Dr. Florio address the needs of the other RESCs. All right, I'll look forward to those answers, and thank you for coming today and talking to us. Thank you, Chairman Scanlon. Thank, thank you for having me. All right, we will move on to the next person. The next testifier is Greg Florio. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Senator Fonfara, Representative Scanlon, honorable members uh, of the Finance, Revenue and Bonding Committee. I am Greg Florio and I'm here to testify, but I think I'm also here to answer some questions that were lingering uh, and hopefully I can do that. But I do wanna thank you for raising SB 485 uh, which does authorize the issuance of bonds and formalizes a planning and funding mechanism for capital improvements to our buildings. And I don't wanna repeat everything that uh, my colleague, Tim Sullivan just said. So, you know, I, I just wanna reiterate that as a RESC, we do not have bonding authority. If we were to, and we have had to in the past, absorb some significant uh, infrastructure improvements to some of our schools, our only mechanism for paying for that uh, would be to charge the sending districts. Um, and as we build, as the buildings age, that uh, leaves us with one of two choices or a combination is we can, you know, cut services that we're providing to children to fund those repairs, or we can increase the bills that we're sending to those districts or some combination of those two. And that's not a good thing for the students in our, our, our schools. And it will also impact the sending districts and possibly impact programming for, for those districts. So what we're asking for is a mechanism similar to what is used for the uh, Connecticut Technical Education and Career System schools, the VOTEC schools in the state, uh, to have a line item that would fully fund a five-year capital plan that we would work in conjunction with SDE and uh, DAS uh, to um, determine what needs we have at our buildings. And as Tim said, you know, we opened up a brand new facility today, but 20 something years ago, there were some magnet schools that probably had a similar ceremony and now 20 years later need this to be addressed. Um, 
the, the school construction process um, does not necessarily work for us. Um, many of the expenses that we would incur um, are not reimbursable under that program, but they are still significant in their amount. Um, some of them that would be reimbursed would not be reimbursed at 100%, which would still leave us uh, a need to bill um, sending districts for the district uh, for the difference. So we're hoping that um, with this uh, SB 485, that that mechanism will be put in place uh, to address and, and really invest in what has been a significant state investment in our magnet schools. Um, and I, I know there were some other questions and I'll cut my comments short and answer any others that are out there. Representative Borer, filed by Representative Cheeseman. Thank you, Chairman Scanlon. And thank you, Greg. Um, so I'm trying to understand what the process would be. It, would the schools go through a priority list? Um, would they be fleshed out through a priority list like our other schools do through school construction? We, we would be working with DAS and SDE on a five-year capital plan. And um, we would reassess that plan every year. And this line item would fund the repairs that would be deemed necessary through that plan. So for example, one of our older schools may need a new roof that would be in year two of the plan and the funding would be available to get that done um, on that five-year basis. And we would continue to review and work with, again, the state on that plan to make sure that we're doing the necessary and needed repairs. So it would not be through a priority list. It would be through a, a, line, a bonded line item. A bonded line item and a and a plan that is approved by DAS is you're created in partnership with DAS, but ultimately the state has approval. Who has final approval? I, I would be DAS and and again SDE. It would not just be correct saying we want to do this. We would put that plan forward. We develop that plan. We've shared the first few years of that plan, and then we would work in conjunction with them to prioritize those, and and you know undertake the work uh, within the amount that we would be allowed in a given period of time to you know, complete projects. Okay, and then you mentioned 100% funding. So are you suggesting that the schools that are on the priority list that you and CREC agreed to be funded at 100%? Yes, because again, anything that is not funded by the state, we would then have to build the sending districts that difference um, and again, some of the work that would be, need to be done. So for example, a roof might be reimbursable through that priority list, but a lot of the work that we're looking at is not something that a town would normally apply for through the school construction program. So it wouldn't be reimbursable, um, but it's still a significant amount of money for repaving or updating flooring or certain HVAC work might not be reimbursable. And that amount would then have to be charged to our sending districts. Okay, I, I understand the need for, you know, continuing to improve and address the capital needs. I just wanna, just a little concerned about the process, given all the discussion around school construction, I wanna make sure there's, you know, a proper procedure in place for prioritization and funding. And, um, you know, it's going through all the proper channels and wanna make sure it goes through all the bid process, everything that we're trying to address today that we don't treat the correct schools any different and then, it gets messy. No, I mean, we would still be follow the same requirements um, again for the bidding and awarding of contracts and the like. And again, working through DAS every step of the way. Okay, I, I have more questions, but I think I could either ask them offline or maybe ask more later. Thank you. Representative Cheeseman followed by Senator Funfara. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Florio. So my, getting back to my original question, is this a problem faced just by CREC or is this something that is also a significant issue for the other RESCs? Um, and I, I mentioned my, my local one, Learn. I know they've recently converted um, a synagogue to hand, uh, for their special needs students. And I wondered how they, how they finance that. So if you could shed some light on this, I'd be grateful. So I, I, again, I, I, our magnet schools are provided, you know, again, under the CHEF agreement, working with the State Department of Education, 
to fulfill that obligation. Every other magnet school, even some run by RESCs, have different partnership agreements. So depending on the agreement, um, it might be a shared cost between the state and the, the districts that are partnered to the magnet schools. Um, I don't know the specifics of the LEARN or any of the other RESC magnet schools, um, but I would say there probably are some that in the future would need similar support to get capital projects done. Um, you know, I, I, again, I don't know this, the age of their buildings or again, the specific partnership agreements that they have, but I, I certainly could see that there are some buildings that would need this type of support in the future in other uh, areas of the state. Sure, it'd be, and obviously this is specific to crack today, but be interested, and maybe this is a conversation with SDE going forward to see if while we're doing this, we should look at providing an avenue. And you know, that Representative Moore mentioned, you know, we have an existing structure. Is there a way to devise something to treat the magnet schools in a way that's fair to them, but also fair to the existing schools? So. Thank you for your answers today, and uh, thank you, Chairman Scanlon. I'll take it. Um, uh, Greg, uh, thanks for testifying. I didn't hear um, the beginning um, of your testimony, but um, it, or, or, or from Tim's prior to you, was there any reference to this need uh, included in the settlement that we just um, let become law or become accepted by the legislature? Um, I, I do not believe there was any um, anything specific to capital needs um, or even what Tim discussed about sustainability in that agreement, no. Uh, I'm tempted to want to um, know whether or not that's a, a, a part of the settlement that um, we could define uh, going forward. I mean, it'll be 30, as I understand, it'll be three, $30 million a year for the next 10 years. Um, and uh, you can't perform the work if you don't have buildings that are functional. Um. And I know I, I'm not asking you to tread in areas that you you feel you shouldn't, um, but it certainly is uh, difficult for us to look at this in separate silos. Um, um, it's all part of uh, the obligation. Well, and, and if I could, and again, I don't want to get too deep into this, but I, I will say that my focus for the last few years has been on the sustainability of existing program issues and that we needed to address those issues such as capital improvements for existing buildings. And that has been our focus, um, you know, in the last few years and, and our biggest concern. All right, thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Representative Metzgers. Yeah, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, <clears throat> Without putting any monkey wrenches into the, the issues, I, you know, I think we have to look at the magnet schools and we look at the capital investments. The only thing that concerns me is, is an understanding of, of the agreements and the association with the magnet schools to make sure that the ownership of the physical assets in, and who is a beneficiary. So if we have to step up for investments, I wanna make sure that the assets either belong to the states or the municipalities where those assets are invested or that there is some claim on them. Uh, the, if the buildings are reaching their useful life and have to be rebuilt, the question of ownership needs to be one that needs to be investigated as well. Um, again, I, the, the rule of thumb would be if the building ceased to uh, operate as a magnet school um, and it was under the age of 20, it would revert back to the state um, but, you know, I, as I've said, I, you know, these buildings have been built in partnership with the State Department of Education. They've been designed to function as magnet schools. I don't see that changing. Um, the other thing is that the RESCs are technically owned by the member districts so that if, 
assets were to be, if we cease to exist, the assets technically would belong to the member districts. Okay, that would be basically, so you've allayed my concern. So that's where I'm sitting, right? I want to make sure that further investments are duly documented and, and maintained, right? Yeah. So thank you very much. All right. Seeing no further questions, Ms. Florio, thank you for being here today. And we're going to move thank on you. to the next person. Our next testifier is Senator Kathy Austin. Hey, everybody. How are you? Welcome to the Other Money Committee, Senator Austin. Glad to have you here today. <laughs> It's a pleasure to talk with you all today. Um, I actually am working on the expenditure side uh, of the budget. You've had a few of our, our people on this particular committee that would, um, that would, uh, th that would be uh, my other committee saying, I need to come back and talk to them, but I, they have to wait. So <laughs> you got, right now you guys are the important ones. Um, so, uh, you actually were talking to some people that will eventually be coming to us to figure out uh, how we would be spending some of the money relative to early childhood. But I appreciate all the work that you guys do. Um, so I'm here today to talk about the bond authorization for uh, the Small Town Economic Assistance Program and uh, would like to see us get to the point where we're authorizing about $30 million a year in this. This program was patterned after Urban Act and was never designed to have either a cap on it or, um, uh, or to be um, limited to uh, 128,000. It was up to 500,000. Most small towns, in particular small towns um, relative to my district are between three and 7,000 people. They're not up to even the 30,000. And by limiting it to only 128,000, which was done without input by the legislature, uh, was done uh, through guidelines that the Office of Policy Management set up, did not have any input from um, the legislative branch. Uh, it does not allow for a single project to ever get accomplished. Um, and it also said that you couldn't get a federal grant um, to use as a match for this. And many small towns, in particular, those with poverty can apply through the uh, USDA, USRDA, uh, and can get grants that will augment um, those dollars. In particular, if you're doing water and sewer, uh, building a fire department, uh, uh, doing things along those lines. And so I wanna make sure that um, other resources can be used as a um, uh, as uh, a component of uh, a project and not be barred from using it as a component of the, um, uh, of the project. And I'd like to see us increase this dollar amount up to $1 million. I did see prior testimony from, I think it was uh, John Elliser uh, that said 750,000, but um, if you look at the cost of construction just to maintain what it was originally designed for, uh, we have to go up above the 500,000 and not get it down to only 128,000, which does not allow a small town uh, to complete any project because no matter where you live, no matter what town you live in, a road is a road is a road and roads are expensive to repair, bridges are expensive to repair. As a former first selectman in the town of Sprague, I brought in over $31 million in grants and aid to that town to deal with a lot of the issues that they had. They had 40 years of never working on any of the infrastructure within the town itself. Uh, and so I, um, I would appreciate your consideration in establishing procedures for the steep grant and requiring it to come out. Uh, I'd like to see it on a yearly basis. And the grants always have been competitive in nature. Uh, I think that that's fine, uh, but uh, that's something um, I would like to see. And I appreciate your uh, allowing me to come and testify on what looks to be a very busy day for all of you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here this morning, Senator. Appreciate your testimony. I don't see any questions though, so thank you. I think that's great. And so I'm gonna go back to work on the other side of the budget 
and I look forward to talking with you guys um, uh, in a little bit. See you soon. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. Thank you, Senator. The next testifier we have is Barbara Vita. Senator Fonfera, Representative Scanlon, members of the Finance Committee. My name is Barbara Vita and I live in Bloomfield. I am the coordinator of the Connecticut Children's Collective, the state's intermediary organization that connects local early childhood collaboratives to the SDE and OEC. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of SB 487. From birth, in the next three years, a baby's brain will grow 80%. The rate and success of growing a brain that is receptive to learning, emotional regulation, and a healthy body is determined by their environment. Right from the start, babies begin forming synapses. Synapses are what connect neurons in our brains. Without synapses, neurons don't connect, and the potential for learning and growth diminishes. Basically, the synapses says to the neurons, let's connect. We'll do great things together. So imagine, if you will, a synapse takes the hand of one neuron and takes the hand of another neuron and joins their hands together. As the neurons mature, more and more synapses are made. At birth, the number of synapses per neuron is 2,500, but by age two or three, it's about 15,000 per neuron. By age three, the synaptic connection has grown to 1,000 trillion. This is the best case scenario. If a baby is cared for and loved, read to, sung to, touched, and spoken to, these actions are what spark these, the, those synapses to fire and connect those neurons. In Connecticut, there is a need for roughly 50,000 slots for infant and toddler care in our child care system. The ratio for infant and child care is four babies to one caregiver. This translates to high cost for parents to provide childcare for their babies as they return to work and high costs for childcare providers, which ultimately translates to very low wages for the caregivers. So without these slots, parents can't work or they are forced to leave their infants in care that is not high quality. And that worries me. What happens when a baby is kept in a crib or a playpen all day? What happens when a baby is left in a stroller or a car seat all day? What happens when those babies start to cry and no one picks them up to soothe them or feed them or change their diapers? What happens if the baby is surrounded by yelling or is yelled at themselves? What happens is that the synapses don't introduce the neurons to each other and the baby's brain doesn't grow as it should. The baby will have difficulty bonding, self-regulating emotions, learning, walking, and these effects, if not addressed, will last a lifetime. These are what we know now to be ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. This act will create an opportunity for all of our Connecticut babies and toddlers to have the opportunity to grow up healthy and happy in safe and loving environments. We are at a crossroads right now, one that boils down to morality, not money. Are we a civilized society that agrees that we protect first our most vulnerable? because these babies are innocent and helpless and looking for us for help. Parents want what is best for their children, of course they do, but parents often do what they have been taught or what they've experienced. Let's pass this bill so we can provide higher quality infant and toddler care so parents can work and provide and providers can pay their staff a living wage. But let's also pass this bill so that we can provide family supports to parents who need extra coaching and education so they can learn about their developing baby and then do better. ACEs is largely generational. We have the ability with this act to help ameliorate the living, the lived trauma and begin to heal our society. You will see fewer cases of violence. You will see more school success. You will see healthier, both physical and mental, children and families. You will see a thriving society that has children and adults contributing in a positive way. You will see innovation and growth. I urge you to pass SB 487, an act establishing the infant and toddler early care and family support initiative. Start Connecticut's transformation at the beginning. It's a really good place to start. I leave you with Frederick Douglass's famous quote, it's easier to build strong children than, re than to repair broken men. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Vita, for your testimony today. I see a question from Senator Fonfara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. It's more of a 
comment on Ms. Vita's testimony. Um, you put into words um, much of what floats around in my head um, in terms of the potential of this legislation and, and the use of these dollars. Um, and I'm grateful for you taking time today to, uh, to share your perspective with the committee. Um, there's no doubt in, in my mind, and I think for most here, <clears throat> that an investment from birth to three will pay far greater dividends than these dollars being invested as much as I argued for and, and we were successful as a legislature in passing to have these dollars be dedicated towards um, uh, in mid-year corrections should we find ourselves short. But um, this is a investment in people in life uh, journeys. And as you correctly described better than I, um, th this is about um, providing opportunity for many children, unfortunately too many children in our state who don't have that opportunity today. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Caveat. Thank you, Ms. Vita, for being here today. Okay. The next testifier is Ron Lizzie. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Ron Litzy. I'm an author and engineer from Bethany. I have advocated for reform of the unclaimed property program for years. My work has been cited in news reports and has led to changes in Connecticut and Colorado. I support SB 379 and SB 486, both acts concerning unclaimed property but they fall far short of the reform needed for the program. My written testimony provides specific recommendations based on the best practices of other states. For example, Rhode Island has been automatically sending checks to individuals without requiring claims since 2017. And they recently expanded that practice to include businesses and nonprofits. Their treasurer uses taxpayer and other state data to determine an owner's current address. California automatically returns unclaimed money belonging to municipalities. Missouri has paid millions of dollars in past due child support by matching cases with owners of unclaimed money. Connecticut should do all of those things. Both bills focus on newly acquired properties owned by individuals. Instead, the bills should facilitate the return of all new and existing properties with some minimum value to all known owners, people, businesses, nonprofits, and municipalities. SB 379 says that the treasurer may pay known owners or may seek an owner's address. Instead, it should compel the treasurer to seek all owners' addresses and pay them when possible. SB 486 calls for the treasurer and other agencies to mail notices to owners, but the state should send checks, not notices. A recent editorial in Hearst Newspapers said that the unclaimed property program has been clearly dysfunctional. I agree. Connecticut is not making a good faith effort to return unclaimed money, which totals over $1 billion. The state is unethically pocketing money that it could easily return. Thank you for your efforts on this issue. I welcome any questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lizzie, uh, thank you so much for being here today and for your testimony uh, and work on this issue. I see some questions. So we'll start with Representative Mashinsky and then we'll go to Representative Zupkis. Organizations like that would rather be. Hi, uh, Ron, thank you for coming in. Uh, I had this experience myself. I, I moved from one street to another street in my same town. I'm a, I'm a public official. People know I, I still live here. And yet uh, my security deposit for electric service was turned over to the unclaimed uh, account. And uh, I had to turn, I had to keep turning in more and more paperwork to prove I was the same person who uh, had the account. And I finally gave up because there was so much paperwork to be sent in. And then they would ask me for another piece and another piece. I, I must've talked to them six times 
and sent six different documents. And I never, I never got the money back. And I just finally gave up on it and moved on to something else. The amount of time I was spending was not worth the amount of money I would get back for my own uh, security deposit. So you're right, we should do better. And uh, one technical obstacle, perhaps, I could ask you about this. Do you think there's a technical obstacle in that uh, there are two different computer systems involved here? So that if you were trying to get the current address, you'd have to use the DRS computer uh, and then try to match it up with the unclaimed deposits where, which are in a different computer. That's, that's quite possible, and it's a good point. Um, one thing that might uh, solve the problem is something that the state of Wisconsin did. They actually took the program away from their state treasurer entirely and moved it into their Department of Revenue so that they don't have that problem. So if they have money for you, they, they check to see if you paid taxes within the last year, if you owe back taxes, they take your money. And if you don't, they send you a check. Okay. So now, sorry. What, what I'd also like to comment on your, your experience, um, the, the difficulty you had in making a claim. I've heard that quite a few times. It's, I think it's a fairly common experience. Uh, one question I have um, for the treasurer is, what is the standard of proof that they need? Is, are they looking for proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the criminal standard, or just a preponderance of the evidence? Uh, you know, in, in many cases, it seems like they're being, uh, uh, I'll try to think of a, of a nice word, uh, persnickety. Uh, I'm not sure I've used that word uh, lately, but um, it seems that uh, they're not uh, too friendly to their customers, um, perhaps because their customers can't go uh, somewhere else. But uh, I think the, um, the claims process has been uh, too difficult. And if, mm -hmm. if you can't claim your money and it belongs to you, that is a failure. And that problem needs to be fixed. Well, I agree. I, I'm just thinking the technical issue might be the reason why we can't uh, do better. So that's a good suggestion you have about maybe merging the two into one agency. Good suggestion. Well, I can tell you that um, right now, I believe there are nine states that automatically return money. So somehow they've gotten around the problem. And certainly um, uh, every year, this program is taking in over $100 million uh, a year. So um, there is money available to, uh, to fix that problem if need be. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Lizzie, for coming in. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Senator Fontero. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hi, Ron. It's nice to see you. Thank you for being here today. And um, I just really wanted to comment and say thank you. Thank you for your persistence. I know you and I have been on this for a long time. It seems like forever. Um, I've made a little bit of progress and hopefully now we can really make big strides. Um, and I just appreciate you and your knowledge and sharing that and educating me on um, this process. And um, hopefully we can get it across the finish line. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks for your comment and, and thanks for your past help. Um, I know there, there was a bill, you're probably aware of it, in the GAE committee that just codified the recent change to remove the $50 threshold. Um, I hope that um, we can have some further reform. Um, as I mentioned previously, other states are automatically sending out checks. Rhode Island does that. They've been doing it since 2017. Um, they've sent um, millions of dollars um, and we should be doing the same. And not just to individuals as, as the bills call for, but also to businesses and nonprofits and municipalities as we've tried in the past. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity for doing better than these bills, but yeah. 
it's nice to see some progress being made. It is. Thank you. And I think everybody and anybody could use a little help these days with the prices of gas and food. And uh, I know you pointed out my family, we have money sitting there and didn't even know it as well. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming today. Thank you. Senator von Farley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lizzie, uh, I don't know if you testified to this. Are you, have you taken a position on 486? Uh, yes, yes, I have. I support it, although uh, it also doesn't go far enough. Well, one of the big problems I see with 486 is that it calls for notices going out uh, or being sent to owners, and that's okay, but the better option is to send checks, as other states are doing. Well, we would have included that in our bill if, if we had confidence that sending those checks we're going to be going to the proper addresses as opposed to assuming that we know the address of, the, of those individuals. Well, what other states do is they don't use the addresses that come with the properties. They, they use other state databases to check on the addresses, whether it's tax data or voter data or motor vehicle data or in the case of businesses, corporate registrations. So um, other states use current state data to verify the correct address. And if they're confident that the address is correct, then they send out a check. Uh, now, so what some states do is first they send a letter, and if the letter does not come back as undeliverable, then they send a check. Yeah. I I, there are people who, um, Americans are pretty mobile as a lot. And, um, and um, I, you know, in certain populations, they're unfortunately very mobile. And so um, um, I, I would think that having greater certainty, I, I don't disagree with your, your, recommendation of sending out checks. I think the treasurer's office needs to be far more proactive than they are. Um, and the treasurer's bill, which is up today has some advancements, but I think we can go a lot further in uh, reuniting folks with um, their property. Um, and, um, and, and so I, I look forward to having further discussion if we can, if we can, uh, uh, bring this closer to what you're recommending in a way that that we have confidence that those checks are going to the right address. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and if I may comment on that, if you lack confidence, I would encourage you to get in touch with states that are that have programs like this. Rhode Island is a good one. Uh, Wisconsin also, I uh, previously mentioned. Uh, North Carolina started doing this recently. They also uh, send a letter first. And then if the letter is not returned as undeliverable, then they send a check a few weeks later. So um, when I last testified uh, before the GAE committee uh, two years ago, there were four states automatically sending out checks. Now there are nine. So um, it's time for us to join them, I think. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. 22. Two months. The next testifier is Georgia Goldburn. Hello. We can hear you, Georgia. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, members of the finance um, revenue. Oh. I'm sorry, Revenue and Bonding Commit um, Committee, Senator Fonfera and Representative Scanlon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 487. My name is Georgia Goldburn and I'm the Director of Hope for New Haven, which manages the Hope Child Development Center and the co-founder of Circle, a network of over 40 child care providers serving children and families of color. During our Circle strategic meeting, um, planning meeting several weeks ago, we discussed the concept of opportunity cost. 
that is what is lost in potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. Connecticut has long chosen to ignore its childcare industry, leaving it to grow ever weaker, straining families' household budget, undermining women's participation in the workforce, and worse still, ignoring the science of early brain development. The intractable achievement gap has been signaling this opportunity cost for years, but it has not been since the pandemic that the magnitude of the opportunity cost to Connecticut was exposed. Esteemed member, in my almost 20 years of being in early care and education, I have never seen the unanimity of opinion by, child, by the child care industry, parents, business leaders, CBIA, and policy experts for the need to invest in Connecticut's early care system. This alone should be a clarion call for anyone who is still on the fence or believes that the price tag is too high to make even the minimal investment. Most importantly, this alignment should signal that not making these investments is an actual failure to be a good steward of Connecticut's dollars. Esteemed members, imagine if, I, if you contracted me to build a house for you, and I propose investing 10% of your construction budget to, to build 90% of the house. I then propose to use the remaining 90% to complete the house and perform the inevitable repairs that will follow. I would be instantly disqualified as your contractor. You would instantly know that was not a wise use of your funds and to not entrust me to carry out this plan and put you and your family who will be living in the house in grave harm. Yet this is the approach that Connecticut has taken to building its workforce and its citizens of the future. Esteemed members, the care with which we build children's brains cannot be funded in this manner. It is time to stop being penny wise and pound foolish. This legislative body needs to come into alignment with the child care industry, parents, business leaders, CBIA and policy experts and recognize that we need meaningful investment once and for all in our early care and education system. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Goldburn, for your testimony uh, and great job with your timing. I saw that alarm go off right as you finished. So that was very <laughs> I, uh, I try. I try. <laughs> uh, we appreciate that. Um, I don't see any questions, though, but thank you uh, for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. The next testifier is Ingrid Henlin. Hi, good afternoon. Just ran from a meeting, so I'm just stopping in. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I'm Ingrid Henlin. I'm a head teacher for Mount Olive Child Development. I oversee the toddler program here. I've been a part of Mount Olive for over 30 years um, and really love what I do. This bill, SB 487, I think it should make a great impact. It should be um, on top of everyone's list of making sure it passes through. With COVID and the effect of it in the program, we've seen or have lost many teachers. Um, we lost a lot of kids along the way. Uh, with this bill, with the funding for more care for infant toddlers is essential. We all know the impact that it has when children are able to come in at an early age and are able to develop their social skills, their cognitive skills, their fine motor skills, which sometimes at home are not looked at or seen as important. Um, this bill would allow more slots open um, for more infant and toddlers to get into the program. Toddlers are a little bit more costly to take care of, as we all know. Um, the ratio is different, the four to one, which means it costs the program more to really um, provide teachers for that program. Um, we really need this bill to, um, to be passed. We, I looked at it and I said, okay, if Care for Kids, the amount goes up and everything, and then the increase in wages for teachers, it would make a great impact. Um, I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day and I looked at it. I said, in the 30 years I've been here, the turnover rate with teachers has been so drastic. It's scary to the point where right now, as a head teacher, I'm covering the classrooms on a daily basis because we don't have enough teachers to meet the ratio in the toddler program. One of the reasons a lot of teachers are leaving are because of wages. Um, our life, everything is expensive. Gas is expensive. Light is expensive. You can't afford rent sometimes because your paycheck, 
you need more than one or two paychecks to just cover rent. So a lot of teachers are stepping away from a field that they truly love to go and do something just to make their ends meet. I think it's important that we look at early childhood as important as it is for public school or college or high school. We need teachers that love what they do. Um, it's not an easy job. It's a stressful job because you deal with the parents, you deal with the kids, you deal with emotions, you deal with behaviors. And we need to make sure that uh, we have qualified teachers to really um, take on the field. Um, with this bill, it will open a lot of windows if um, programs are able to pay teachers what they deserve. I really stress the importance of passing this bill and I really look forward to see it taking place. So I just wanna thank you for listening to my story and listening to what I have to share and just thank you for everyone that's listening. Thank you for being here, Ms. Henlon. Appreciate your testimony today. The next testifier is Jacqueline Ulia. Hi, Jacqueline. Hi. Buenas tardes. Hi, I'm, I will be translating for her. Good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Good afternoon. Mi nombre es Jacqueline Ulloa, soy proveedora licenciada del cuidado infantil. My, my, name is Jacqueline, my name is Jacqueline Ulloa and I'm a licensed child care provider. Eh, donde he servido por más de cinco años en mi comunidad aquí en el estado de Connecticut. Where I have served for five years in my community in the state of Connecticut. Yo vengo a testificar al apoyo del proyecto de la ley 487. And today I'm testifying in support of SB 487. Este, en, estos en este último año no hemos tenido, eh, hemos sido muy afectados y no hemos tenido el apoyo de líderes comunitarios. This past year y... we have been, um, our field has been very affected and we have not received the what we had hoped from leaders, um, community leaders. Y hay padres que han tenido que retirar sus niños por falta de ingreso por su salario. No es lo suficiente para poder pagar el cuido. And there has parents that have to take away children from the daycares because they have they don't have the necessary funds to pay for daycare. Vuelvo a repetir la última parte, Jacqueline. Um, eh, o sea, por su salario no es lo suficiente y han tenido porque no tienen para pagar el cuido de sus niños. Yes, so their salary is not enough and they don't have enough to pay for child care. Le estamos quitando la oportunidad a esos niños de que tenga un servicio de educación temprana de alta calidad. We are taking away from those children um, quality care. The, the opportunity of quality care. Que viene siendo la base principal cuando esos niños entren a la escuela, la high school, y eso se va a reflejar hasta en la universidad. That is the, the basic, um, they need the basic information. Um, and this will, they will use this for not only um, middle school, high school, but also once they go into college. Gracias por la oportunidad de poder testificar y apoyar este proyecto de ley, SP 487. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and support SB, S Bill 487. Thank you for being here today and for your testimony. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The next testifier is Mike DeFeo. Good afternoon, co-chairs, Von Farron and Scanlon, and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today. My name is Mike DeFeo, and I'm a lifelong resident of Connecticut and the general manager of Coca-Cola Hartford. Coca-Cola operates three sales and distribution centers in one production facility in Connecticut, and we provide 740 jobs to Connecticut residents. These are good paying jobs, 
majority of them union jobs with excellent benefits for hardworking people and families. Additionally, over the past three years, we have invested $70 million in our local facilities, building a brand new state-of-the-art sales center in South Windsor, upgrading manufacturing in East Hartford, and renovating a sales center in Naugatuck. We're proud that Coca-Cola never missed a beat servicing our customers and community during the pandemic, and our associates were on the front lines every day, ensuring that Connecticut <laughs> residents were able to get their favorite beverages during these very... Mr. DeFeo, I think your internet, uh, at least for me, seems to be freezing a bit. Not sure if you can hear us or if you can get to a better connection, but you know, your internet seems to have frozen. <clears throat> All right, Bree, you may want to mute him. And if the next person is here, we can sort of go back to him. I see Representative Reyes is on. Yes, um, I will mute Mr. DeFeo and I will call him back into the hearing when we're ready. Um, I do have a couple other testifiers, but I see that Representative Reyes is in the room. So let's give him the opportunity to speak. Representative Reyes, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Bree. Uh, good afternoon, Chairs Fanfara, Representative Scallon, Vice Chairs Miller, Moore, and Representative Carlos DeGraw, Meskers, and ranking members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on House Bill for, uh, on Bill 487. I, uh, I've uh, submitted written testimony on Senate Bill 487, but I'm just going to read uh, a portion of it here because I think it's significant to uh, many of the folks that have spoken from the greater Waterbury area. So I am State Representative Geraldo Reyes. I am representing the 75th House District here in Waterbury. Today I am testifying in support of Senate Bill 487 an act establishing the infant and toddler early care family support initiative. The residents of the 75th district struggle to make ends meet. They need protection against surging evictions and turning off the utilities. In demographic terms, I represent some of the poorest people in the state of Connecticut, which is why I am here today strongly advocating for Senate Bill 487 to prevent a crossroads from becoming a major crisis that will lead to a collapse of the early childhood education system, in Connecticut. I won't read the rest of the testimony I submitted it, but what I do wanna say is in Waterbury here, we have uh, clearly and visibly have noticed the amount of daycare providers that have actually closed in the last couple of years. And uh, to that end, we have started our own programs to actually get more of these providers back online. And we just had our first graduating class, 40 such providers, early infant and child care providers, uh, two weeks ago. There was 20, 20 uh, uh, ladies that graduated, of which only one is actually set up to go and actually become an entrepreneur and start this business. So to, 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 to that end is, so we're not only facing an early childhood uh, uh, shortages of seats and classes for these infants, but on top of that, we're we're up against a uh, we're up against a tide where the the price of rentals and the price of new homes continue to skyrocket, and what was affordable in Waterbury just a short six to eight years ago, ten years ago, is closely is fastly closing. So even that opportunity is uh, starting to shrink on us because of the housing uh, stock availability and the prices of homes. So we're in a crisis here. We're headed for a perfect storm which is why I uh, chose today to testify in support of 487. And I wanna thank all my colleagues that uh, have uh, spoken to me on this. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, specifically thank Representative Bobby Sanchez, who has repeatedly talked to us about this. And uh, he predicted this years ago and uh, he's becoming a, uh, uh, it's becoming a reality and it's, uh, it's sad but I'm glad to see uh, that there is some hope and it seems like uh, there's a lot of dialogue here. So I'm happy to uh, answer any questions on the water brand if anybody's interested, but I am in total support of this. And I wanna thank all my colleagues for bringing this forward. Representative, great to see you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I don't see any questions. We've uh, covered a lot of ground on this over the last couple hours. Um, 
but do appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Representative. The next testifier we have is Deputy Treasurer Daryl Hill. Good afternoon, Senator Funfara, Representative Scanlon, Senator Martin, Representative Cheeseman, and members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present, provide testimony today. My name is Daryl Hill, and I'm the Treasurer Wooden's Deputy Treasurer. Unfortunately, the Treasurer could not be here to testify in person, but he has submitted written testimony on the two Treasury bills on the agenda today, Senate Bill 379 and House Bill 5202 both of which improve on the operations of the Office of the Treasurer. I will focus my comments now on Senate Bill 379, an act implementing the Treasurer's recommendations concerning the unclaimed property program. Thank you for raising this bill, which represents the second phase of enhancements to be made to the unclaimed property program since Treasurer Wooden took office. For some background, last year, the Office of the Treasurer implemented an entirely new system to begin to modernize the process for holders to remit property and for rightful owners to submit claims. This new system allows the property, the claim forms and required documents to be filed electronically on the ctbiglist.com website. While this was a significant improvement to our ability to receive property and process claims, we continued to work towards making the process even faster and more efficient. On February 1st, National Unclaimed Property Day, the Treasurer announced several administrative enhancements to improve the unclaimed property program and make it easier to put money back in the hands of rightful owners. These changes included the removal of the notarization requirement on the claim form, which was fully implemented at the end of last month. These administrative steps have made the process of reuniting rightful owners with the property remitted to us more efficient and user-friendly. In addition to administrative actions, there are several other improvements we are pursuing through this legislation. We are aware there are a number of other bills, both before this committee and others, that address different aspects of the unclaimed property program. But this bill, SB 379, goes the furthest towards modernizing and revamping the program and is the most comprehensive in its improvements to the way in which property is reunited or returned to rightful owners. Treasurer Wooden has submitted written testimony that details the changes being made in this bill, in the bill, but I will just highlight a couple here in the interest of time. As you know, under current law, a list of newly reported unclaimed property is required to be published every two years. But in practice, the ctbiglist.com website a searchable database where anyone can find their unclaimed property in Connecticut is updated every day. The outdated publication requirement ought to be removed in its entirety and replaced with a requirement that the treasurer include in this searchable online list all properties that have identifying information and have been reported and transferred to our office. This would modernize and align the statutory requirements with the robust current system in place at ctbiglist.com. The second major enhancement is the creation of an automatic payment process, which would give the treasurer the authority to automatically send out payments to sole owners whose identity has been satisfactorily established without the need for a claim to be initiated or five. Seconds, please summarize. It also provides a mechanism for information sharing among state agencies so that we have the most up-to-date information about rightful owners. The creation of the automatic payment process will put money directly back into the pockets of many Connecticut families at a time when they need it most. We urge the committee to support SB 379, and I thank you again for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Deputy Treasurer, for being here today. We'll go to Representative Cheeseman, followed by Senator Funfaro. Thank you, Chairman Scanlon. Thank you for coming here today, Deputy Treasurer Hill. So um, we had a prior testimony given by Mr. Lizzie who indicated there are a number of other states where the default is to send payment. Um, yeah, I, I think he cited Rhode Island, one of our neighboring states, North Carolina, Wisconsin, I believe they send a letter if the letter is not delivered is unreturned. The assumption is that this is the rightful owner. And he also mentioned the fact that um, businesses, municipalities and nonprofits 
are also the effort is made to return the funds to them. I was pleased to see here to talk, hear you mention the effort to move to work with other state agencies to ensure you have the most up to date data as far as where the people, businesses, et cetera, are residing. But can you just comment on that? Because it seems to me if other states have figured a way to, you know, return the money without, even if you've removed the notarization request, jumping through lots of hoops, um, you know, as I say, we shouldn't just be the land of steady habits. We should be the land of disruptive habits. And I think this disruptive habit, we need to disrupt this habit of not sending people's money back. So I'll be quiet now and, and hear your response. Um, I'm not sure I heard a question in there, but I'll say that. Uh, Pat, the, is, there include, a way, uh, is there a way we can follow the lead of other states and where the default option is, you know, as I said, the, you know, send a letter if it's not returned as undeliverable, then you send a check out. Have we investigated something like that? To, uh, to I make think we've actually done it before in Connecticut. And the legislation and the enhancements that the treasurer has already implemented will allow us to, to do that for claims that are sole owner. And while other states and uh, other testimony that you referenced may make general statements about how other states are processing their unclaimed property, uh, with the details of how those other states, and we have met with a variety of other states, uh, there, there are things that are left out because uh, our claims run the gamut. There are very simple claims where there's one owner that's been at the same address for a long period of time. Those are, I believe, what other states are referring to, and that's what we're seeking to do with this legislation, the automatic payments component of the treasurer's uh, proposal or SB 379. Um, the more complicated claims, uh, I'm not aware of how we could send a letter to a deceased rightful owner or a business that no longer exists, or, uh, uh, what, what or a bank account that no longer exists. So sure. what, we what are actually work. I'm sorry, no, go ahead. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go, no, go ahead. Now, what percentage of those claims fall into those buckets? What percentage of what claims? Of, of the claims you cited, deceased owners, businesses that have ceased to operate. I'm just curious as to, you know, when we're looking at a billion dollars, is 50% of it from people who are dead? Is 10% of it? Well, you know, where, where are the simple claims and where are the hard to, uh, you know, to, to track claims? And also how are you cited if you've defined to the treasurer's satisfaction that you are the person you say, how do you define that? Um, I'm still struggling a little bit with an actual question, but uh, the, okay, the first uh, the first part, what percentage of, that you cited are the, uh, let's say, the easy to find track down claims where you can just send somebody a check? Um, the, the automatic, it's a smaller portion uh, with the information for the claims that have been uh, initiated now. I think we have around 47,000 rightful owners that we could process as automatic payments. Um, Out of that, total universe of? Uh, the total universe of rightful owners is about 9 million. So a tiny proportion, a relatively small proportion. Yes. Okay. All right. I, I, and, and again, how do you define to the treasurer's satisfaction that you are the person that you claim to be? What, what it, I know you said we've got rid of the notarization um, requirement. What, what are you required to submit to the treasurer to prove you are who you say you are? There's a variety of ways that a rightful owner could do it. The, the simplest is through their uh, government issued ID and their social security number. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Chairman right. Scanlon. Senator from Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm not going to take the committee's time up nor Deputy Treasurer Hill's time up today regarding um, the question and the back and forth with uh, Representative Cheeseman, I think the point is a good one that um, there is opportunity to, to look at um, our neighboring state and, and others that are doing this currently. Uh, can't believe that they are uh, any less um, concerned about uh, ensuring that the uh, unclaimed property is ending up in the proper hands than we are. 
But I would like to ask you, uh, you haven't, unless there's testimony that you haven't finished, um, um, I'm asking, I want to ask you regarding Senate Bill 481, you've chosen not to testify on that bill? Not verbally, the treasurer has submitted written testimony. If I believe that's correct. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, you bill 5502? 481, Senate Bill 481. This relates to the program the treasurer operates of investing in um, local banks and credit unions. Um, I do not have any testimony, but I'm happy to answer any questions on it. Well, that was my question that you've chosen, or the treasurer's chosen not to provide testimony on that bill. That's correct. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Deputy Treasurer Hill, for your testimony today. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The next testifier is Hartford Mayor Luke Bronin. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Representative Scanlon, Senator Fonfara, uh, and members of the committee. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I'm testifying primarily uh, on Senate Bill 478 uh, in favor of Senate Bill 478. Uh, I will be uh, providing written testimony that uh, goes into greater detail, but I did just want to note a few provisions of this bill, which uh, I strongly support and consider to be important, uh, both to uh, the city of Hartford and uh, in some cases, uh, more broadly to the state of Connecticut as a whole. The first is uh, that there is a provision in Senate Bill 478 that would incentivize uh, new leases of commercial space, uh, particularly important for those downtowns that have been hard hit by COVID. As you can imagine, uh, the city of Hartford, as uh, with the case with other downtowns, has seen a significant increase in vacancy rates uh, as uh, we've seen the nature of work shift. Uh, that has profound implications for the level of energy and activity in the city, as well as the uh, stable, uh, the maintenance of a stable value in a strong commercial market. Uh, so I believe it is important that we take action now to incentivize companies to take new leases in uh, commercial office buildings that have suffered from higher vacancy rates as a result of the pandemic. Uh, I also uh, strongly uh, support the provisions that would incentivize the commercial uh, conversion of certain commercial buildings from commercial to residential. Uh, here in the city of Hartford, we have uh, for many years been pursuing a strategy of trying to increase residential density so that we are not as dependent on those uh, large office buildings uh, as the source of energy and activity and feed on the street. And we've seen strong demand for apartments and you can feel the difference that having those residential units in uh, the downtown makes. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the economics of those deals uh, are very difficult to do uh, because the rents are not nearly as high in Connecticut cities as they are in places like New York and Boston. That means that there is a need for some amount of uh, incentive or subsidy to achieve uh, the goals of building those residential units and making sure that they remain affordable to Connecticut residents. Uh, so strongly support that provision to incentivize the conversion commercial to residential under certain circumstances. Uh, another important provision of this bill would allow us allow the Capital Region Development Authority to leverage private capital. Currently, there are certain barriers uh, in the CRDA enabling statute that make it difficult uh, should private companies like some of our large Connecticut employers be interested in investing at below market rates uh, for a public purpose alongside CRDA, we should want to make it as easy as possible for private capital to come in and, uh, and help achieve our state's economic development goals uh, alongside CRDA. Finally, uh, the bill also includes important provisions to uh, combat the frivolous uh, filing of tax appeals. Uh, this is an issue that uh, we have seen uh, repeatedly in Hartford, but I will say on this issue, uh, I'm also speaking on behalf of the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities uh, and uh, believe it is important that we examine and reform the tax uh, assessment appeal process. 
There has uh, grown up an industry of uh, tax appeals uh, where uh, those representing property owners are incentivized to uh, file as many appeals as possible, even when they're without merit. And all too often, that results in uh, a settlement that is encouraged by the court uh, simply to avoid the costs and the risks of an expensive litigation, despite the lack of merit in the appeals. The result of that is that everyday taxpayers, especially residential homeowners, end up bearing a higher burden because some of the largest buildings have, uh, again, without merit, seen their assessments reduced. Uh, this bill would uh, provide some important protections and reforms to help make sure that tax appeals are meritorious and well-founded. Um, I'd I'll stop there in the interest of time. Again, I'm grateful for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to go into as much detail on any of those provisions as members of the committee would like. Thank you. I, I may also very, I apologize, very briefly just want to commend the committee on its work also to encourage investment in early childhood. Uh, that's a hugely important issue to our communities, and I just want to commend the committee on this work there too. Thank you, Mayor. Good to see you. Thanks for being with us today. And I see Senator Fonfara has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for testifying today. And could you enlighten the committee a little more regarding the, the issue of, uh, of, of encouraging participation by private sector uh, in, with, with respect to CRDA and, and the work that is done there and, and maybe uh, provide us a little bit more detail as to what the, what the issues are that uh, are restricting um, that activity or that in, engagement right now? Absolutely, Senator. Thanks for the question. Uh, so I hope it's okay if I just start at the basics for a moment and just talk about what CRDA does and why it matters. Uh, as I said before, uh, there is a very strong demand uh, in Hartford for residential units. And as part of our long-term growth strategy, we've worked hard to, uh, to build new residential units, a mix of market rate and affordable, uh, because that's the key to building a vibrant city is make sure you have sufficient density uh, of residential that you've got those feet on the street and that energy and activity. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, uh, rents here are not high enough to justify that construction from the perspective of many private developers, because they can get higher returns at higher rents in other cities around the country. To address that problem, CRDA was created to provide gap financing. What CRDA does is lend, make loans uh, at below market rates, often at two or 3% where private lenders will charge multiples of that to enable a project to pencil out and get done. Those CRDA loans have performed well. They have been instrumental in getting a number of critical projects done. Uh, and without that gap financing, those projects would not happen. There is, the poss there is a possibility of getting private companies in Connecticut, including some of our large uh, regional companies to put up some of their own private capital on similar terms, meaning to lend that money out at below market rates, at returns that they would not normally be willing to accept from an investment but because they support the goals of economic development and the work that CRDA does to make similarly below market loans using private capital. Currently, there's a restriction in the CRDA enabling statute, which says, apologize for the fire truck going by, um, which says that uh, if an entity has a, an employee who sits on the board of CRDA, then that entity cannot invest in any way in those projects. We obviously want to make sure that there is no conflict of interest and therefore this bill would require any employee of a company that's investing alongside CRDA to recuse him or herself from any consideration, deliberation or vote on that matter. But we think it's against the public interest to say that that private company is restricted from providing a below market loan uh, alongside CRDA uh, and by doing that to magnify CRDA's impact and perform an important public service. I hope that uh, answers the question, but happy to clarify any points. So um, essentially the benefit that comes from not only the, the contribution, but also the participation on the board by uh, folks who bring a perspective and an experience and an interest 
in the city, which right now doing both, they could either serve on the board or the company could could participate in funding, but they can't do both. And that's what this would correct. Am I right? That's right. Uh, and I will note that um, in uh, there is a similar bill that's before GAE. And in that uh, testimony, the uh, Office of State Ethics uh, testified, um, recommended a small change, but testified otherwise uh, in support of that bill. Um, you know, again, we the, the issue of conflicts can be wholly addressed through requiring recusal. But we want our big companies to have a stake in the economic development efforts uh, in our capital city. And if they are willing to make investments at below market returns, we should welcome and promote that rather than preventing it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate your testimony today on both, both bills. I'm Thanks, not sir. seeing any other questions. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Senator. Please. Thank you. The next testifier is Iris Velasquez. Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, Steffi is there. I need a translator. Hold just one moment. We're gonna see if Representative Meskers is available. Thank you. Yeah. Bree, why don't we come back to represent it uh, with uh, Ms. Velasquez when her interpreter is present? We can do that. Um, next on deck is Mr. DeFeo. Mike DeFeo had joined us momentarily, but had some connectivity issues. So he's back in the hearing to testify. Mr. DeFeo, you have the floor. Thank you, Bray. Appreciate that. Sorry about that. So I, as I stated earlier, we uh, over the past three years, we invested $70 million in our local facilities, building a new state-of-the-art sales center in South Windsor, upgrading our manufacturing center in East Hartford and renovating our sales center in Naugatuck. We are very proud that Coca-Cola never missed a, a beat servicing our customers and community during the pandemic. And our associates were on our front lines every day, ensuring that Connecticut residents were able to get their favorite beverages during these very trying times you could imagine. I would also like to add that our associates volunteer with organizations like the Greater Hartford YMCA, Special Olympics Connecticut, Boys and Girls Club, and we support important community initiatives such as the Connecticut Food Bank and Food Share. We are proud to be part of the local communities we serve and support here in our great state. So today, I'm here to talk about the amendment to Revenue Package Senate Bill 11 that would return unclaimed beverage container deposits to distributors subject to the state's container redemption program or the bottle bill. 1037, which passed last session, imposes a significant cost increase on non-alcoholic beverage distributors in the form of increased handling fees, which everybody knows went up 75% increase from two cents per container to three and a half cents per container, and also the deposit expansion to juices, teas, and sports drinks. Handling fees currently added $4 million to our annual operating expense and we estimate another million dollars with the expansion in 2023 money would be otherwise be able to reinvest in our operations here in Connecticut. The law did, however, propose a very gradual uh, and partial return of our you know, unclaimed deposits to offset some of the higher costs to 55% by fiscal year 2028. We have submitted our request to committee leadership to accelerate and increase the return of the unclaimed deposits to distributors to 100% over the next four years by fiscal year 2026, which was the original intention of the bottle bill when it was implemented in 1983, before the unclaimed deposits were appropriated by the state in 2009. I'm asking for your support today to include this accelerated schedule in Senate Bill 11 and provide some relief from the significant cost increases and impact on our business and number of jobs when Public Act 2058 goes into full effect. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. DeFeo, and I apologize for the disconnect, but I'm glad you came back to finish your testimony. Thank you very much, appreciate that. I see no questions. Bree? Thank you. Um, 
Our next testifier is Iris Velasquez with Representative Mesker serving as a translator. Thank you. You're welcome. Sí, um, buenas tardes a todos los uh, miembros del Comité de Finanzas e Ingresos. Mi nombre es Iris Velasquez. Okay, yeah, it is. Uh, good afternoon to the members of the committee of finance, revenue, and bonding. My name is Iris Velasquez. Estoy aquí testificando en apoyo a la ley SB 487. Una ley She's here to testify in favor of the Senate Bill 487. This law, law that establishes the benefit for, for families and for young children. Um, go ahead. Sorry. Sigue. Soy educadora en el pueblo de Waterbury, Connecticut, durante uh, cinco, uh, about cinco años. So she's been an educator in the town of Waterbury for the last five years. Perfect. Representative, do you want to... me to take over? Uh, it's Ava Bermudez. Do you want me to take over? You're a very good translator, though. So if you want to keep going, go for it. You're uh, okay. <laughs> I'll continue if you want, Ava. No problem. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hoy vengo ustedes. Hoy eh, hoy vengo a hablarles a los a los legisladores con la esperanza de que eh, podamos ser escuchadas nosotras las proveedoras. Uh, I'm here uh, before the legislators in the hope that we, the educators, will be listened to. Sigue. Nunca he estado tan necesitada uh, de un mayor financiamiento que me permita. There's never been a bigger need. There's never been a bigger need for uh, the financing of our programs and to keep our doors open. Sigue. Para, para las familias y los niños que atiendo en mi programa. For the children and the families that uh, participate or attend her program. Soy líder en mi comunidad y participante activa. I am a leader in my community and an active participant. En nuestro sindicato de cuidado infantil. And in the union of, uh, of uh, childhood, uh, uh, child care. Uh, uh, teachers, go ahead. A través, a través de mi trabajo he escuchado historias de los padres que necesitan mucha ayuda para poder sufragar los gastos del cuidado infantil. Uh, in, as part of my work, I listen to the stories of many families who are in much need of assistance in helping to take care of their children in a, in a program such as hers. Nosotros los proveedores, las proveedoras, eh, a veces tenemos que hasta ayudarlos, no cobrándoles los fees que, que necesitamos eh, para que so ellos puedan ir a trabajar. We even have to many times to step in and subsidize and help those parents so that they can afford to go to work. Porque los recursos que les provee el Estado no les alcanzan. Because the resources or the assistance that the state provides just doesn't reach the amount needed. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't achieve the goal. Mi familia y mi negocio eh, estamos necesitados de fondos. My family and my business, they need these additional funds. Para poder mantener nuestras puertas abiertas. So that you, she can continue to maintain her doors, her, her door, keep her, her business open and provide the service. Y pienso que nosotros somos, eh, corremos un rol importante en nuestra comunidad. And she, and she thinks that they provide a very necessary role in their community. Y no, pod no podremos so sobrevivir si no aprueban el presupuesto que estamos pidiendo. And she doesn't believe that they can survive if we don't approve of the um, the uh, the budget, uh, the increase in the budget or help that they're requesting. Recuerdo que cuando mis niños estaban en un daycare, eh, la proveedora 
no me, no me cobraba los fees porque no, yo no podía uh, sobrevivir. Si le pagaba los fees, no podía eh, sufragar los gastos. Iris remembers when she was, uh, had her children in daycare that she did not have sufficient funds to pay for it and that the assistance came from the daycare providers and that was what allowed her to work and to survive. Y ahora que soy proveedora, eh, tengo que ayudar a los padres con la misma situación. And now that she is a, a provider of, of early childhood education, she needs that same assistance to give to the parents who are participants in her program. So apreciaría mucho que tomaran en consideración la propuesta y que podamos salvar el cuidado de cuidado infantil. I appreciate much your consideration of the proposal and we're hoping that you will support the pro program so we can, we can continue to take care of the children. Gracias. And thank you. Gracias, Iris. I think Gracias. that concludes her testimony. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Velasquez. Gracias for your testimony. And Representative Meskers, you never cease to amaze the committee with your talents far and wide. Um, I won't sing today, I promise. <laughs> well, we appreciate that. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Bree. Wow, we're learning all about Representative Meskers today. I didn't know you sang. We're going to have to talk offline. Uh, the next testifier is Paige Bray. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee. Thank you so much for taking the time to hear testimony. Um, I am a parent from Windsor, Connecticut, an early childhood faculty member and Montessori lead, as well as a community engaged scholar and researcher that focuses on parents and children advocacy. And it is, I am happy to stand today with all the early childhood care providers who are trying to make a difference, one child, one family, one budget at a time right now. Um, I understand higher education to be part of the solution. Uh, that meets the needs. So I'm testifying in support of Senate Bill 487 so that uh, three to $500 million can go to a non-lapsing account and support early family support. Um, we know that this comes from existing tax revenue and we know that it can create 10 to 15,000 new infant toddler care spots, which are critical in Connecticut. Um, I do want to make sure to uh, he, that this activity supports the full range. The work that um, I'm part of is the birth to eight span. So it's really important that show that young adults who and career changers who are wanting to go into early childhood have the providers have the capacity to pay them so that they can make that choice. The compensation is critical for the workforce that not only supports obviously the people in early childhood, but all the families and children benefiting from quality care. Um, I know many students over multiple decades who would seek the infant toddler area to work in, but they choose to work in other areas because they have to work multiple jobs instead of one or two otherwise. So this, these changes are critically important for improvements in the system. I wanna just flag for you that we know that um, the first three years are critically important for a whole host of reasons that I won't go into now, but to underscore that in during um, research like the Heckman report and the pure work around the return on investment, we know makes good financial sense. And I also just wanna finally say, um, as part of the Connecticut Consortium for the Advancement of Early Childhood Educators, those of us who are trying to work in the task force space with the Ed Committee to really help work with national and state leaders to make sure that our early childhood programs are strong for now and for the next generations. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Ms. Bray. Are there questions? Yes, Representative Cheeseman. Sorry, Representative Cheeseman doesn't have a question, but I love your identifiers page. She, her, and Empress page. I'm, I always thought I would be like your Royal Highness, your Majesty, and ma'am if I ever had to list them. So I'm identifying you with you, and I love your hair. All right, off topic, I know. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. It helps to have smart, um, wise acre adolescent 
uh, sons <laughs> in your house. <laughs> Keeps you young. Thank you, Chairman uh, Barra. Thank you. A little levity today is needed, I think. Um, Representative Farrar. Thanks, Chairman. And if I do say so, Representative Cheeseman, I think you could rock that color very easily. I think it would look amazing. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, all, I'm all for it. Uh, Paige, thank you for being here today. Thank you for everything you and all the child care workers are just doing tirelessly for our children everywhere in the state. And I, I just jumped in. I know a bunch of us are managing other meetings um, and I heard uh, most of your testimony, um, but I heard you speak again, kind of to the, the real lack of childcare workforce that we have right now. And we know that the heart of that, those are so many women, particularly women of color in our state who have just been underinvested in um, as individuals, as professionals. And I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to, you know, why, why this bill isn't just necessary, you know, from uh, a workforce perspective for them, but why we would need it for, to fill any of the jobs just in other industries right now outside of childcare. Sure. The workforce, it's multiple workforces, right? It's the actual workforce. So creating a reasonable compensation <clears throat> for the work that people are doing with children and families. But of course, as we've seen earlier this month, those that care, especially for infant toddler, but through early childhood means other people can actually go to other kinds of work, right? It supports the, the broader Connecticut workforce. It also supports all sorts of other systems. And we know that that early intervention, um, having high quality people in those early years, having people have professional development so that they know about the current work with early identification, early intervention. These are multipliers in the financial realm where the investment now is so much better placed than how much it costs later to remediate for in further grades or for those who understand how people dropping out can be affected even early on. So yes, we're talking about future workforce we're talking about the current workforce in all uh, all sectors benefiting from and needing quality care, um, and then the investment, of course, in those infant toddlers and young children for the citizens and people, the contributors they'll become. Thank you, Paige. And for you and your center and what you've seen across the state, do you know how many early childhood educator positions are open right now? I'm so sorry that I won't be yeah. able to say that. So I actually, my realm is working in partnership with um, providers, right? So I actually prepare teachers and see them wanting to also work in the birth to three space. We have a strong partnership with birth to three um, and often they move into the upper grades for early childhood because they can't sustain um, payment for themselves. We, we just... In 2022, there isn't such a thing as a female workforce that's supported by spouses who can work, you know, for the wages that are provided. So this sort of investment helps the entire system become stronger and healthier for, for everyone in Connecticut. Thank you, Paige. And I'm sure there's another testifier today that might have covered that. Um, I'd heard that it was kind of in the thousands previously, and we'll certainly look to that um, yes. and just appreciate again, your attention and your passion for us making a difference in this area, since it is an essential infrastructure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Representative Farrar. And, um, Senator Martin, I don't know if we should be offended. They never talk about our hair, right? I mean, it's, geez, how about some equal time here? Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Bray, for your testimony. And um, Bree. We can get you some low lights, Senator. We uh -huh. can make it happen. Days are um, over. <laughs> you can and our next blue. <laughs> yes, you could do the blue. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bray. Our next testifier is Elizabeth Fraser. Well, thank you, um, Bree and Senator Fonfera, Representative Scanlon, and members of the Finance and Revenue and Bonding Committee for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate Bill 487, which is a bold and innovative piece of legislation 
with the potential of changing the trajectory of thousands of babies in cities and neighborhoods all across the state. My name is Liz Fraser. I'm the policy director for the Connecticut Association for Human Services, a division of Advancing Connecticut Together. And I would just like to echo what others have spoken. Uh, there have been many eloquent comments. I'm just going to try to add a few pieces in. Um, first, why is this important to put in place now and not wait? And that's because babies can't wait. High quality infant and toddler care is just not reaching those families who are in the greatest need or those who live in childcare deserts. Their parents can't work or their work is limited, which decreases family economic stability and increases stress levels in both the parent and the child. And research tells us that persistent stresses can have long lasting impacts on learning, health, and the future well being of these youngest children. The achievement gap, the earnings gap, the wealth gap, the health gap all begin at the beginning, and babies just can't wait. Personally, I believe that this bill is particularly transformational because it establishes a holistic, multi generational approach to program design. It recognizes what research tells us that when parents do better, children do better. For example, the bill includes the ability of parents to continue their education or participate in workforce training, which is essential to obtaining more lucrative employment and increasing family income. Many people cannot afford to do that, which keeps them earning um, low salaries. Um, additionally, it provides the wraparound supports, which can help parents navigate the many barriers and difficulties that occur in life and throw goals off track. It provides the supports, information, and resources needed when parents have concerns over the growth and development of their little one. So um, why is this important to have wraparound services and, and consider adults um, and their, their goals? It's because parent successes have a doubling effect by exposing their children to greater opportunity. We know that a parent's level of education correlates with a child's future academic success. And any parent understands that the, the supports that are sometimes needed with a very young child. A holistic family-centered approach works and several programs already do this and have great outcomes. In my written testimony, I've included a video of a parent student who attended New London Adult Education. And you heard from Liza this morning very early, along with this, this woman's baby. She can tell you in her own words what this opportunity meant to her and her success. For several years, she went to adult education. She earned her high school diploma and then participated in a workforce development program. But she was only able to do this because the program offers free, high quality infant toddler care and other wraparound supports somewhere. that helped her through the road bunts. I recently checked in with her mentor and was happy to learn that she completed the receptionist with medical terminology certificate program and is now working. This quote sums it up. It is just not reasonable to expect that children be the only change agent in a family. For children to be successful, we need to make it easier for parents to succeed too. It's both an economic and moral issue. And lastly, this is transformational and will be a model for the country. But to do this, we need to make sure that we address the current uh, crisis in the early care industry and make sure that we have something to build on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Fraser. Uh, were you uh, listening in when Senator McCrory spoke earlier today? Oh, yes. He was very eloquent. And in particular, his, te his testimony regarding the investment that we're making currently um, in education in Connecticut and the dividends or the lack thereof in certain communities uh, that we're, we're receiving. Um, because of the, our failure to invest in the, in the early stages of a child's life. Um, well, I'd like your <clears throat> thoughts on that, if you have any. I, I do, actually. Um, before I did this job, before I was involved in, in advocacy, I worked um, with moms that had not finished high school. Um, their educational attainment was very low, and they all had babies. There was no way for them to increase their educational level. There was no way for them to go back to school unless they had childcare. And there were at the time like 11 of these even start programs that you heard about earlier that provided um, that, that 
that nurturing environment for those parents who were also suffering. Um, many had had very bad experiences in school themselves. They, um, they were living sometimes couch to couch. These were very, very, um, you know, in need young women mostly. Um, many of them had been involved themselves as children in DCF with DCF um, and were very wary about it. Um, a program that offers something for parents and children together, a multi-generational approach to whatever you do is extremely important to make sure that we are um, giving um, parents what they need to be the best parent that they want to be. These women all were wonderful parents, but the stresses of their lives were so hard that it was very difficult sometimes for them to be able to um, function. And having these programs, having wraparound services, being able to get an education and move forward in your life was transformational for many of them. And I guess um, that's why I do what I do today. And I appreciate that. And I apologize to the committee. It's been a very long hearing, but I think it's important that why, the cog why this has cognizance here, why this issue has much of the testimony and a well overwhelming percent of the testimony has been on the programmatic aspect, but in terms of the funding and, and the question that I, I, I posed to you regarding Senator McCrory's comments that we're investing today in education from, you know, from kindergarten through, hmm. through, through uh, 12th grade. And as he said, many, too many uh, of those young people are getting a diploma, but then go to work at Target, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and I'm trying to maybe, uh, if, you're, if you're able to comment about this as an, an investment uh, in, in the alternative to what we're currently using this funding for, which is to, um, to uh, provide revenues in case of a shortfall. I, um, I guess the, the, the fundamental question is, is the investment at these very year, early years um, going to produce uh, dividends? Um, I hate to be so crass about it, but from a financial uh, standpoint, in terms of operating the affairs of the state, I happen to believe it is, but I'm not in your business, nor in the business as so many have come before this committee today. Um, okay, I will say several things. The investment, um, it always struck me as odd that we didn't start from the beginning originally, um, but not really, I guess, because back in the day, women were home with their babies, but we're not living in that society anymore. Um, parents have to work. Um, they have to earn a living. Um, parents don't have the luxury often of being home. They need to be able to support their children. Um, that being said, the funding. Um, you said something, you said something about um, the funding being there for an emergency or, or in the rainy day fund for whatever happens. Well, if this isn't that time, if, if, if we don't do it for these children, what, what is the emergency? What is, what is it that we're saving it for? You know, we, we can save it and do whatever we want with it, but if we're not taking care of our littlest ones, and figuring out how to solve all of these gaps. And to do that, you have to start in the beginning. You have to start where you can't open the book in the middle and think you're gonna know the whole story. You're missing a lot of the pieces. And um, I think Senator McCrory said it much better than I could. Um, if, if we're not gonna use it for this, what is it that we're gonna use it for? Thank you very much. And Representative Meskers is, has his hand up, but don't know if he's available. I think not. Okay, thank you, Ms. Fraser. Thank you very Reed? much. Thank you. The next testifier is Steffi Martinez. 
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, Senator from FARA, Representative Scallon, Senator Martin, Representative Achievement, and distinguished members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. My name is Stephanie Martinez Frias, and I'm a child care organizer for CSCA SCIU Local 2001, and I'm testifying in support of Senate Bill 487. This bill addresses the critical need in our state for more infant and toddler care funding. As a former licensed child care provider and former home-based daycare owner for almost five years in Waterbury, I have seen firsthand the difficulty parents have in paying for child care. This need has been well-documented with estimates of a gap of more than 50,000 infant and toddler slots prior to the pandemic. The high cost of infant and toddler care, low provider wages, staff shortages, and parents' inability to pay the true cost of care have created a perfect storm that places children, families, and our state's economy at risk. In addition to addressing a critical need in our early care system with a dedicated funding stream, SB 487 includes provisions that will lead to high quality system that addresses issues of affordability, access, and workforce compensation. This includes supporting infant and toddler care in a variety of settings, including child care centers and family child care, which addresses family presence, preference, giving priority to low income communities and those designated as child care deserts, increasing wages by paying providers at the 75th percentile of the most recent market study, and supporting quality by providing a 25% bonus to accredited programs, both center and family providers, and offering technical assistance to those that not yet accredited to achieve accreditation. As a member of Child Care for Connecticut's Future, an organization that recognizes that our state's efforts to transform our current child care system will require significant investments of time, funding, and innovative thinking. The proposed legislation provides a creative funding mechanism that addresses a critical need without requiring new taxes. And very briefly, I would like to share a personal story. I remember receiving a single mother at my facility with an infant. She had come to me after a scary experience where she, um, that she had, I apologize, that she had at her previous place of care where the child was choking due to the lack of the child's child caretaker's um, neg negligence. This person did not have a secure home. home. Unfortunately, that was all that this mother could afford. She came to me scared and unable to pay my full tuition, but I decided to work with her because I understood she needed a support system and that a child needed a healthy and safe place to grow and learn. Until this day, that mother thanks me for taking such good care for her child, but um, in that the child is actually independent and ready to enter the school system. But this story is not really about me and about my work, but it's really about all the early educators working very hard in this field with limited resources and about all those children that deserve the opportunity of quality child care education. This is why I strongly advocate in investing in the early childhood workforce. And I ask you today to please support SB 487. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and please once again, support this bill. Thank you very much, Ms. Martinez. See no questions. Thank you. The next testifier is David Morgan. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Fonfara, Representative Scanlon, and the honorable members of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to submit my support uh, in favor of Senate Bill 487, an act establishing the Infant and Toddler Early Care and Family Support Initiative. I've also formally submitted uh, written testimony, and so I just want to reflect on a couple of pieces. Um, I, I, above all, I, I stand before you as a father of three that witnessed firsthand the empowerment of access to infant toddler care uh, for my own personal gainful employment and for the betterment of my loved ones, as well as being a contributing member to my community where I live and work right here in Connecticut as a lifelong resident. Uh, secondly, I stand before you as one who graduated from the University of Connecticut with a degree in early care and education. And the first thing I needed to do was work three jobs as a child care worker. I would work all day as an infant toddler caregiver in the city of Waterbury. And then I would get up at two o'clock in the morning and deliver newspapers. And then I, uh, go, I would work all day, two in the morning newspapers. And then after being an infant toddler uh, child care worker, I did a third job doing uh, telephone assistance, 411 assistance. Um, and the reality is 
because childcare in early childhood is not invested in as a public good. The science is clear. The resounding body of research is clear. We've heard it all day today. Uh, from birth to age three, there's more rapid development in the brain and the neurological, physiological science, more so from birth to age three than the remainder of the entire human experience. We also know this as an economic issue. It, unfortunately, it required a global pandemic to heighten awareness of what a critical element to the economic vitality of this state of Connecticut in any town and city, and that is the iron pillar of childcare. One in three workers in our state of Connecticut are parents who require childcare, and we don't put a public investment into birth to age five. We don't recognize Nobel laureate uh, recipient in economics, Heckman, as we've heard multiple times today, the return on investment on that portfolio of 13%, match 13% ROI on any of your portfolios. Each in other portfolios in examples from the Harvard Devel uh, Center for Development and Child, I, I go on and on, a dollar into early childhood, $7 return on investment, $18 return on investment in the areas of nutrition, healthcare, life cycle benefits, graduation rates, educational outcomes. There's a reason public schools, which does receive a public investment from uh, kindergarten to 12th grade, um, looks at kindergarten performance because there's a correlation to third grade performance. And by the way, we know the correlation of third grade performance can have a statistical correlation to uh, graduation rates. And the sure fastest way to enter poverty right here in Connecticut is to not graduate. And so we know through the science that the early experiences matter and can set kids on a lifelong success, but we don't invest in it. And I would leave you with the, with the following. When we think about shared responsibility, and public trust and public eye on something we don't do right now. Um, I would leave you with things like the farm bill. You know, when we all had to come together against the great draw and we had a shared public responsibility to turn the corner and we have invested in K to five, which is um, against the research and the science, which is so clear. So I, I wanna thank you so much for all you do for our state of Connecticut, for raising the, the, the importance of this and accepting my testimony, which I also provided much deeper in writing, um, supporting SB 487. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Seeing no questions. The next testifier is Catherine Lantiga. Hello, good afternoon to all. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Catherine Antigua. I am the owner of K Colorful Daycare in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, I'm also the organizer of the rally, the Morning Without Child Care here in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, and I'm going to talk about my personal situation as a child care provider, child care educator. Right now, I'm opening the doors of my house at 4.45, sorry about that, at 4.45 a.m in the morning and I am receiving three children from a mother that she's an extension worker at a hospital um, in New York City. Um, so for example, she travels to New York for two hours in the morning. And when she comes out of her job, she gets, it takes her three hours because of traffic. Meaning that I'm with those children 13 hours a day. I am with three children, only with those three children, 13 hours a day. When you calculate those 13 hours a day, it's 65 hours per week. Right now, for one child, I am only getting paid $1,342. When you divide that into those 263 hours a month that I'm with this family, I'm getting paid $5.10 per hour. That's how much I'm getting paid five dollars and ten cents per hour i am 263 hours with this family a month and what i'm getting paid is five dollars and ten cents and i'm opening the doors of my house for this family for an extension worker 13 hours a day at 4 45 in the morning for this mom to get to work to serve all of us the reason that i became a child care provider because was because I couldn't afford childcare myself. I have two children. I used to be a medical assistant here in Connecticut, Bridgeport, Connecticut. 
And I had to quit my job and become a child care provider to be able to take care of my own children and also have an income. I couldn't afford child care. It is not fair for the parents. It is not fair for the children. And it's definitely not fair for us that we are opening this, our homes, safe homes for these children. We have to work. I say we because I'm a mother also. I'm a mother and, I'm, and I felt the pain that these mothers are feeling and I had to provide for my family, but there is no way with the amount of money that we are getting paid, we could survive. There's a lot of childcare providers pushing children away because they cannot afford staff. Right now, I cannot afford a staff. Staff wants to get paid at least minimum $13 per hour. That's minimum wage. We cannot afford to pay them $13 per hour because we don't get paid $13 per hour ourselves. So we are short of staff. We're pushing families away every day because we cannot take the children. How are we going to take care of the children if we don't have enough staff? What are we supposed to do? There's a lot of people struggling, closing their doors, going back to work because child care is, is, is not an income. It's not. Who gets paid? For, it's, it's the same um, situation with Target. Target is getting paid $13, $15 on a start. Us as child care providers, we're getting paid $5.10 per hour. And I'm working 263 hours out of my life, my time with seconds. only one family. It's unfair. It's unfair. So I'm here to support and to please let you guys know my personal situation and my parents' personal situation. I'm here to support the SBA 487. And, and, I, and I definitely say that Everyone here should support this also. Thank you very much, Ms. Lantiga. Can you tell the committee uh, in the course of your day, um, what kind of um, uh, educational experience are the children that you're taking care of getting? I went back to school. I did my CDA credential. These kids are learning. I'm getting them ready for kindergarten. They're learning their, their, their basic skills, which is the ABCs, one, two, threes, learning how to trace. Um, it's not just babysitting. We are nurses. We are mothers. We are chefs. We are um, janitors. We are, um, imagine these kids are here with me. 13 hours out of the day when they go home is just to take a shower and go to sleep. It's, the baby came to my hands when she was only six weeks. She calls me mommy. She barely sees her mom. Her mom is all day in the hospital. So it, it's an amazing job. I love my job. I nurture these kids. I show them um, good quality skills for them to get ready to go to school. I have already... Um, when it comes to the teachers, the, the children that have left my daycare to go to school, wow, you did an amazing job. This child knows all his ABCs. This child knows his colors. This child knows how to write his name at five years old. So I'm doing my part. I'm definitely doing my part because, I mean, I'm recognized when it comes to schools calling me for the good job that I'm doing with these children once they get to kindergarten. But is it fair to me? Is it fair to me to sacrifice my life, my kids' time, my personal time for $5.10 and 10, and 10 cents an hour? Is it, it, I cannot afford to, um, if you see my paycheck and you see my mortgage, I have to stop paying a month my light bill and then the next month pay my light bill or one month pay my water or the next pay, the next month pay my, um, my Wi-Fi because I cannot pay all my bills from one paycheck. I can't. I'm always backed up when it comes to my personal bills because I can, my paycheck is not enough. You said earlier you're doing your part. I would say you're doing your part in more, but we're not doing our part. It's unfair. Um, it's un we, 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 we want people in the workforce, um, but we're not recognizing the real life conditions. People have children. What do you do? Leave your child 
uh, on the corner somewhere. I mean, I, I had to quit my job my, myself. I couldn't afford it. It's not a joke. I couldn't afford childcare. I had to quit my job to take care of my kids at home. And what am I supposed to tell these mothers? She travels only five hours a day. She hmm. only travels five hours a day to go work at an emergency room in New York. What am I supposed to tell her at 545 in the morning? No, I'm not going to take your three kids because I'm only getting paid $5 and 10 cents per hour. I cannot do that. I'm a mother myself. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Representative Cabros de Graw has a question for you. I, I actually, it's not even a question. It's just a comment. I, I've, I've listened to the testimony all day today and I have listened to so many other times that we've heard from our child care providers. I wanna to say to you, first of all, I was one of those moms who, who stayed, had to stay home because it was, that was, that's when I, you know, I was a young mom. I had my first one at 25. It, it is in a, re, you know, and that, that young, that youngest, I mean, that eldest child that I have is about ready to graduate college. You know, the reality of this, it has not gotten bad, that, and she's 21. So this has not gotten better in two decades already. And, and we're hearing you and you are begging us. And, and that it really is making, I'm sure, an impact on all of us that are listening because you have summed up so many pieces of this in your testimony today, the, the feelings that you have as a child care provider to want to support these moms, primarily moms, right? But, you know, that, that this is not daycare. And I think that that's, you know, what you have articulated so beautifully is the, pre the preparation that you are giving these children, the love and the care that you are pouring into these children. And you're right. Just like a mom has all those job titles, when you say janitor and healthcare worker, you are all those things for all of these kids. And I, I just want to commend you on that. And, and you are the backbone of the economy in terms of making sure that that mom that you're talking about can go and take care of other people, you know, of all of our other people. She doesn't want to leave her kids that, you know, for any hours of the day and to have to hand over a six week old baby to you. You know, so I, I just wanted to commend you on that. And I know Senator Moore, who's coming after me, is probably going to have a lot to say. I, I um, hope she shares maybe even some story of her experience working at Target, um, because while things have gotten better, you know, this is this is about all these jobs in the economy that are just not not meeting basic survival needs. So mm -hmm. I, I, I just want you to know that you've been seen today because this is we, we've got to do better. It's it's in, it's. It's unfair, it's, it's enough. Our children, I mean, the parents have to go to work. They have to, and our children have to be in a safe place. We, we have to make it better. We, it, 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 I, I, I hear the struggles every day. We have to make it better. And I, I don't have the heart to say, I, I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Cabros de Gras. Uh, Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Catherine, thank you so much for your testimony. As you were talking, I thought I, you know, I could give you a million stories uh, of the importance of early childhood development, not just daycare and what you really do for children at an early age. When I raised my children, I never put them in daycare. It was always a family member. So they played and they watched TV, you know, they were entertained. And now I watch my daughter. I have a daughter who's 54 years old. I have a granddaughter who is 34 having her first child. I watched the difference between my daughter, who I let play and do this, and they turned out all well. I'm happy with that. But when they got ready, when my grandchildren who were in a daycare center with a woman who loved them like their own, taught them how to sit at a table and eat, taught them about the proper foods to eat, how to eat, manners, uh, uh, more than just yes. things to eat, but how you yes. interact with other children in a larger family who set them at a table where they all ate together while their parents were working. Right? And giving Christmas, birthday parties. I do it all for my kids because the mothers don't have the time. And so with, it's like this, you know, this, it, there's a, there's a, uh, a story uh, about the old woman and the pig. And I learned it when I was a kid. It's about cooperation and how all these things work together, right? right. We have a shortage of workforce. Do you really think someone who's making $5 an hour like you, other than the love for our children, would start a daycare center if they were going to be paid $5 an hour? Well, no the way. Parents have to make minimum wage. 
And people keep bringing up Target and I have this flashback of when my first year uh, as a senator in human services and people were talking about low wage jobs. I gotta tell you, I've been blessed my entire life to always have what I needed. But I listened to families talk about working two and three jobs and I didn't understand it because I didn't live in that space. So I took a job at Target and what they would have me do for it after I tried to negotiate a $10 an hour wage, I think I ended up at less than nine or something when I started and that was in 2014. To hear they're paying people 14 to $15 an hour, that they value those people because they're no longer available and that we don't value people who set up daycare centers to take care of our kids so we can go do these jobs. I mean, it's like the infrastructure. I hear people talk about the root cause of so many other things. The root cause of some of the crime, some of the hate, some of the violence yes. is because they didn't have someone like you. Some people right. are still leaving their kids with an older child who's sitting them in front of a TV all just to day. keep them quiet all day long. All the day. value that you bring needs to be compensated so we can have more people like you taking up care of our children so we can go out to the workforce. So all those open jobs that are sitting there, we will go after because we know we have some like, like you who's being paid to take care of our children, who's being compensated for the work that they do and who values, who values. We need to look like where we put our money. And if we don't put our money and our dollars into people like you, into early child care, into education, then we, this is just the cycle that I sometimes think is intentional to keep us in this place. Although it may be intentional, not for all of us, but it's where we end up. So I, I really appreciate the work that you've done in, with children and your love for them. But I also know you can't keep doing this unless you're compensated because it wears on you, it wears on your family, and it, it shows up in other ways, right? So thank you. And I totally support putting this money where we need to do for children and, and families. I, thank you so I, I think much. we all do, but when we hear stories like yours, it ha helps us understand how much you do, that you're not blessing, letting a child sit down and watch TV all day, but you're grooming that child, preparing him for free kindergarten, right? So right. thank you for the work that you, I don't have a question because I know what you do. I've listened to you and I appreciate so many of the people have come up to talk about what we do in early childhood and what we're not doing. And it's time for us to fund it properly. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you, thank you Mr. for your testimony today and Senator Moore and Representative Cabros de Gras. There are a lot of people who uh, may not be live in terms of seeing their face, but there are a lot of members uh, listening uh, right now, and um, I am grateful for your contributions to today too in terms of this discussion. Um, Bree. Thank you. Our last testifier is Francesca Velasquez. Wow, what an <laughs> honor. <laughs> Okay, um, so good afternoon, um, members of the Finance Committee, and my name is Francesca Velasquez. I live in Stanford, Connecticut, obviously, and I am a child care owner of Play to Learn Child Care Centers and part of Circle. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify on uh, in support of SB 487. This bill will redirect existing tax revenue from the budget reserve to a new non laughing early care and family support account. <clears throat> Funds in this account would then be used to contract with child care providers, both centers and family child care homes to increase the supply of high quality infant toddler care. And I'm here to give um, the perspective and the reason that I am supporting this bill, the perspective of my families and my staff. I have 20 teachers that I employ in my centers um, and we need to fix childcare and we need to invest into childcare now. Um, my parents cannot afford to pay the full cost 
of quality childcare, just like um, our last um, person that was testifying. Um, I get the same thing where I get families that they need childcare because 85% of my families are on subsidy, which is care for kids. And they still cannot afford to pay the parent fees. So I find myself doing what I think the state of Connecticut should be doing is subsidizing my families so that they could attend my program. Because I get the stories of I'm alone, I just got divorced, um, I live, it's only me and my child, I need to go to work. So I am subsidizing the parent fees that could be 80. I'm subsidizing it to 60 and 40, sometimes even to $25 a week. So um, what I'm trying to say is that that, me doing that affects my center. And it also affects it in many ways, but in the most important way, it affects that I cannot pay my teachers a living wage and what they deserve for doing what they're doing for our kids, our youngest adults in Connecticut. So I urge you to please, to please pass the bill. What is it? SB 487. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Velasquez. And thank you for your patience in waiting to testify today. Long hearing, um, but I believe a very fruitful one. Worth it. Informative one. And I uh, appreciate everybody, uh, Senator Martin, Representative Cheeseman, and the committee for, of course, uh, my co-chair, Representative Scanlon, um, for uh, hanging in today and through all of this. It's not, I just close by saying, I know that we're not the Human Services Committee. We're not, um, we're not the Education Committee, but um, the issue before us is about uh, whether or not we believe that the funding source that's been identified in this bill is worthy of being repurposed for the for the issues that came before us in 487. I know we had other bills today, but the bulk of the testimony was on 487. So I thank you for your, your attention today. And um, we have another, hopefully not as long tomorrow, but uh, um, prepare yourselves, as they say. Um, thank you and have a, have a good evening. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.